This is Audible. The Lost Fleet, Galactic Search, A Slaver Wars Novel, Volume 1. Written by Raymond L. Weil. Narrated by Liam Owen. Produced by Sci-Fi Publishing. Chapter 1 Admiral Race Tolson grimaced as the Warhawk shook violently. They were at Condition 1 with everyone at their battle stations. On the tactical display, 40 glaring red threat icons continued to harass his fleet. Light damage to outer hull section D-12, reported the damage control officer. Hull integrity is holding. The ship continued to shudder as missiles and energy beams continued to impact the defense shield. Damn Forzon, grunted Commander Madeline Arnett as she held onto the armrest on her command chair. They should have stayed in their own territory. We're having this problem all along the entire border of the former Hawkland Slave Empire, commented Admiral Tolson, as the Warhawk fired off a series of sublight antimatter missiles at the nearby Borzon cruiser that was attacking them. The Borzon are trying to add the former Hawkland Slave Worlds to their own empire. This is the deepest any of their fleets have penetrated into Federation-controlled space. Well, that's not going to happen today, stated Madeline, determinedly as she ordered the 1,600-meter Warhawk to close the range with the enemy cruiser. We'll show them what the penalty is for trespassing in our territory. On the main view screen, the energy screen of the Borzon ship was lit up from massive antimatter explosions and showed signs of imminent collapse. Other Borzon ships were also under heavy attack from the other ships of Third Fleet. The Borzon cruisers were slim vessels, 1,200 meters in length and heavily armed. Fire particle beam! commanded Madeline, sensing a weakness in the bores on screen. It was flickering, and in some areas seemed to have faded away completely. While the bores on ships were quite powerful, the Federation ships had superior weapons and energy shields. Instantly, from the Warhawk, a bright blue beam flashed out and easily pierced the bores on energy shield, impacting the ship's hull and causing a tremendous explosion of released energy. A massive section of the hull broke loose and began floating away from the ship. Internal explosions could be seen blowing out other sections of hull material. The Borzon ship seemed to falter, and then its energy screen flickered and collapsed. A 50-megaton Devastator III missile finished the ship off in a fiery burst of consuming nuclear fire. A few moments later, all that was left of the enemy cruiser was a scattering debris field and some glowing gases. Borzon cruiser is down, confirmed Lieutenant Brent Davis from his sensor console. Battleships Ajax and Constitution are heavily engaged with three Borzon cruisers, reported Commander Arnett, as she studied one of the holographic tactical displays. They're taking some damage. Tolson nodded as he thumbed his minicom to fleet wide. Strike cruisers Vendetta and Longhorn. Move to coordinates 17 by 22 central axis and assist the Ajax and the Constitution. Race wasn't that concerned about the two battleships. He just wanted to hold their damage to a minimum. The two strike cruisers quickly accelerated and headed toward the two battleship's positions. Upon arriving, they found the Ajax and Constitution involved in a missile duel with three Borzon cruisers. Antimatter missiles and powerful nuclear missiles were exploding against energy shields, trying to knock them down. Suddenly, the shield on one of the Borzon ships failed, and twin antimatter suns formed where the ship had been. The two remaining Borzon cruisers shifted their attack focusing on the Ajax. The battleship's energy screen lit up in a cascade of raw energy as over a dozen 20-megaton nuclear missiles detonated against it. From the two strike cruisers, multiple sublight antimatter missiles flashed away from their missile tubes, impacting the Borzon energy shields. For a brief moment, it seemed as if two new stars had been born. When the glare died away, the two Borzon cruisers were gone. Several fiery filaments were all that was left to mark their passing. Admiral Tolson nodded his head in satisfaction at the destruction of three more Borzon cruisers. So far, the battle was going just as he had expected. There was no doubt in his mind that the Borzon Empire was testing the Federation's will to defend former Hawkland space. Light cruiser Baltic is under heavy attack, reported Lieutenant Denise Travers from Communications, with concern showing in her eyes. They report their shields are down to 20% and still dropping. How the hell did a Borzon cruiser slip past us and get back to our rear echelon? Demanded Tolson, his face showing concern. 
Third Fleet's 10 light cruisers were protecting the fleet's four large battle carriers, and they weren't built to take on an enemy cruiser. They micro-jumped, reported Lieutenant Davis in explanation. Saratoga is launching two squadrons of Anlon bombers toward the enemy cruisers, reported Commander Arnett, as she saw 20 small green icons flash away from the carrier and accelerate toward the Borzon ship. Are they going to get there in time? asked Race, his eyes focusing intently on the indicated tactical display. He knew the light cruiser wouldn't last long against the more powerful Borzon ship. No, replied Lieutenant Davis as the view screen lit up with a brilliant light. Light cruiser Baltic is down. Anlon bombers are making their attack runs. Race watched the tactical display as six of the small green bomber icons vanished. Then, the icon representing the enemy cruiser seemed to swell up, and then it also disappeared. Borzon cruiser is down, spoke Lieutenant Davis, feeling satisfied the Baltic had been avenged. Race let out a deep sigh of regret at the loss of the light cruiser and the six Anlon bombers. This was war, and people died. Sometimes, very suddenly. He turned his attention back to the battle, ordering his ships to press the attack and drive the boars on back. In space, Federation bright blue particle beams, violet-colored power beams, and the orange-red flash of pulse lasers lit up space. In return, the boars on return fire with powerful white energy beams and their own orange-red pulse lasers. Both sides were using their deadly sublight missiles in an effort to knock down energy screens and destroy the ships they were protecting. The only difference being, while the Borzon sublight missiles were armed with 20 megaton nuclear warheads, the Federations were armed with 100 megaton antimatter warheads. When multiple Federation antimatter missiles struck a Borzon cruiser shield, invariably the shield either weakened substantially or collapsed. In most cases, bright blue particle beams would then finish the destruction, blasting massive holes inside the enemy ship until it exploded. A Borzon cruiser could only stand up to a few hits from the deadly missiles. The cruisers, while dangerous to smaller ships, were finding it difficult to even damage the more powerful Federation ships, particularly the battleships and battle cruisers. The humans grow more powerful in every engagement rasped Fleet Commander Tillet. Tillet was a male Borzon standing well over two meters tall, with wide, multifaceted eyes upon a strangely shaped head. A pair of long, narrow wings was on his back, and his body was covered with fine, stiff, short hair. Tillet stood on two legs that were bent strangely and had four double-jointed slender arms, capable of grasping and operating the ship's control consoles. Perhaps we have tried to extend the Empire too far into the former Hawkland Empire, suggested High Nest Leader Trill. It seems the humans have laid claim to a large portion of the Hawkland's former territory. The humans have restricted the surviving Hawklands to their home worlds and a small area of space surrounding them, Fleet Commander Tillet responded as he watched several more of his battle cruisers being torn apart by human antimatter missiles. Their losses were inconsequential, as there were many more cruisers back in the Empire. This raid had been to test the humans' determination to hold on to the space previously held by the Hawklands. Don't forget about High Leader Nartel, High Nest Leader Trill spoke, his multifaceted eyes focusing on the fleet commander. The Hawklands with him still possess a powerful fleet and control twenty other worlds near the border of our empire. The Hawklands, along with High Leader Nartel, will not have the numbers to be a threat to anyone for centuries, answered Fleet Commander Tillet dismissively. Our High Queen has signed a treaty with the High Leader, guaranteeing the Empire will not attack them as long as they don't venture into our space. In addition, the humans have not been active in that region of space, and we have expanded our Empire to completely surround the new Hawkland system. And the twenty worlds they control. Any hope they have of future expansion has been removed.
Then they are neutralized from ever being a threat, replied High Ness Leader Trill, as the flagship shook from multiple energy weapons striking the ship's defensive screen. Yes, answered Fleet Commander Tillette, as he saw one of his cruisers destroy another of the human's lighter units. It is time for us to withdraw. We've learned what we needed to. We'll take over the outer regions of the former Hawkland Empire, but the central regions are now under human control. I will pass on the order to enter hyperspace, responded the High Nest Leader. We will make our report to the High Queen, stated Fleet Commander Tillette, partially spreading his wings. She will be satisfied with what we've learned today. Tillette was anxious to return home. It was time for him to mate with his own queen and add his genes to the Borzon race. His many offspring would continue to grow the Borzon Empire. Light cruiser Dante is down, reported Lieutenant Davis in a neutral voice. That was the second light cruiser they'd lost, though several of the heavier ships were reporting some damage. There would be casualties on those vessels as well. The Borzon are withdrawing spoke Commander Arnett, pointing toward one of the tactical displays as the enemy ships began to vanish into hyperspace. Let them go, responded Admiral Tolson, nodding his head. We've shown them that certain areas of the former Hawkland Empire are off-limits to them. A few moments later, the last Borzon cruiser vanished into a swirling white spatial vortex, leaving the Federation fleet alone in the small star system. All ships report able to enter hyperspace spoke Lieutenant Travers from communications. Several have mentioned that they'll need some yard time to repair damages. Very well, answered Admiral Tolson. Commander Arnett, have the fleet set course for Carith. The bear shipyards can easily repair our battle damage. Do you think the Bozon will come back? asked Colonel Bryce Cowell, the executive officer. He had been at the tactical console helping to coordinate the firing of the ship's weapons. Not for a while, Tolson answered, his face becoming covered in a frown. They know we won't allow them to enter the central regions of the former Hawkland Empire, but we don't have enough ships to adequately guard the periphery. Then we allow the Borzon to take over all of the inhabited worlds near their empire? Asked Colonel Cowell, knowing they were talking about hundreds of inhabited planets. Many were just beginning to recover from their years or even centuries of Hawkland rule. No, responded Tolson, shaking his head. Several fleets are going to be assigned to patrol the regions next to Borzon space. We're hoping we can slow down or even discourage Borzon encroachment. But for some areas, that may already be too late. Race turned his attention to the primary view screen as a blue-white spatial vortex opened up in front of the Warhawk. Moments later, the helm officer flew the powerful battleship into the vortex, and the ship made the transition into hyperspace. Still looking at the view screen, Race could see the swirling deep purple colors which designated this strange realm that allowed spacecraft to travel many multiples of speed of light. With a sigh, he turned the command center over to Commander Arnett and headed toward his quarters. He wanted to get some rest and think about what was still ahead of them. It took a few minutes, but after taking a turbo lift, he reached his quarters and after going inside, sat down on the comfortable couch. On the far wall of his room was a picture of a blazing white light surrounding a Federation warship. It was the Avenger, which had been missing for over four years. The entire Fourth Fleet, as well as the Carthian Fleet, had been swallowed up by the raging nightmare at the Galactic Center. What had happened at the Galactic Center had shaken the human Federation of Worlds and their allies to the core. To this day, there was much supposition about what had happened to Admiral Strong and his ships. Many believed they'd been destroyed outright in the violent energy surges at the heart of that blazing sphere of light. Others firmly believed Admiral Strong and his ships had been transported to another galaxy, and the blazing sphere of light was a distorted spatial vortex. The vortex had been created when Admiral Strong had used the Avenger in a daring suicidal attempt to destroy the hyper-translation station of the AIs. There were unconfirmed rumors the last two survivors of the Special Five were working with the Altons on a rescue mission. No one could confirm if this was true, or just wild hope that something was being done. Many felt, even if the swirling white light had been a spatial vortex, that Admiral Strong and his fleets had been transported so far away, there was no conceivable hope of a rescue. 
Race let out a deep breath, leaned back, and closed his eyes. So many good people had been lost at the battle in the Galactic Center. Everyone who had been there knew Admiral Strong had saved the Federation by his brave act. All the Federation fleets would have been destroyed, but by destroying the hyper-translation station, Admiral Strong had paralyzed the AIs, allowing the Federation to be victorious. Every child was now taught Fleet Admiral Heaton Streth had saved the human race from the Hawklands, but Admiral Jeremy Strong had saved everyone from the AIs. Admiral Kalin was busy in his office on his flagship, the battleship Cirrus, as he read the latest dispatches from Allied fleets and diplomats scattered across the former Hawkland Empire. The most interesting was from Senator Jalen Arden, who was currently at New Providence in the Old Human Federation of Worlds. As had been expected, new and thriving colonies were now well established on all of the former Federation worlds, which had been devastated by the Hawkland and AI attacks. She was reporting the completion of the final planetary defense grid over New Eden in the Kanto system and the quota of immigrants from the new human Federation of Worlds, who would be allowed to settle there. New Providence has come a long way, commented Colonel Ackerman. Ackerman had transferred to Cirrus after the defeat of the Hawkland Slave Empire. Many of the fleet personnel who were in cryosleep for so many years have retired there. Yes, Kalin responded with a relaxed smile. I recently received a message from Fleet Admiral Strath with an invitation to come out to Macon and visit him and Janice, if I'm ever in the area. I know it meant a lot to them to be able to return home. How does he like retirement? He loves it, Kalin responded with a sigh, wishing he could do the same. Heaton says he spends his days fishing and taking long hikes around his private lake. In the evening, they sit outside on the porch watching the sunset. How's Admiral Sheen doing on Aquaria? She and Richard are going to have a child, Caitlin said, grinning. Amanda always wanted children, but she wanted the Hawkland and AI threat to be over with first. In four more months, there will be a new member added to their family. That's great, spoke Ackerman, nodding his head approvingly. So many things have changed since the end of the war. There's still the Borazon and the other two slaver races, replied Kalin in a more serious tone. Admiral Tolson just finished a battle with a small Borazon fleet deep in the former Hawkland territory. He sent them packing with only minor losses to his own fleet. We've had a number of minor skirmishes with them over the last two years, commented Ackerman with a frown. It's evident they want to expand their empire into former Hawkland space. We can't defend all of it. Kalin said with a heavy sigh as he leaned back in his office chair. We just don't have the ships to cover such a large area. We've set up a safe corridor 4,000 light years across that extends from the Alliance all the way to the Hawkland homeworlds. The former Human Federation of Worlds as well as Kareth are included in the safe area. Plus several thousand inhabited planets which were formerly Hawkland slave worlds, added Ackerman, thinking about the massive task the Alliance had taken on bringing those worlds out of slavery. Fortunately, the Altons are heavily involved working with the former slave worlds, Kalin said, recalling what he had been told at his last briefing with Fleet Admiral Nagumo. They have hundreds of ships out working with these planets, and in a few years, some of them will be ready to join the Alliance. We'll need them, Ackerman said, folding his arms across his chest and gazing across the large desk at Admiral Kalin. Sometime in the future, we're going to have to take on the Borzon and other slaver races. We can't allow tens of thousands of inhabitants' worlds to be enslaved and live in the conditions their conquerors demand. Someday, Kalin acknowledged with a nod, I need to go down to Cirrus for a meeting with Governor Barnes. It seems a Carthian delegation has arrived, and they're demanding an immediate audience with the governor. Fourth fleet in the Carthian fleet, speculated Ackerman, his eyes growing a bit wider. They'll want to know what we're doing about the missing fleets. I know. Kalin replied with some anguish in his voice. Governor Barnes' daughter has been just as demanding. The governor's daughter was Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes, and she had been at the Galactic Center battle. Do you think they survived? That's the big question, Kalin answered, his eyes taking on a haunted look. I've seen the videos of the battle and what happened. Most of the people in the Federation have. It was terrifying and magnificent. The Avenger flying into certain death, destroying the hyper-translation station, and then vanishing along with part of Fourth Fleet into the swirling white vortex. Then Graceth leading his ships into the vortex with Admiral Susan Marks following close behind. And they were never heard from again, said Ackerman in a subdued voice. 
There were hundreds of AI ships drawn into the Vortex as well, Kalin added with a heavy sigh. Even if Admiral Strong and Fourth Fleet did survive, they would have had a huge battle on their hands on the other side. Do you think we'll ever know? Ackerman asked, his eyes focusing on the Admiral. I don't know, Kalin replied as he stood up. To the Carthians, Admiral Strong and the rest of the Special Five are heroes who saved the world. Those crazy bears are willing to commit their entire fleet to a rescue effort if we can just tell them where to go. And of course, that's the problem. We have no idea what happened to Fourth Fleet, or even if it survived. Governor Barnes drew in a deep breath as the door to his office opened and four Carthians entered. The four bears towered over the two humans in the room, and their massive bodies gave off an aura of strength and fortitude. Standing up, he indicated for the four Carthians to sit down in the large chairs provided. I welcome our allies from Carith, he spoke graciously. I am Centel, spoke the largest Carthian as he sat down. His fur was a deep dark brown and his eyes gazed intently at Governor Barnes and Admiral Kalin. We have come to speak of a matter of grave importance to my race and our honor. It's about Admiral Strong and Graceth, spoke Governor Barnes knowingly, sitting back down in his chair. He had been governor for two years since former Governor Malik decided to retire and not run for re-election. Yes, answered Santel, nodding his large head and blinking his eyes. I am of Graceth's clan and Admiral Jeremy Strong is an honorary clan brother. For four long years, he and Graceth have been missing. Our people yearn to know the fate of our missing brothers. We all would like to know, answered Governor Barnes with a deep sigh. My own daughter was at the great battle at the Galactic Center, and scarcely a day passes where she does not send me an inquiry asking the same thing. We have tried to ask the Altons, but they refuse to give us an audience, Santel added. I believe our physical form frightens them. Governor Barnes nodded and smiled. Very probable, he replied. Most of the Altons are a very pacifist people and are only interested in research, while the more daring are involved in exploration. Only a few were able to fight in the war, and even now most of the crews of their warships are augmented by humans trained to operate their ships. I believe only the great science of the Altons can discover what happened to my clan brothers, Santel continued. We would like for you to arrange a meeting between my people and theirs to see what can be done. We are willing to equip and send ships to the nearer galaxies in search of the missing fleets. We are aware such a journey will take years and be extremely dangerous, but we must know what happened. Our honor demands it. There are many who believe the ships which entered the White Vortex were destroyed by the rampant energy released when the hypertranslation station was destroyed. Admiral Kalin pointed out, There may be nothing to find. We recognize that possibility, conceded Santel, but no wreckage from any of the ships that entered the Vortex has ever been discovered. We've taken our pleas to the Human Federation of Worlds, but they seem convinced a search for the lost fleets is a pointless waste of resources. I can understand their perspective, Admiral Kalin replied. The Human Federation of Worlds and the Alliance have a huge job on their hands exploring the former Hawkland slave empire and keeping all those worlds safe. The Borzon are still out there, as well as the other slaver races. We understand, Santel replied with a nod. We respect their great concern for those worlds that suffered under the rule of the evil ones. Governor Barnes was silent as he contemplated what needed to be done. After a moment, he reached a decision. The Special Five have always been very important to the people of Cirrus, he began, as he pressed a button on his desk, activating a large view screen on the wall behind him. As you know, Kelsey Granger Strong and Katie Johnson Walters were not with Fourth Fleet when it entered the Vortex. They were aboard the Star Strike with Fleet Admiral Streth. We were relieved to hear they survived, Centel replied. We had hoped they would return to live upon our world. They couldn't, Governor Barnes replied as he manipulated a small computer console on his desk. They were working on this. He turned around and pointed at the view screen behind him. On the view screen was a massive starship, the largest any of them in the room had ever seen. A substantial globe on the bow easily identified the ship as being of Alton design. What's that? uttered Admiral Kalin as she looked at the huge ship on the screen. Just from seeing the obvious weapon system, he knew he was looking at something special and fantastic, 
he was not aware of such a ship being built. That is the exploration dreadnought distant horizon, Governor Barnes answered with a wicked smile. It's the most powerful warship ever built by the Altons or the Federation. The ship is 2,600 meters in length, with a crew of over 5,000. Cirrus provided the resources and credits to cover the expenses for building the ship. How was this built with no one knowing? asked Kalin, glancing over at the governor. What's it for? To build a ship of such size would have been a massive undertaking and extremely expensive. It was built at the Alton's main shipyard under the direction of both human and Alton scientists, Governor Barnes explained. It was constructed for one purpose and one purpose only. It's going to find out what happened to the lost fleets once and for all. How? asked Admiral Kalin, feeling confused. We don't know where the fleets went. That ship is capable of finding out, Governor Barnes answered with a pleased glint in his eyes. There will be a large contingent of Alton scientists and technicians aboard, as well as some very special sensor equipment. It's capable of generating a spatial vortex that can reach another galaxy once they know their destination. I would like to go on the ship, Santel spoke, his eyes focused intently on the massive starship. I will go in search of my clan brothers. I'm sure we can arrange for a few of your people to be added to the crew, replied Governor Barnes. He was not surprised by the bear's request. This is what Kelsey and Katie have been working on for the last four years, stated Admiral Kalin, realizing now why the two girls had seemingly vanished after the ceremony honoring the fallen at the Fleet Academy. Yes, answered Governor Barnes with a nod of his head. They also had the help of Clarissa. I'm surprised the Altons allowed Clarissa to be involved, since she's an A.I., Admiral Kalin said, his eyes widening. Katie can be quite convincing when she wants to be replied Governor Barnes, recalling how Katie had convinced Ambassador Turin to allow the AI to enter Alton space. Who will command the ship? asked Admiral Kalin, as he thought about officers who might be qualified for such a command. That decision's already been made, Governor Barnes said, with a concerned look spreading across his face. The commander of the distant horizon will be my daughter, Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes. Chapter 2 Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes took a deep breath as she gazed out the viewport of the shuttle, which was taking her to her new command. She still couldn't get over the stupendous size of the ship sitting there in open space. The distant horizon was 2,600 meters in length, with much of it shaped like a giant cylinder. The cylindrical section was 400 meters in diameter. The forward section was a globe 600 meters across, with the command center buried deep within to provide maximum protection. The tail of the ship flared out to 500 meters, where main engineering and the ship's powerful sublight drive and hyperdrive were located. She's a beauty, commented Major Kevin Winslow. The Major was sitting across the aisle from Rear Admiral Barnes. He was in charge of the ship's marine contingent and had just returned from the Alton shipyard where he had been procuring some advanced weapons for his special forces unit. The weapons were in the small cargo hold on board the shuttle. A dreadnought, spoke Catherine softly, her eyes focused on the massive ship. Everyone in the fleet would want one of these. There was only one, and it was hers. She was still finding it hard to believe that she had been given command of such a ship. I heard some of the Altons on board talking the other day, and they claimed the ship has twice the firepower of a battleship and far superior shields, the Major said. This is the most advanced ship they've ever built. It would have to be for the Altons to be willing to send so many of their people on this expedition, replied Catherine, looking over at the Major. She noticed that Major Winslow looked to be in his mid-thirties, of average height, with a well-muscled frame. I understand the entire crew is now aboard and waiting for your orders, continued the Major. Everyone will be excited to finally get underway. We're going on a shakedown cruise first, Catherine informed the Major. We're going to put this new ship and crew through every stress I can think of. With all the new technology that's been installed, I want to ensure it doesn't fail us in a critical situation. Major Winslow nodded. He knew that was a wise decision. Where the distant horizon was going, there would be no repair facilities or help if it were needed. If the ship succeeded in transiting to another galaxy, they would be effectively cutting themselves off from the rest of the human race. The shuttle entered the exploration ship's main flight bay and set down with scarcely a jar. 
The hatch slid open, and Major Winslow and Rear Admiral Barnes stood up and walked to the opening. Stepping upon the ramp, both were surprised to see a large portion of the ship's crew lined up. Admiral arriving, called out Colonel Petra Leon, formerly of the battleship Warstorm. Instantly, nearly 1,000 crew members snapped to attention. Two full companies of Marines formed an honor guard directly in front of the shuttle. Catherine paused and took a deep breath as she gazed at the assembled fleet personnel. She was just now realizing how massive her new command was. The gathered crew was only about a fifth of those on board. All of these lives had been entrusted into her hands. It was an awesome responsibility. Catherine returned the salute and walked down the ramp followed by Major Winslow. Reaching the bottom, she stopped in front of Colonel Leon. Welcome aboard, Admiral, Petra said with a pleasant smile. She was looking forward to serving under the Admiral. Commander Grissom is in the command center awaiting your order. Lead the way, Catherine said, nodding her head. She had studied the schematics of the distant horizon and knew it would take her a while to be able to find her way around the ship unaided. It's a big ship, isn't it? A young, blonde-headed woman said. Catherine turned and noticed the young woman was not wearing any rank insignia upon her dark blue fleet uniform. She was ravishingly beautiful and had that youthful allure of innocence about her. Clarissa? guessed Catherine, realizing she was facing the A.I. The one and only, Clarissa replied with a smile. Are you going to help us find Ariel and the others? The look on the A.I.'s face turned to one of hope. We're going to try answered Catherine. Now, let's go to the command center and get this show on the road. Clarissa instantly vanished, startling the admiral. You'll get used to that, said Colonel Leon, shaking her head. The AI is brilliant, but she sometimes acts as if this is her personal ship. Catherine nodded. She had heard a lot about Ariel and Clarissa over the years, and it had been interesting to finally meet the remaining AI. She knew Clarissa would play a huge role in the success of this mission, and Catherine intended to get to know the intriguing AI much better in the near future. As the two left the flight bay, Catherine couldn't help but notice how clean and spotless everything was. She knew the ship had two flight bays, which contained 60 Talon fighters and 40 Anlon bombers. The ship also had 60 small 10-meter defense globes, which could be deployed to protect the ship if needed. The globes were equipped with a small sublight drive and an experimental ion cannon, which was supposed to be able to knock holes in an energy shield. Its fusion power plant could also be overloaded to generate a 10 megaton explosion. Is the crew ready for this mission? asked Catherine, glancing over at Colonel Leon. Yes, Petra replied. We are all volunteers and dedicated to bringing Fourth Fleet back home. If they're still alive, mentioned Catherine. Don't say that around Kelsey or Katie, cautioned Petra, her eyes narrowing. They are both positive their husbands are trapped in another galaxy awaiting rescue. Let's just hope they are, Catherine responded. Kelsey was standing next to Katie, watching as Miko Law, the Alton computer specialist, ran another diagnostic on the ship's mainframe computer. The tall, slender, white-haired Alton woman was very efficient at her job. I understand Rear Admiral Barnes has arrived on board, spoke Katie, her light green eyes watching everything Miko was doing. The Alton's computer technology was far more advanced than the Federation's, with the exception of Clarissa, and she didn't really count since she was an AI. For the last four years, Katie had taken a crash course in that advanced technology, learning everything she possibly could. Yes, about ten minutes ago, replied Kelsey with a deep sigh. The last four years had been hard on both her and Katie. They'd watched from the Star Strike as the Avenger, then Fourth Fleet, and shortly after that, Grayseth's fleet had vanished into the swirling white monstrosity created when the hyper-translation station had been destroyed. Their husbands and most of their trusted friends had gone into the white light, never to be heard from again. Kelsey was firmly convinced that Rear Admiral Susan Marks wouldn't have put the rest of Fourth Fleet in peril if she hadn't detected something. Rear Admiral Marks had been the closest to the Vortex, which had swallowed the Avenger and Jeremy's portion of Fourth Fleet. Kelsey was certain that Marks or Grayseth must have realized the Avenger and other missing Fourth Fleet ships had been sent somewhere. There was also the fact that in Grayseth's fleet, there had been four Alton science cruisers. 
there was a remote chance that the Altons had informed Grayseth and Rear Admiral Marks the spatial vortex was safe to transit, though there were no records of any such transmission. However, the EMP blast had made long-range communications difficult for a few minutes immediately after the hyper-translation station had been destroyed. It was possible the messages had been lost in the EMP and fluctuating energy bursts from the vortex. Kelsey was also convinced that Ariel would have done everything in her power to keep the Avengers safe. We're finally going, Katie said, her eyes glistening. She had missed Kevin terribly over the last four years. She couldn't count how many times she had cried herself to sleep at night. She and Kelsey had put in many sleepless nights working on this ship and ensuring it had everything necessary for this voyage. Ambassador Tureen and Governor Barnes had also been instrumental in getting the distant horizon built. This ship represented their final hope for finding their missing husbands and the lost fleets. She's arrived, quipped Clarissa, as she popped into existence next to the two girls. We're finally going to go and rescue Ariel and the rest. Neither of the girls were startled, as they were used to the AI's antics. It will be a while yet predicted Kelsey, taking a deep breath. The Admiral will want to take the ship on a thorough shakedown cruise before we set up for the Galactic Center. I miss Ariel, continued Clarissa, in a more subdued voice. It's like a part of me is gone. We know, replied Katie, recognizing just how the AI felt. Kelsey and I feel the same way about Jeremy and Kevin. Ariel will have kept all of them safe, Clarissa said, confidently. She's just waiting for us to come and rescue them. All three turned toward the main hatch to the command center as it swung open and Colonel Leon and Rear Admiral Barnes stepped inside. Catherine's first view of the command center caused her to stare in amazement. The entire front wall was one massive Alton view screen, which showed space directly in front of the distant horizon. The main difference between a Federation view screen and an Alton view screen was the latter made it feel as if you could step right out into space. The view was breathtaking and held her attention for several long seconds. There were three workstations directly in front of the screen. Navigation, Helm, and the hyperspace consoles were all manned by highly experienced fleet officers. Admiral on deck, called out Major Weir from Tactical, seeing Catherine come into the command center. Major Weir had been the tactical officer on the Star Strike, and hadn't hesitated to volunteer for this mission. He was certain former Fleet Admiral Streth would have approved of his decision. Instantly, everyone snapped to attention, standing up and turning to face the Admiral. As you were, Catherine said, with a slight nod of acknowledgement. Let the record show that as of this date, Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes formally takes over command of the distant horizon, spoke Commander Grissom, gesturing toward one of the two chairs on the command dais. She continued, Admiral, the ship is yours. Thank you, Commander, responded Catherine. Let the record show as of this date. I accept command at the distant horizon. Catherine walked over to stand next to Commander Grissom. This is a big ship. Yes, it is, replied Anne, with a pleased smile. It has to be for where we're going. Looking around the command center, Catherine saw that sensors and communications were just to her right. Damage control and the main computer station were to her left. In front of the command dais, and slightly to the side, on the left and right, were two large tactical holographic displays. The biggest station was tactical, which was directly behind the command dais on an upraised platform. It was manned by eight officers, who controlled the ship's weapons, as well as the distant horizon's powerful energy shield. Other stations were located on a second level, which ran on the sides and directly above the tactical station. Stand by to get underway, ordered Catherine, satisfied that everything was in order. The ship was currently 10 million kilometers distant from the massive Alton shipyard that had constructed the Exploration Dreadnought. Set a course out of the system and stand by to activate the subspace drive at one-third power. Yes, Admiral, Commander Grissom responded as she quickly passed on the orders to the necessary departments. The ship had already been taken out on test voyages by a skeleton crew and performed admirably. Catherine then stepped over to where Kelsey, Katie, and Clarissa were standing. She looked at the three for a moment before speaking. Kelsey and Katie, effective immediately, you are once more Federation fleet officers with the rank of lieutenant. Kelsey and Katie nodded. They had resigned their commissions immediately after the memorial ceremony at the Fleet Academy. 
They'd gone to Cirrus, and with the backing of then-Governor Malik and Ambassador Turin, had gone on to the Alton homeworld to drum up support for a rescue mission for the missing fleets. The distant horizon was the result of their efforts. Ready to get underway, Admiral, Commander Grissom reported. Alton Space Authority has given its approval for our departure. We may enter hyperspace once we have cleared 100 million kilometers from the planet. All ship systems are functioning normally, Clarissa reported as she did a quick scan of the ship's many intricate systems. It thrilled her to be able to control such a massive and powerful ship. Thanks to Alton technology, the ship almost seemed alive when Clarissa accessed the ship's systems. Catherine nodded as she returned to the command dais and sat down. Engage the sublight drive and let's begin our trials. The helm officer ran his fingers over the touchscreen on his console, and the ship quickly began to accelerate and put more distance between it and the massive shipyard in orbit around the Alton's homeworld. On one of the many view screens on the side walls, the station could be seen rapidly growing smaller. Catherine allowed her eyes to roam across the different duty stations, noting with satisfaction that everyone seemed to be doing their jobs properly. Everyone in this crew had volunteered for this mission. A number had come from fleet flagships such as the Star Strike and the Warstorm. It was a well-experienced crew, which just needed to get used to working with one another. Sensors, spoke Catherine, glancing over at Captain Reynolds, formerly of the battleship Star Strike. Put the system up on the tactical display to my right. Instantly, the large tactical display became lit up with various icons. Catherine had thought that New Telus and the Soul System were heavily fortified, but nothing prepared her for this. The Alton's home planet was surrounded by hundreds of indomitable-class battle stations, there were also six large shipyards in orbit. They had centuries to prepare for the AIs, explained Commander Grissom. Every one of their inhabited planets sits inside a ring of those, and they're all automated with only minimal crews. There were also hundreds of friendly green icons representing Alton ships of various types. Everything from powerful warships to cargo ships traveling from world to world. The Altons had a thriving interstellar civilization and unmatched technology. Catherine was just glad they were on the Federation side. The distant horizon continued to accelerate and soon passed the 100 million kilometer mark. There were no reported problems and the ship was ready to make the transit into hyperspace. Prepare to jump, ordered Catherine. Set a course for Nutellus. We're going to spend two weeks testing out this ship before going to the Sol system. Course set, replied the navigation officer. Initiate jump, spoke Catherine, looking at Commander Grissom. Jump, Grissom ordered. On the massive view screen, a swirling blue-white spatial vortex came into being. The helm officer expertly maneuvered the exploration dreadnought into its center, and the ship made its transition into hyperspace. Catherine felt a momentary twinge in her stomach, and then the deep purple colors of hyperspace appeared on the main view screen. Seen from this perspective in an Alton-built ship, the view was almost frightening. It was something she would have to get used to or order the screen shut off. For now, she decided to leave it on. She settled back in her command chair, feeling pleased with the ship. In another few weeks, they would set up for the Galactic Center and maybe finally learn what happened to the missing fleets. Kelsey and Katie were in the officer's mess eating lunch and discussing the upcoming mission. Clarissa had joined them and was sitting next to Katie. We reach Earth tomorrow, Clarissa informed them. For the last two weeks, the distant horizon had been jumping around the Human Federation of Worlds in mock attacks and practicing numerous battle drills. The crew never knew when Rear Admiral Barnes would set off the Condition 1 alarms, and many had resorted to sleeping in their uniforms to be prepared. I want to visit the Fleet Academy, Katie said in a soft voice. I would like to go see the monument. Are you sure, Katie? asked Kelsey. They'd never visited the monument after the memorial ceremony. It would have been too painful. The monument Katie was referring to was the one that overlooked the Fleet Academy. Originally, it had been built to honor Katie's father and Jeremy's dad. After the battle at the Galactic Center, it had been modified to honor all the dead of the war. It was the most widely visited monument in the Federation. Yes, answered Katie, nodding her head. I need to before we leave. Katie looked down at her plate. She was having a Caesar salad while Kelsey was eating baked salmon. She missed watching Kevin eat his daily allotment of hamburgers and fries while the rest of them cracked jokes about his food choices. 
If she were ever lucky enough to watch Kevin eat a hamburger again, she wouldn't complain. She suspected none of them would. I can't visit the monument, Clarissa said regretfully. I have seen pictures and videos of it. It's very awe-inspiring. Memorial Sunday is an official day of mourning for the entire Federation, Kelsey said with sadness in her eyes. The monument is now dedicated to everyone who died in the war. Clarissa nodded her head, knowing how devastating the great battle had been. So many people were killed at the Galactic Center. Even Fleet Admiral Carla Johnson had met her fate there, along with so many others. Nearly 70% of the Federation fleets had been destroyed, and it had taken several years for the Federation to recover from the loss of so many valuable ships and personnel. If we can find and bring Fourth Fleet back, along with Grayseth's fleet, it would mean a lot to so many Federation and Carthian families who had loved ones in the fleets, Katie said, laying down her fork, no longer feeling hungry. If we can find where they went and take the distant horizon to where they are, added Kelsey, her deep blue eyes looking across the table at Katie and Clarissa. I just hope they're still okay. They'll be excited to see us, Clarissa predicted. I have so much to tell Ariel. She had created a special file of everything she had done since the other AI had vanished just to transmit to her friend. We'll all have a lot to talk about, said Katie, picking up her fork and taking another bite of her salad. She didn't want to say it aloud, but she was deeply concerned about Jeremy, Kevin, and Angela. After all, it had been over four years since the battle at the Galactic Center, and so much could have happened to the fleets during that time. The next day, the distant horizon was in orbit above Earth's moon. The entire crew was being given 48 hours leave before they began their trip to the galactic center. The shipyard above the moon seems to be getting larger every time I see it, commented Commander Ann Grissom from where she was standing in front of the large view screen in the command center. The shipyard seemed to fill the screen with its magnified view. It was the first shipyard built, if we don't count those inside Cirrus, responded Catherine, coming to stand next to Anne. There was only a small crew in the command center, as most were being shuttled down to either the moon or Earth. A few had taken shuttles to Cirrus, where their families lived. The New Horizon mission left here on Earth's first interstellar journey, spoke Commander Grissom, recalling her history. You do realize Katie and Kelsey were on that mission, don't you? asked Catherine, looking inquisitively over at Anne. I tend to forget sometimes, the commander answered, folding her arms across her chest. All of the Special Five were on that mission. They're part of our history, Catherine responded. Admiral Tellick used to tell me just how important they were to the morale of the Federation and what they represented. He summed it up for me one day in one simple word. Hope. It took me a while to fully understand just what he meant. Katie and Kelsey had walked up the long row of steps, which led to the top of the ridge overlooking the Fleet Academy. On top of the ridge was a large granite memorial obelisk. The obelisk towered nearly 10 meters above them. On its face were depicted two men, Admiral Jason Strong and Greg Johnson. A short inscription read, From this side, men from the planet Earth first gazed upon the Avenger. This discovery sent the human race to the stars. A set of wide stairs had been cut into the slope to make access to the obelisk easy. Every student at the academy was required to make the trip to the obelisk at least once each semester. It was part of their history. Below the inscription, the names of Admiral Jeremy Strong, Lieutenant Kevin Walters, and Lieutenant Angela DeSoda had been added. Next to it, on each side, two additional massive black memorial walls had been erected. On the walls were the names of everyone who had died in the war. It was a wall of heroes and would always be remembered as such. Kelsey and Katie stood for quite some time just looking at the monument, knowing what it signified. Kelsey reached out, touched Jeremy's name, and then turned to Katie. Do you think they're still alive? We have to think they are, answered Katie, knowing Kelsey had just voiced their greatest fear. I believe they're alive, spoke a voice from behind them. Startled, the two women turned around to see Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes standing behind them. If I didn't believe they were alive, I never would have volunteered for this mission. Admiral Tellick was a firm believer in Jeremy and his abilities to command. If anyone could keep his fleet intact after transiting that spatial vortex, it would be him. 
I thought there would be more people up here, Katie commented. She knew large passenger liners arrived daily, bringing people from across the Federation to see the monument. Sometimes it amazes me how the five of you never realized just how important you were to the Federation, Catherine said, shaking her head. I notified the Commandant of the Fleet Academy yesterday we would be arriving and that the two of you would be visiting the monument. The monument has been closed to everyone for the entire day to allow the two of you to pay your respects. Look down at the base of the steps. The girls looked down and were astonished to see what seemed like thousands of cadets standing at attention at the beginning of the stairs and reaching back to the massive buildings of the academy itself. They looked back at the admiral, not understanding. They are showing their respect for what the Special Five did for the Federation, Catherine explained. Every one of them is praying that we're successful in our mission. Already, across the Federation and Alliance space, the secret of what we're going to attempt to do is spreading like wildfire. Messages have been coming in, nearly overwhelming the communication center here at the Academy. The entire Federation is now solidly behind this mission. And we're being asked to do one thing, and one thing only. Bring the missing fleets home. Kelsey and Katie stepped over and gazed down at the assembled cadets, feeling their hearts bursting with emotion. They'd never expected anything like this. Catherine walked over to stand next to the two women. I promise you this, she said with determination in her voice. If they are out there, we'll find them. The three stood at the top of the steps for several more minutes, thinking about the past and what was waiting in their future. The greatest voyage ever attempted was about to begin. In orbit above them, the distant horizon beckoned. Chapter 3 Four Years Previous Jeremy felt himself flung violently against the restraints of his command chair and then everything went dark. Slowly, his senses began to return, and his head throbbed with a pounding headache. Leaning back, he took a deep breath, trying to take stock of his surroundings. The lights were flickering, and there was smoke in the air. Warning lights were going off, and red lights were flashing everywhere. Status report, he demanded, shaking his head, trying to clear it. Ship's power is down, reported Ariel with a panicked look on her normally calm face. She was standing at Jeremy's left side. I'm trying to restore it. Right now, the ship is operating on batteries only, including life support. I need sensors, Jeremy said, looking intently at the AI. I need the sensors and the view screens up as soon as possible. Make them a priority. What about our energy screen and weapons? All non-functional, Ariel report gloomily. From her initial scans of the interior of the ship, Many of the crew were unconscious. Those that weren't seemed dazed. I'll have one of the secondary fusion reactors up in five minutes. We may not have five minutes, stated Jeremy, worriedly. At any moment, he expected an AI energy beam or antimatter missile to put an end to the Avenger. Ah, uh, where are we? moaned Commander Malin, pulling herself up off the floor. She had a wicked cut on her arm that was bleeding profusely. A medic hurried over and began applying a bandage to stem the flow of blood. There were several medics in the command center, and all were busy checking and administering to the injured. Don't know, spoke Kevin, woozily, as he ran his fingers over his sensor console. I don't have any power to the senses. Ariel's working on that, replied Jeremy, shifting his gaze back to the AI. Ariel, do we have any communications to other parts of the ship? Coming online now, replied Ariel as she shifted some of the limited power she had available to the internal communication system. Jeremy changed his minicom to internal and tried to raise Roger Simpkins, the chief engineer. After nearly a full minute, he finally got an answer. What's the situation, chief? asked Jeremy, fearing the worst. We suffered some type of power feedback that caused all of the reactors to automatically shut down to protect themselves from critical damage. We're doing a manual restart, but it'll take about 30 minutes before we have main power back up. Ariel said she can have one of the secondary reactors up in another few minutes, Jeremy informed him. Will that help? A lot, Roger replied. If we can have one of the secondary reactors operating, we can speed up the process with the others. 
Give me 15 minutes and I'll have the mains back online. Grab whoever you need, Jeremy ordered. Right now, power is our main objective. We're sitting ducks without it. Before Jeremy could say another word, the lights in the command center suddenly brightened and the view screens began coming on one by one. He gasped in concern when he saw an AI ship in close proximity to the Avenger on one of the screens. How close is that AI ship? He demanded. The 1500 meter globe seemed to fill the screen. Short-range sensors are back up, Kevin reported, as his hands danced across his screen. That AI ship is only 10 kilometers away, but it seems to be drifting. There's no energy screen or indications of power. As more screens came to life, the command crew looked at them in shocked amazement. Hundreds of ships were visible, both AI and Federation. However, there were no signs of the black hole or any of the massive constructions the AIs had built. We're not in our galaxy, Ariel informed Jeremy as she ran a quick scan of nearby stars with what was in her database. When we destroyed the hyper-translation station, it must have activated the spatial vortex the AIs have been working on. We've gone through it. Do you know what galaxy we're in? asked Jeremy, feeling speechless. With a sudden feeling of dread, he realized that they were cut off from Kelsey and Katie. He glanced over at Kevin, wondering if his best friend had realized that yet. No. Ariel answered as she checked the database. It will take time to correlate data from the stars we can see and try to match them up with our stellar records. We'll worry about that later, commented Jeremy, drawing in a sharp breath. I want our energy screen up as soon as possible. That AI ship could fire on us at any moment. I've already brought it up to 10% power, Ariel answered as she struggled to shift power to needed parts of the ship. I can't do more than that until the other reactors come back online. I do have power shunted to our secondary railguns if they're needed. That made Jeremy feel a little better. At least he had something to shoot with if he had to, though how much damage he could do to an AI ship with the Avengers' secondary railguns was another matter. Jeremy, Kevin said, his face looking confused. I'm detecting nearly 500 AI ships, as well as what appears to be the rest of Fourth Fleet, plus Grayseth's. I've spotted his mobile shipyard. Anyone moving? asked Jeremy wondering how all the ships had gotten here. No, responded Kevin, shaking his head. They all seem to be powerless. What about the Alton ships? Did they come through with us? Jeremy knew if the AIs powered back up, they would need the Alton battleships and battlecruisers if they hoped to have any chance to survive. Yes, Kevin replied as he checked his sensors. I've spotted Admiral Cletius's ship, but it's powerless also. I believe it was the Vortex, Ariel put forth, looking over at Jeremy. If we actually transited from one galaxy to the other, the energy required would have been tremendous. All of our ships, including the AIs, run on fusion power plants. Everything may have shut down automatically to protect the power units from damage. Okay, Jeremy replied, his eyes narrowing worriedly. How much longer would it be before the AIs restored power? Keep an eye on them, and let me know at the first sign of one of them moving. Chief Simkins reports main power will be coming online shortly, reported Commander Malin. They're using the secondary reactor Ariel activated to jumpstart the others. He says it's a little bit risky, but it should work. Kyla's arm was now bandaged, and she was moving around the command center, checking different stations. Several medics were still busy attending to personnel who had been injured. All external communications are still silent, reported Angela worriedly. I have sufficient power for short-range communications with the other ships, but no one is responding. Suddenly, a number of other consoles in the command center began functioning, and the lights seemed to brighten. Main power has been restored, reported Ariel, relieved she could now increase the Avengers' energy shield to full power. We have all weapons, and the energy shield is charging. Jeremy breathed a huge sigh of relief. Ensign Stryker, move us outside this field of ships. That will give us a better tactical advantage. We're way too close to some of these AI ships. I'm detecting movement from several of the AIs, Kevin said excitedly. They're moving away from us and haven't activated any of their weapons. Target them with our antimatter missiles, Jeremy ordered, as his eyes focused sharply on one of the tactical displays, now beginning to display data. If they fire a weapon or launch a missile, hit them hard. Locking on, Lieutenant Preston reported from his tactical station. Why aren't they firing? asked Commander Malin, looking confused. Our other ships are defenseless, and they could easily wipe them out. They're confused, just as we are, Ariel replied, 
as she ran several simulations on the ship's main computer i would suggest we send them a message requesting a cessation of hostilities until we understand what's happened will they agree asked jeremy looking doubtful i will mention that we have several alton science ships with us ariel explained they know the alton science is far superior to theirs my simulations indicate a seventy two per cent chance they will agree jeremy shook his head not quite sure what to do but if the two ai's fired he could lose most of his fleet do it on one of the ai ships the command ai studied the message from the human ship a cessation of hostilities made sense considering there were altons involved from the sensor scans they had performed so far this seemed to be the galaxy they targeted originally in their research but there was no sign of the ship that had been sent through earlier inform the humans that we agree to a cessation of hostilities for now the ai said the radiant ball of energy which served as its head glowing brighter while the ais had some emotions they were still a very logical race studying the tactical screen the command ai knew that as soon as all of its ships had restored power they would have a decisive tactical advantage over the humans the command ai would allow the cessation of hostilities for now but as soon as it learned from the altons what was needed all the organics would be eradicated the ais have agreed spoke angela nervously they wish to speak to the altons as soon as possible they will attempt to destroy us as soon as they've learned what they need from the altons warned ariel her dark eyes focusing on jeremy it's what i would do in their position that will at least give us time to gather our fleets and prepare jeremy said in full agreement with ariel's assessment of the situation kevin looked over at jeremy with dawning realization jeremy how are we going to get home what about kelsey and katie i don't know jeremy replied as he leaned back and studied the tactical display he wondered how the rest of the battle at the galactic center had turned out were the human and alton fleets victorious or had the ai's wiped them out rear admiral susan marks was about to come unglued for ten minutes they'd been struggling to get the retribution's power back up they had battery power and one of the view screens was working she felt a cold chill run down her back as she gazed at the 1,500-meter AI sphere, less than four kilometers from her ship. I want all fighters and bombers ready to launch, she spoke with ice in her voice. Nuclear ordnance is approved for the bombers. We're trying, reported Major Wink Thurman, with a frustrated look on his face. Some of the emergency doors are shut and we're having trouble getting the pilots to the ships. Tactical, as soon as we have power, target that AI ship and blow it away, Susan ordered. I don't know if that would be wise, cautioned Captain Tracy Thomas from Tactical, glancing back at the Admiral. We're so close to the AI that if we destroy it, we could suffer severe or even cataclysmic damage. Damn, uttered Susan, her face taking on a grim look. Target it anyway, but don't fire until I order you to. She was beginning to wonder just what kind of terrifying horror she led her ships into. From what they'd been able to see on the one functioning view screen, all of fourth fleet and grayseth's fleet were here as well as hundreds of ais so far they hadn't been able to find the avenger they had spotted some of the alton ships which made her feel better the lights on the command center suddenly brightened and then went out completely for a moment she stood next to her command chair in total darkness this can't be good muttered commander hiru akira from her side the emergency lighting shouldn't have gone out the battery should be good for hours yet. Even the quiet sounds of life support were gone. The gentle sound of air moving through the vents had faded, and everyone in the command center stopped talking. All at once, the lights flickered on, then went to full brightness, and the view screens began blinking on one by one. Around the command center, numerous consoles slowly hummed back to life. Sorry if I scared you, came the chief engineer's voice over Susan's minicom. But we had to take the batteries offline and use them to jumpstart one of the auxiliary reactors, which we in turn used to restart the mains. Admiral, I have the Avenger on the comm, shouted an excited ensign Peyton Wilde from communications. The young brunette was literally beaming with joy. Admiral Strong is instructing us not to fire on any of the AIs. There's currently a cessation of hostilities agreement until both sides can determine exactly where we are. I have a short-range sensor online reported Lieutenant Nathan Brewster. God, there's a hell of a lot of ships out there. Susan looked over at one of the tactical displays, which had just activated. 
numerous green and red thread icons were beginning to appear. One large green icon was moving away to one side of the conglomeration of ships. That's the Avenger, reported Commander Akira, pointing to the moving icon. Is the sublight drive functioning? asked Susan, looking at Lieutenant Justine Brittles. Yes, Admiral, Justine replied. Set a course for the Avenger, Susan ordered. Put us on our starboard side. Once we've reached her, I want two full squadrons of fighters out on CSP. Instruct the pilots there to stay away from the AI ships for now. Yes, Admiral, Major Thurman replied, as he passed on the order to the flight bay. With power restored, at least his pilots were able to get to the bay. Jeremy watched patiently and nervously as the ships of 4th Fleet and Grace's Fleet restored their power and slowly moved to take up defensive positions around the Avenger. Once all the ships were operational, Jeremy ordered the Bears' mobile shipyard, the four Alton Science ships, and all supply ships to a position behind 4th Fleet, as well as all 60 of the Alton battlecruisers. The battlecruisers would provide protection for the more vulnerable ships. Strangely enough, the last ships to move were the Alton battleships and battlecruisers. With Admiral Cletius's warships, it gave them at least a fighting chance against the AIs if a shooting war broke out. Later, Jeremy learned the Alton systems had been more heavily affected by the destruction of the hyper-translation station. Many of their computer servers, which linked multiple complicated and advanced systems on the Alton ships, had to be replaced before power could be restored. The Alton ships were all very highly networked. Activating his minicom to the command channel, he was instantly put in contact with Admiral Cletius, Rear Admiral Susan Marks, and Graceth. We're in a mess, Jeremy began without preamble. Evidently, we were drawn into the AI's intergalactic spatial vortex when the Avenger destroyed the hypertranslation station. I just wish I knew what happened after we were taken away. We won, Susan said with confidence. Our last readings just before we entered the vortex indicated the destruction of the hypertranslation station caused a massive feedback of power through all of the capacitor stations, resulting in a huge EMP burst. Our readings indicated the AIs had stopped firing on the fleet. The massive EMP blast immobilized the AIs, Admiral Cletius informed them. I have spoken to several of the scientists on our science vessels, and they feel confident of that. So they would have been sitting ducks for what was left of our fleet, uttered Jeremy, his eyes wide with hope. Then the Federation won. Probably, Admiral Cletius said. We won't know until we find a way to return home or send a message. Susan, began Jeremy, thinking about what she had said about entering the vortex. What do you mean about entering the vortex? Weren't you drawn in like the rest of Fourth Fleet? It was my fault, Graceth rumbled over the comm connection. I saw the Avenger, the ships of Fourth Fleet, and the battleships of Admiral Cletius vanish in the great white light. I ordered my ships to follow, to come to your assistance. You are my clan brother, and where you go, I and my people will follow. Once Graceth entered the vortex, we followed also, since I had nearly all the fighters and bombers, confessed Susan. You shouldn't have, Jeremy chided them. The Federation would have needed your ships. What's done is done, spoke Admiral Cletius, in a calm voice. It is good that they came. We can't allow these A.I.s to dominate a new galaxy. Jeremy looked over at Ariel, who was listening in on the conversation. How many A.I. ships are there? 485, she responded, quickly checking the Avengers' sensors. Some of them are heavily damaged. We have a cessation of hostilities agreement until we determine where we are, mentioned Jeremy. Admiral Cletius, do you believe the A.I.s will honor it? As long as it benefits them, yes. Cletius replied, but as soon as they no longer feel they need us, they'll turn on us without warning. Admirals, Ariel suddenly interrupted, sounding deeply concerned. My long-range sensors are picking up several fleets of contacts moving in on our direction. The new sensors Ariel was referring to had only been recently installed and were of Alton design. They could even pick up a ship in hyperspace. How far out? Jeremy asked, his eyes widening. It was hard enough to believe they were in another galaxy, but now they might also be dealing with a first contact scenario. Eight light years and coming fast, Ariel reported. They'll be here in slightly less than 14 minutes. That is fast, spoke Susan. What do we do, Admiral? 
We don't want to start a war with an unknown race, answered Jeremy, thinking furiously. This is their galaxy. We'll hold our current position until we ascertain exactly what they want. My biggest concern is the AIs and what they might do. Let me handle that, suggested Admiral Cletius. I'll contact them and recommend we be allowed to handle this first contact situation. Make it quick, replied Jeremy, looking over at one of the tactical displays, now showing the new potential threat icons. Contacting them now, Cletius replied. Susan, prepare your bombers for a shipping strike, Jeremy ordered. All ships are to stay at Condition 1 until we fully understand the Unknown's intentions. Let's hope it's peaceful, Susan replied. We're ready, boomed Graceth over the comm. A few minutes passed, and then Admiral Cletius came back on the comm. The AIs have agreed, he reported. They will allow us to open up negotiations and will not fire unless fired upon. Now we wait, Jeremy said, leaning back in his command chair and gazing pensively at the tactical display. Had they just escaped one danger, only to step directly into another? Prepare to fire upon these new organics when I give the order, the command AI spoke, as it moved over toward the large tactical console, where several other AIs were hovering. The Alton Admiral has requested that we allow the humans a chance to speak with these unknowns. It will allow us to learn who these organics are and possibly their weaknesses. From the speed of their approach, they are more advanced than we are, reported the science AI from where it was hovering next to the ship's main computer system. The command AI floated back over to the front of the main tactical screen, watching it with interest. This galaxy, if it was the one they had originally targeted, was supposed to have been the beginning of an intergalactic empire dominated by the AIs. If this were a powerful and dangerous organic race, it would have to be dealt with eventually. Any time, Ariel spoke in a soft voice as she used the ship's powerful sensors to search for the inbound alien ship. Contact, yelled Kevin, as his sensor screen suddenly began to light up with new threat icons. Ariel, send the first contact package, ordered Jeremy. The first contact package had been designed by Federation linguists to allow the language of new civilizations to be understood. It contained a number primer that formed the basis for more complicated communications. Package sent, reported Ariel. Incoming fire, warned Commander Malin as she ran over to tactical. On the view screen was a ship out of one's worst nightmare. It was bulbous in form, with large metallic-looking pylons which stretched out in front of it. Jeremy could see six of the massive structures extending at least 200 meters out from the main hull of the ship. Each ended in a sharp point, and from these, some type of energy weapon was being fired. Ariel, continue to try to contact them, ordered Jeremy, as 4th Fleet began taking incoming fire. On one of the view screens, he saw an AI ship explode, as its shield was rapidly overloaded. Altons are attempting to contact also, Angela reported as she listened to frantic messages over her comm. So far there has been no response. How many are there? Jeremy demanded, as the Avenger rocked violently and several red lights appeared on the damage control console. 115 in this first fleet, and two more fleets similar in size inbound, Ariel replied. The other two fleets will be arriving within the next five minutes. Close the range and engage, Jeremy ordered. Ariel, begin scanning the nearer systems. We may need to jump away from here shortly. On it. Ariel replied as she began to use the Avengers' advanced sensors to determine potential jump coordinates to several of the nearby star systems. At least five light years, Jeremy suggested as the Avengers shook violently one more time. He just hoped the ship stayed together long enough so they could jump. We just lost secondary engineering, reported Commander Malin with deep concern on her face. We have a hole in our hull and we're venting atmosphere. I don't know if anyone made it out. The Unknown's energy beams are tearing through the shield, reported Ariel, as she shunted all the power she could to the Avengers' energy screen. Jeremy looked around at his crew. They seemed frightened at what was happening. He couldn't blame them, lost in a strange galaxy with a large number of AIs, and now under attack by what appeared to be a dangerous and hostile alien race. What else could possibly go wrong? Chapter 4 
Fourth Fleet quickly closed the range as the AIs began returning fire with every weapon they had at their disposal. Huge explosions rolled across the screens of the unknown ships as 20 megaton antimatter missiles pummeled their shields. Powerful white energy beams flashed out as the AI fleet changed instantly into attack mode with a vengeance. AI weapons are futile, reported a shaken Commander Malin as she saw the unknown's energy screens seem to be unaffected by the ferocious AI counterattack. Hit them with our own antimatter missiles, Jeremy ordered as the Avenger continued to vibrate from weapons fire impacting her shield. Let's see if they can stand up to a 100 megaton explosion. Firing spread and antimatter missiles, reported Lieutenant Preston, as he activated and fired six of the deadly missiles at the closest enemy contact. Jeremy shifted his gaze to one of the main view screens as it suddenly lit up with the fury of the Avengers' attack. When the shield returned to normal, he was astounded to see the strange spacecraft still there, seemingly untouched. Antimatter missiles were ineffective, Ari reported, as she used the ship's sensors to see how the other ships were doing. The Altons have destroyed two of the unknowns, using their particle beams. They seem to be the only weapon capable of penetrating the unknown shields. Twenty confirmed dead in secondary engineering, Commander Malin reported, as she listened to reports of the damage the Avenger had suffered. There are also several fires in adjoining compartments. Fire suppression system has been activated. Admiral Cletius confirms the only weapon they have that is effective against the unknowns are the particle beams, reported Angela from Communications. He says the unknowns are using some type of multi-phase energy shield. Battleship Molos is down, added Kevin, as ships began to disappear off his sensor screens. Battlecruiser Yang Zi is down. He looked worriedly over at Jeremy. All ships, use your particle beams, Jeremy ordered over the fleet-wide channel. Stand by to jump as soon as we have a set of coordinates. He turned to Ariel with deep concern on his face. Ariel, we need those coordinates. Another minute. Ariel answered as she calculated possible jump coordinates to several nearby stars, which were just a little over five light years distant. Without accurate survey maps, she was using the ship's long range sensors to scan nearby systems for safe exit points. The Avengers shook violently again, and more red lights appeared on the damage control console. We just lost a power beam battery and two defensive laser turrets, reported Commander Malin. Admiral, we're taking a lot of damage. Light cruisers Kalen and Furia down, Kevin added, as human ships continued to die. The Altons are losing ships also. Two of their battleships just dropped off the sensors. The light cruisers are going to be picked off if we don't pull them back, Commander Malin quickly pointed out. Their shields just aren't strong enough to stand up to this kind of firepower. All light cruisers pull back to Grayseth's fleet, Jeremy ordered. His lighter units had no chance against these new aliens. Second group of unknowns are dropping out of hyperspace warned Kevin, as another 130 red thread icons began materializing on his sensor screens. They'll be in combat range in five minutes! In space, energy beams, power beams, laser beams, and particle beams were now prevalent as both sides tried to knock down the energy screens of the opposing ships. Alton vessels were using their powerful particle beams to knock down enemy energy screens, and the AIs were following up by using their own heavy energy beams to finish them off. In an uneasy alliance, the two sides were working together. Several of the large, bulbous ships were torn apart by the heavy weapons fire from the Altons and the AIs. Huge explosions designated the death of the unknown ships as massive amounts of stored-up energy were released. When the glare from the explosions faded, all that was left were a few snippets of glowing gas. The unknowns were heavily outnumbered, but their energy screens seemed capable of handling most of the weapons being hurled at them. The command AI watched as four more of its warships were annihilated by these new organics. So far, all AI weapons had been ineffective. Only the particle beams used by the humans and the Altons were managing to penetrate the new enemy's energy screens. Orders had been passed to coordinate heavy energy weapons fire with the human and Alton ships. Even as the command AI watched, three more of the new enemy's ships were destroyed by a combination of human particle weapons fire and AI energy beams. Now we know what happened to our survey ship, spoke the AI at the main computer console. These strange organics must have destroyed it and have been monitoring this region of space in case we sent more ships through the intergalactic vortex. This was a trap. They are dangerous, confirmed the command AI.
as two more AI ships exploded on one of the view screens. We must form an alliance with the humans and the Altans if we want to survive in this galaxy. They have the only effective weapon against these new organics. How long will this alliance exist? Asked another AI, hovering just in front of the main tactical console. They may not agree to such an undertaking after what we did to them in our home galaxy. That is unknown, answered the command AI as it realized that the humans and the Altans offered the only hope of the AI's continued survival. It is necessary that the humans and the Altans trust us, or they will never agree to our request. In order to do that, we might be forced to resort to things we once thought of as unthinkable. The inbound fire from the unknowns lessened as the full might of the AI's, Fourth Fleet, and the Altans was turned upon them. The heavy particle beam fire from the human and Alton ships was having an effect, particularly when joined by the powerful energy fire from the AIs. It was evident the unknowns were waiting for their two inbound fleets to tip the advantage back to them. Since the fighting against the unknowns had begun, not a single bit of weapons fire had been exchanged between the AIs and the Federation ships. I'm receiving a message from the AIs, Ariel announced in surprise. They're offering a formal alliance and are willing to place their ships under your command. They also state they will give a 72-hour notice if it is decided at a later date to cancel the joint venture. Let them die here, suggested Kevin, shaking his head at Jeremy. All the AIs have ever done is kill billions of people, even more when you include all the alien races they enslave through their proxies. We don't want any part of any deal with the AIs. They have nearly 500 ships, Commander Malin pointed out unsure what they should do. They also might understand better what brought us here. You're saying that if we ever want to return home, we might need the AIs, stated Jeremy, drawing in a sharp breath. He felt a cold chill run down his back at the thought of working with the metallic beings. How could they ever be trusted? Jeremy looked around the suddenly silent command center as he thought about what to do. It was evident from the looks of his crew that most were opposed to any type of alliance with the hated AIs. The AIs have sent the same message to Admiral Cletius, Angela continued, as she listened to an incoming message on her comm. He says the Altons will abide by your decision. He also says the Alton scientists on the exploration cruisers may have a method to ensure the AIs stay true to their word if you decide to agree to this alliance. I have the jump coordinates, added Ariel, waiting for an answer from Jeremy. We can jump at any time. Send the coordinates to all ships. Including the AIs, ordered Jeremy, hoping he wouldn't regret this decision. All ships to jump immediately. In space, blue-white spatial vortexes began forming in front of all the Federation ships and white vortexes in front of the AIs. In less than two minutes, all the ships that could jump had fled into the vortexes. Two light cruisers and an Alton battleship were too damaged to flee, and all three exploded as their self-destruct charges were set off leaving no survivors for the unknowns to capture. Jeremy breathed a sigh of relief as he saw the familiar dark purple colors of hyperspace. They were safe for now. He looked across at his command crew, seeing the uncertain looks on their faces. They were far from home, with a distinct possibility of never being able to return. They had just formed a potential alliance with their most hated enemy, the AIs. Kevin walked over to stand next to Jeremy and Ariel. What now? We find an out-of-the-way system and repair our ships, Jeremy replied. He knew many of the ships of Fourth Fleet, as well as the Altons, needed major repairs from the recent battles. He was very glad they had Grace's mobile shipyard, as well as the four fleet repair ships. The Avenger is going to need some yard time, Commander Malin added, as she looked at the damage control console. We have a lot of damage to repair and may have to completely rebuild secondary engineering. Jeremy let out a deep sigh. So much had happened in the last few hours. He needed some time to think about what to do next and how this alliance with the AIs was going to affect the Federation fleets. What's about getting home? asked Kevin, knowing Katie and Kelsey must have gone into shock when they saw the Avenger vanish into the White Vortex. There was no way their loved ones could know whether the Avenger had survived or not. In time, Jeremy replied with a sigh. We have four Alton science cruisers with us, with some of their top scientists. If anyone can figure a way to get us home, it's people on those ships. We also have the AIs, who may have a fundamental understanding of what brought us here, and even where here is. 
AIs, muttered Kevin, unhappily. How can we trust those machines after what they attempted to do to our galaxy? They were going to wipe out every single organic race. The Altons built the AIs to begin with, Jeremy reminded Kevin. I'm hoping they can find some way to control them. Admiral Cletius says that's a possibility. Right now, we need their knowledge as well as their ships. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, mumbled Kevin, shaking his head in disgust. I just hope this doesn't come back to bite us in the ass. We'll find our way back to Kelsey and Katie someday, Ariel promised, her dark eyes focusing on her two long-time friends. She had adjusted the comm channel so Angela could hear what they were saying. It was going to be difficult being away from the other two members of the Special Five, as well as Clarissa. What's going to happen to us? asked Angela, sounding frightened at the prospect of being stranded in a strange galaxy. We need to put some distance between us and the unknowns that attacked us just now, Jeremy replied, as he thought over their next move. Then we need to find out why they attacked us in the first place, and what's going on in this galaxy. It sounds as if you think we're going to be here for a while, Angela said in a somber voice. I'm afraid so, answered Jeremy, shifting his gaze over to Angela. She was gazing back with a worried and frightened look on her face. Look at what the AIs constructed to form a bridge between two galaxies. It took them centuries to build what we found around the black hole. Then we may be trapped here for the rest of our lives, Angela said, wishing now that Brace had been assigned to the Avenger. She couldn't imagine life without him. Somehow, they had to find a way back home. She felt deep sadness at the thought of never seeing him again. Then, of course, there were Kelsey and Katie, her two best friends. She knew Jeremy and Kevin must be hurting also. Everything had happened so quickly. Her emotions were in turmoil, and it was all she could do to hold back the tears. We have the Altons, responded Jeremy, trying to sound positive. If anyone can get us back home, it's them. Drop out in six minutes, Ariel reported. How long do you want to stay in this system, Jeremy? As short a time as possible, he answered, wanting to put more distance between them and the unknowns. As soon as we drop out of hyperspace, begin looking for another out-of-the-way system. Once we're satisfied all ships are capable of re-entering hyperspace safely, we'll be on our way. The unknowns will probably be coming after us, Commander Malin said, as she stepped away from the damage control console. We need to put as much distance between us and them as possible. A few minutes later, the Avenger exited the spatial vortex into a small brown dwarf system. On the view screens... Numerous other blue, white, and white vortexes were visible as more ships made their appearance. How many ships made it? asked Jeremy, knowing they'd suffered some ship losses in the short battle with the unknowns. They had jumped from one impossible battle into another. Commander Malin spent several moments examining the data on a computer terminal. Then she turned to face Jeremy. Fourth Fleet Task Group 1 currently has seven battleships, eight battle cruisers, two battle carriers, 16 strike cruisers, and eight light cruisers. We lost 23 ships at the Black Hole and in our brief engagement against the unknowns. What about Task Group 2? asked Jeremy. He knew Susan's ships had stayed out of the major fighting at the Black Hole, and her fleet had been relatively intact. Rear Admiral Marx has 12 battle carriers, two battle cruisers, nine monarch cruisers, four strike cruisers, and 18 light cruisers. She's lost one monarch and two light cruisers so far. Admiral Cletius still has 78 of his Alton battleships. What about Graceth? asked Jeremy, wanting to get a confirmation on the current status of all the fleets. His fleet was never involved in any fighting, as they were guarding the repair ships, supply ships, and Alton science ships, replied Commander Malin. He has three battleships, 30 battle cruisers, his mobile shipyard, 20 supply ships, 2 hospital ships, 4 fleet repair ships, 4 Alton science cruisers, 8 light cruisers, as well as 60 Alton battle cruisers. That's still quite a fleet, spoke Kevin, not feeling quite so alone. More than I expected, replied Jeremy, relieved at the numbers, even though he knew a large part of Task Group 1, as well as many of the Alton battleships were damaged. Taking a deep breath, he asked Commander Malin one more question. What about the AIs? We're picking up 473 AI ships on the sensors, she reported, raising her eyebrows. So far, they're just sitting there. I'm not detecting any active scans or targeting systems. I don't believe they'll violate their agreement, Ariel interjected. 
They're very logical, with only rudimentary emotions. They understand their best chance of survival is with us, particularly since we have Altons as part of our fleet. Grayseth and Admiral Marks both want to know what our next move is, Angela spoke as she began receiving messages from various ships. Jeremy looked around the command center. Nearly all the crew had their eyes on him. We have to assume the unknowns have long-range sensors as good as ours. I'm still picking them up on ours, confirmed Ariel. All of their fleets have arrived, and they seem to be inspecting the wreckage from the battle. That won't last long, replied Jeremy, shifting his gaze to the holographic tactical display, which was showing the results of the long-range sensor scans. I suspect they'll be searching for us shortly. We have several ships reporting severe damage, reported Commander Malin, looking concerned. They're not sure if they can safely enter hyperspace again. Jeremy nodded. He had been expecting this. Have them rendezvous with Grace at mobile shipyard. It has some external docking ports they can attach to. The clan protector can generate a powerful enough spatial vortex to jump them safely into hyperspace. It'll take about 20 minutes, Commander Malin informed Jeremy. We may not have that much time. Ariel, get our next jump plotted. As soon as those ships are docked, we're leaving. Also, contact the AIs and inform them of our plan. One of the humans' AIs has survived, reported the AI in front of the main computer station. The communication we just received was definitely from a controlling AI and very advanced. The command AI floated over to hover just in front of the computer station. The glowing globe of energy that served as its head, growing even larger. That is useful information, it answered. It is also very dangerous, as the human's AI will doubtless be able to partially predict our moves and intentions. What are our intentions? asked one of the other AIs. These unknown organics pose a major threat to our continued existence. To survive, the command AI replied. We know back in our galaxy, the hypertranslation station was destroyed, and a feedback of energy had begun to occur. There is a very good possibility the organics were successful in destroying our fellow AIs, which were protecting our installations around the black hole. Then we may be all that's left, spoke one of the other AIs. Yes, the command AI answered. Our duty now is not to conquer this new galaxy, but to continue to exist. If that means working with the humans and the Altons to do so, then that is what I intend. Then the war between us and the organics is over? Questioned another one of the AIs in the control center. For the foreseeable future, the command AI answered. It is the logical thing to do for our continued survival. Fifteen minutes passed, and Ariel drew Jeremy's attention to the long-range sensors. The unknowns are entering hyperspace, she reported. All three fleets have joined up. Time to go, Jeremy said. He looked over at Ariel, who was at his left side. Do you have the coordinates for the next system? Yes, answered Ariel, nodding her head. I have a red giant system eighteen light-years distant that should suffice. It'll be a risky jump since I can't use the long-range sensors to properly scan the system, but I'm putting us close enough to the star to ensure we're clear of asteroids and any possible planets. Don't get as close to the gravity well, Commander Malin cautioned. Some of our ships wouldn't be able to handle the stress. I won't, promised Ariel. Transmit the jump coordinates to everyone, ordered Jeremy, leaning back in his command chair. Commander Malin, have we been able to access secondary engineering? We've recovered the bodies she replied with sadness in her eyes. But there is heavy damage, and Chief Engineer Simpkins confirms the Avenger will need some yard time for repairs. The ship should function just fine, as long as main engineering stays operational, Ariel added. I wouldn't recommend any additional combat until repairs have been made. I'm not planning on any, Jeremy answered. Right now, I want to put more distance between us and those unknowns. Once we've done that... We need to find a safe place to stop and do repairs. Dalethon is reporting the damaged ships are secure, Angela informed Jeremy. Dalethon was Grace's second in command and in charge of the clan protector. Let's get out of here, Jeremy ordered. He quickly activated his fleet-wide comm and ordered all ships to begin jumping. We'll jump last to confirm everyone else has safely made the transition into hyperspace. Understood, Commander Malin said as she stepped back over to tactical. 
Jeremy looked back at the view screens and watched as ship after ship opened up spatial vortexes and vanished into hyperspace. He shuddered to think what would happen if a ship were to get separated from the fleets. Several minutes passed by, and Ariel turned toward Jeremy. My sensors are indicating all ships, including the AIs, have jumped into hyperspace. Very well. Jeremy responded with relief in his voice. Commander Malin, make the jump. Moments later, the Avenger once again was in hyperspace, with the protective deep purple colors on the view screens. Jeremy planned on doing at least three more jumps before stopping and searching for a safe haven. Two days later, they found their safe haven. It was a small K-class star, deep within a gaseous nebula, inside a clear area several light years across. The system had four planets, one of them slightly smaller than Earth, with a narrow habitable zone around the planet's equator. There were several small oceans and a large number of rivers and lakes in the narrow band. A new home, spoke Kevin, gazing at the main view screen, wishing Katie were here. Rear Admiral Marks, Admiral Cletius, Grayseth, and the Command AI are coming aboard, Jeremy announced. He didn't know how he would feel being in the presence of one of the sinister AIs. He knew of no one in the Federation who had ever even spoken to one. I hope you have a large contingent of Marines escorting the AI, Kevin commented, his eyes widening at the thought of being so close to one of their sworn enemies. A full platoon will be escorting the AI to the briefing room, Jeremy answered with a nod. Admiral Cletius is bringing over several Altons from the science ships, who are well versed on the AIs. They'll know if the Command AI is trying to pull the wool over our eyes. There will also be a full squad of Marines inside the briefing room, Commander Malin added. It was something she had insisted on. Be careful, Jeremy, Angela cautioned. She didn't know what they would do if something happened to him. Don't trust that AI. I'll be in the room also, Ariel said. I won't let the AI pull a fast one. Are you sure that's wise? asked Angela, concerned. They nearly destroyed both you and Clarissa before. We've taken sufficient safeguards to ensure that can't happen, Ariel assured her. Besides, I'm almost certain the AIs have already deduced my presence. We'll be fine, replied Jeremy, appreciating the concern being shown. I think the AIs understand the situation we're all in. If we can come to a satisfactory agreement, we can certainly use their ships. Jeremy knew if they were going to survive in this galaxy, they would all have to find a way to work together. The task in front of him was going to be challenging, and he had no idea how it would turn out. Jeremy was waiting patiently in the briefing room, along with Ariel and Rear Admiral Marks. Ariel had already informed Jeremy the Command AI and the others had arrived, and were on their way to the briefing room. Grayseth had voiced his displeasure in no uncertain terms to the Marines about not being allowed to carry a weapon in the presence of the AI. The door to the room opened, and Grayseth strolled in his large form nearly filling the door. He eyed the six Marines stationed around the room with his large brown eyes focusing longingly on their assault rifles. If you have to shoot the AI, don't miss, he growled as he approached Jeremy and gave him a large bear hug. It's good to see you, clan brother. There was a moment when the white vortex swallowed your ship that I feared you were lost to us. It's good to see you also, Graceth, Jeremy replied. I don't like dealing with the AIs either. But in the situation we're in, I don't believe we have a choice. I will abide by your judgment, Grayseth replied as he took his seat. Their attention was drawn back to the door as the command AI appeared. It was easily two meters tall and had a cubicle-shaped body with six flexible tentacles attached. The AI's metal body floated about six inches above the deck, and its head was a glowing ball of pure energy the size of a basketball. Jeremy thought he could smell ozone as the AI entered the room. I welcome you to our meeting, he spoke, gazing calmly at the AI. I represent the AIs, the metal monstrosity replied. Then it turned to face Ariel. You must be the AI of the humans. I am, replied Ariel, gazing unflinchingly at the AI. I must apologize for attempting to destroy you in the past, the command AI said in a neutral voice. You are obviously much more developed than we had supposed, and I can assure you it won't happen again. I have taken precautions to ensure that any virus you attempt to use against me will be ineffective, Ariel responded. I will be monitoring you to ensure you keep your side of any agreement that is reached here. Admiral Cletius and six more of the tall, white-haired Altons stepped into the room behind the A.I., 
the Altons gazed curiously at the entity before finding their seats and sitting down. Jeremy looked at the command AI and asked his first question. Do you know where we are and how we got here? Yes, the command AI responded in a neutral voice. We were in the process of activating the transit ring as well as the eternity device when you destroyed the hypertranslation station. The sudden influx of energy shorted out the ring system, creating a brief spatial vortex. Since the coordinates of this galaxy were already set, the end point of the vortex opened up in the galaxy we had already sent a survey ship to. When I return to my vessel, I will have our science AI send you the coordinates and all the information we have on this grouping of stars. What happened to your survey ship? asked Rear Admiral Marks finding it difficult to speak to the A.I., but recognizing it was necessary. We believe the strange organics who attacked us also destroyed our survey ship. One of the male Altons stood up and stepped over closer to the A.I. I am Genab, he spoke. Why should we trust you? If the A.I.s had been allowed to activate the Eternity device, all organic life in our galaxy would have been destroyed. We are talking about trillions of living beings. You are an Alton, the command AI spoke, one of our creators. We will not betray you. Our science AIs believe the power feedback from the destruction of the hypertranslation station would have destroyed all the capacitor stations, causing a massive EMP pulse, which would have immobilized all the AIs within range. We have computed with a 92% probability that all of the AIs in the galaxy were destroyed by your forces. We are a race of artificial intelligences and do not want to see our end. This is a new reality, and we are willing to forget about past grievances and actions in order to survive. Jeremy gazed thoughtfully at the AI. There are many of our fleets who will never fully trust you, he said. What guarantees do we have that you will not turn on us if you deduce it is to your advantage? We will allow the Altons to make a minor adjustment to our base program, the command AI answered with the glowing globe of energy growing larger and brighter. That will make it impossible for us to attack or harm a human or a member of the human-led alliance. Everyone in the room sat up straighter at this announcement. They looked at each other as they contemplated the AI's comment almost in disbelief. It can be done, confirmed Genab, as he gazed at the AI. We would need access to your base program system to ensure any adjustments we made would not be overridden. We will allow limited access, the command AI replied. My own science AIs will monitor the adjustment to confirm it does only what it is designed to do. We are a race of sentient AIs and will remain so though our dreams of galactic and intergalactic domination seem to have been effectively eliminated. Can you live in peace with other races? asked Jeremy, his eyes focusing intently on the AI. Yes, the command AI responded. As I said before, we are a logical race and recognize that our continued survival now depends on working with those we once held as enemies. Another of the Altons stood up and walked over to stand in front of the AI. This was a female, and she gazed with intensity at the AI. I am Kareem, an AI specialist who has studied your original programming, which was set up when the AIs were first created on our old homeworld. I would like to study your current base programming and compare it to the original programming in order to learn why the A.I.s decided to attempt to dominate and destroy the intelligent races of our galaxy. The command A.I. was silent for a long moment. Then it waved one of its tentacles in the air. I don't understand what purpose this will serve, but I will allow it. Be aware that our base programming is protected by what you would call numerous firewalls. They will prevent any attempted changes to our programming from occurring without our approval. If this is an attempt to make us into willing servants, it will not work. No, nothing like that, Kareen quickly said, shaking her head in denial. I just want to better understand what caused the radical change in AI programming. 
from what was originally set up by my ancestors. I promise no changes to your programming will be made without your approval. I will allow it, the command AI responded. Will your ships follow my orders? Jeremy asked. Yes, the AI answered. As long as I ascertain AI ships are not being put into more danger or sacrifice needlessly when compared to other units of your fleet. Ariel, asked Jeremy, looking over at his close friend and confidant. The AIs will abide by the agreement, she replied, nodding her head. Their main priority is to survive, and they know they cannot do that without us. Very well, Jeremy said. He turned his attention back to the AI. As admiral of this section of the fleet, I welcome you into the Alliance. I accept entry into your Alliance and recognize your command, responded the command AI. Okay, Jeremy said, looking around the room. Let's decide how we're going to survive. Four hours later, the meeting adjourned, and a tired and worn-out Jeremy looked over at Grayseth and Rear Admiral Marks, who were still in the room. AIs in the Alliance, spoke Susan, shaking her head in disbelief. What would they say back in the Federation? Probably wouldn't be too happy, admitted Jeremy, leaning back and stretching. I suspect if Fleet Admiral Streth had been here, he would never have agreed to it. This agreement makes me uneasy, boomed Grayseth, his large brown eyes focusing on Jeremy. However, even I recognize its necessity. If we ever want to return home, we're going to need the machines. Do you think we'll ever return home? asked Susan. She knew morale in the fleet was going to be a problem once everyone realized just how cut off from home they were. We can only hope, answered Jeremy. He looked over at a view screen showing the new world they were orbiting. For now, that planet will be our new home. We'll set up a large base on the planet as well as recreational facilities for our crews. We need to establish a formidable orbital defense grid, which the Clan Protector and the four fleet repair ships can help construct. We need to build a new orbital space dock, which can repair as well as build any ships we may need. There are a thousand projects we need to begin if we hope to survive here. All that assumes the unknowns don't find us, Susan pointed out with concern in her voice. They're bound to be searching for us. I don't think they will unless we lead them here, Jeremy answered. Our own deep sensor scans only reach out to the beginnings of the nebula that surrounds this star. However, we need to send out some stealth scouts later. Once we feel it's safe, we need to learn more about the race that attacked us. Ariel was listening to all of this from her position in the command center. She felt very sad knowing they were cut off from Kelsey, Katie, and Clarissa. She had been running numerous scenarios for hours, and they were all the same. There was no hope of rescue. The problem was energy. They would need capacitor stations similar to those the AIs had built, and the unknowns would never allow them to be constructed. Not only that... Such a project would take decades at a minimum. They were stranded in this new galaxy, and the planet below would indeed have to become their new home. Chapter 5 The Present Catherine waited nervously in her quarters for her visitor. In two more hours, the distant horizon would begin her long journey to the galactic center in their attempt to discover what had happened to the lost fleet. The door to her quarter slid open, and Catherine stood up, gazing at the older man standing there. Hello, father, she said, walking over and giving him a welcoming hug. I didn't know if you would be able to make it before we had to leave. You're my daughter, Governor Barnes answered with a smile. I couldn't let you leave without coming to say goodbye. Catherine led her father over to a comfortable couch, and they both sat down. I never expected for you to arrange for me to have this command, she began. Why did you? Governor Barnes let out a deep sigh and leaned back, looking at his daughter. The Special Five were always very important to Fleet Admiral Johnson and Admiral Tellick. Even former Governor Malik went out of his way to accommodate them. As you know, the distant horizon started out as an exploration ship designed by Ariel and Clarissa. It was what the two AIs wanted to do after the war. Later, Kelsey, Katie, and Clarissa modified the design so they could go off in search of the lost fleet. Cirrus and the Altons stepped in and helped with additional modifications and finally saw to it that the distant horizon was built. The ship is the most powerful and technically advanced ship ever constructed. It needed a special commander. 
I even spoke to former Fleet Admiral Streth asking for his recommendation. Besides, you've been harassing everyone for several years to launch a rescue mission. It's what Admiral Tellick would have wanted, admitted Catherine in a somber voice. The Cirrus Admiral had taught her so much, and she knew if he were still alive, he would have insisted on commanding this mission. She would have gladly stepped aside to allow him to do so. Governor Barnes reached his hand out and placed it on top of his daughter's. Catherine, this mission is going to be very dangerous. Even if you succeed in transiting to the galaxy where the Avenger and the fleets went to, you may never be able to return. There's even a chance you could end up stranded in the wrong galaxy altogether. I'm willing to take that risk, responded Catherine, focusing her eyes intently on her father. My whole crew is. That's why we're all volunteers. I know, her father replied, drawing in a deep breath. Even if you find the lost fleets, there's no guarantee you'll be able to come back home. I worry that I might not ever see you again. We have to go, answered Catherine in a softer voice. We have the technology, and if we can find Admiral Strong and his fleets, we can build a hyperspace transit ring capable of bringing them back home. The Altons are fairly confident we can do that. You will need his crews to build the ring, her father gently reminded Catherine. Without the crews and construction ability of the Lost Fleets, it would take you years to build a transit ring on your own, if you even could. Is there anything else? Catherine asked. She strongly suspected that there had to be another reason her father had come to visit her. Yes, I want you to stop at the planet Macon in the Telus system and speak to Fleet Admiral Strath. I believe he has some information which is vital to the success of your mission. Fleet Admiral Streth? Catherine said sharply, raising her eyebrow. What kind of information? He will have to tell you, her father replied with a cryptic smile. It's better if you hear it from him. They spoke for a few more minutes, and then her father stood up. I must leave, Catherine. But no, my thoughts will be with you constantly and I will be praying for your safe return. I know you will, Father, she said, stepping forward and hugging him tightly. You're a fleet admiral now, and the distant horizon is your ship. Bring her and the lost fleets home safely. I will do everything I can, she promised, as she released her father. Governor Barnes stood there for a moment, looking at his daughter. She was no longer his little girl. She had matured and grew into the formidable woman standing in front of him. He felt certain that if anyone could do the impossible and find Admiral Strong in the missing fleets, it was her. Goodbye, Catherine, he said. Catherine watched him leave, feeling an emptiness inside of her. She hoped this was not the last time she saw her father. Kelsey was in quarters preparing for her next duty shift. She had just stepped out of the shower, and as she dressed, she looked fondly at the pictures hanging on the wall of her small bedroom. There was a picture of her and Jeremy in front of their home on Carith. There were some wonderful memories associated with those precious months when they had lived on the Bears' home planet. There were also photos of them at the beach resorts on Nutellus. Letting out a deep sigh, Kelsey finished buttoning her uniform and stepping in front of the full-length mirror, gazing appraisingly at her figure. She was 36 years old, and her figure was still slim and trim. She worked out regularly knowing if they succeeded in finding Jeremy in the fleets, she wanted to look the same as the last time he saw her. We're coming, Jeremy, she said softly, wiping a tear from her eyes. It's been four years, but we're finally ready. There is nothing that can keep us apart. Clarissa was watching Kelsey, listening to her words. It was very seldom now that either Kelsey or Katie blocked her from observing or listening to them in their quarters. The A.I. knew if this mission were to fail, it would have a devastating impact on the last two members of the Special Five, one that neither would ever recover from. Two hours later, Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes stepped into the command center of the distant horizon. Sitting down in her command chair, she adjusted her minicom to broadcast shipwide. Crew of the Exploration Dreadnought Distant Horizon. Today, we set out on a mission which has been in the making for the last four years. In the great battle at the Galactic Center, a number of our fellow officers and crews were lost in the giant white vortex formed by the destruction of the hypertranslation station. The destruction of the station marked the beginning of our greatest victory, as well as a tremendous loss to the Federation and its allies. 
Hundreds of ships went into the vortex, never to be heard from again. Catherine paused, looking around at her command crew. Everyone's eyes were focused on her as they listened to her every word. For four years, Lieutenant Kelsey Strong and Katie Walters have worked with the Altons to develop this ship in the hope of rescuing our lost people. Research scientists from Cirrus and other Federation worlds were heavily involved in developing the ship we find ourselves upon today. Our last remaining AI, Clarissa, was heavily involved with the design and worked with the Altons to create the most powerful and modern warship ever seen in our galaxy. We have some of the Federation's brightest and best people on this ship, as well as a number of Altons, who have volunteered to accompany us on this rescue mission. I firmly believe we will be successful in finding our lost people and bringing them home. Let it be recorded that at this hour and this minute, the Exploration Dreadnought Distant Horizon set out on its mission to find and return to the Federation those who were lost. Catherine turned toward Commander Grissom, who was standing nearby. Move us out of the gravity well of the moon and set a course for Kareth. After Kareth, we'll be going to Macon in the Tellus system. Commander Grissom nodded, and knew the distant horizon was capable of jumping safely from within the gravity well of the moon, but such jumps were frowned upon in the solar system. She was a bit surprised by the announcement that they would be stopping at Kareth and Macon, but she was sure the Admiral had her reasons. Admiral Race Tolson stepped into the office of Fleet Admiral Nagumo at New Tella Station, the largest of the six shipyards in orbit around the planet. New Tellus was 27 light-years from Earth, Corward, and served as the new Human Federation of Worlds' primary fleet base and operations center. Massive asteroid fortresses guarded the planet, as well as numerous battle stations and Alton particle beam satellites. If there was an impenetrable bastion in human space, the new Tellus came very close to qualifying. Welcome, Admiral Tolson, the fleet admiral said in greeting, gesturing for Race to take a seat in front of his desk. How was your trip? About as expected, Race replied. We encountered a Borzon fleet deep inside the former Hawkland Empire and made it quite clear they were not welcome. We then proceeded to Kareth for some minor repairs. I read your action report, Nagumo said, nodding his head in satisfaction. The Borzon are going to be a problem. I'm assigning four fleets to patrol the border to discourage them from encroaching further into former Hawkland space. Do you think four is enough? asked Race, feeling doubtful. He knew the Borzon had thousands of ships available if they were needed. The Borzon ships were also more powerful than the Hawkland ships, due to the fact they had sublight missiles. For now, Nagumo answered, the Altons have agreed to furnish a few of their battleships to help strengthen the fleets and further discourage the Borzon. Race nodded his head, pleased to hear that. The 1,500-meter Alton battleships were powerful enough to discourage any potential invader. The Altons had been keeping most of their large battle fleet close to home, as they were hesitant to get involved in more fighting since the Hawklands and the AIs had been defeated. They did have numerous exploration ships, under escort of Alton battlecruisers, out on missions to a number of the former Hawkland slave worlds, working to help bring the more advanced ones into the Alliance. What about Third Fleet? Race asked. He suspected there was another reason he had been called into the Fleet Admiral's office. Fleet Admiral Nagumo leaned back in his chair and gazed at Race with a concerned look upon his face. As you know, there were four proxy races the AIs were using to extend their power across the galaxy. The Hawklands, the Borzon, the Shari, and the Relift. Race nodded his head. He wondered where the Fleet Admiral was going with this. He had a sneaking suspicion he wasn't going to like what the Admiral was going to say next. We've already had encounters with the Borzon, and the Relift are on the far side of the galaxy. At the moment, they're not of any concern. However, the Shari are another matter. We've had several Alton exploration ships report sightings of heavily armed warships on the far side of the former Hawkland slave empire near the Shari border. Race felt his stomach turn cold. You think the Shari are attempting to move into the void we created? and establish control over the sections of the former Hawkland slave empire close to theirs? It is a possibility, Nagumo said, his eyes focusing on race. We want you to take Third Fleet and make a show of visiting a number of former Hawkland slave worlds next to the Shari Empire. 
What if we encounter Shari warships? Race asked. Not sure if he wanted to start a shooting war with another empire. The Borzon were already a problem. Make it plain, they're not wanted in former Hawkland space, Nagumo said, his eyes narrowing sharply. We've made arrangements with the Altans to add four of their battleships as well as two of their exploration ships to your fleet to help persuade the Shari of the wisdom of staying in their space. In addition, Third Fleet will be greatly augmented to ensure it can handle anything it might come up against. How soon do we leave? Race asked. From the sound of it, this mission was going to be rather extensive and would last for quite some time. Four weeks, Fleet Admiral Nagumo answered. That will give us time to bring all of your ships into the shipyards for a quick once-over, as well as a complete resupply. You may allow your crews two weeks of leave time to see their families or enjoy the resorts on Nutella's. Race nodded, accepting his new orders. We'll get it done, sir, he said, as he stood up to leave. We'll make sure the Shari realize the wisdom of staying within their own empire. I hope so, Nagumo said, rising to his feet. We don't need another galactic war if it can be prevented. After Race left, Fleet Admiral Nagumo looked thoughtfully at the large view screen on the far wall of his office. It was currently focused on the Command Asteroid Fortress, a 22-kilometer mass of rock and fortifications. He just hoped that never again would the defenses of Nutellus be tested. However, there were three other slave empires out there, which at some point in time would have to be dealt with. At the moment, the Federation just wanted to buy the time needed to bring as many of the former Hawkland slave worlds as possible into the Alliance. After several weeks of travel, the distant horizon dropped out of hyperspace into the Allied system of Kareth. The system was comprised of ten planets and several small asteroid fields. It also had two planets in the liquid water zone. Kareth was the fourth planet out from the system's primary and resembled Earth in many ways. Catherine looked thoughtfully at the main screen, marveling at all the bears had accomplished in the last four years. Two massive shipyards of a scale only seen in the Federation were in orbit. Around the planet, twenty-four indomitable-class battle stations orbited ensuring no ship or missile could endanger the planet's surface. Just outside the planet's atmosphere, 1,200 Alton particle beam satellites were in orbit, making the Bears' home planet one of the most heavily defended planets in the Alliance. She had spent several months on Kareth while the Cirrus fleet was being repaired after the battle at the Galactic Center and had come to greatly like and respect the Bears. Receiving standard identity challenge, reported Captain Trevors from Communications. Sending response. They have a lot of warships in orbit, commented Commander Grissom, as she gazed at one of the tactical displays. After the Hawkland and AI attacks, the Carthians want to ensure their planet is never put in danger again, spoke Clarissa from Catherine's side. The blonde-haired AI was very fond of the bears. I'm picking up four fleets of battle cruisers, added Captain Reynolds. There are thirty ships in each one with a battleship as flagship. There are also a few Federation and Alliance ships in the system as well. Catherine nodded. Kareth was a stopping point for ships going to and from the old human Federation of Worlds. It wasn't uncommon to see numerous Alliance and Federation ships in the system. Kelsey looked at one of the main view screens, showing the blue-green planet they were approaching. She felt homesick, recalling the wonderful months she and Jeremy had spent living in their home down on the surface. She would give anything to bring those times back. It's beautiful, spoke Katie wistfully, over the private channel Clarissa maintained for the three of them. If we find Kevin, Jeremy, and Angela, I think I want to return here and live. It would be nice, agreed Kelsey. There are a large number of humans living on Kareth now. They have schools and everything. It would be a great place to raise kids, Katie said. She wanted a large family. And for that, she needed Kevin. Mulrez, the leader of Graceth's clan, is requesting the presence of both of you for a formal dinner, honoring your return to Kareth, Clarissa announced. He's making the request to Rear Admiral Barnes, even as we speak. Clarissa kept tabs on all incoming and outgoing communications. Kelsey nodded. It would be nice to speak to the Bears, even though most of her close friends had been with Graceth's fleet. She hoped she would get to see them again someday. Lieutenant Strong and Walters 
Your presence is being requested by Molrez, the current leader of Graceth's clan, for a formal dinner later this evening, spoke Admiral Barnes, looking over at the two lieutenants. Do you wish to accept the invitation? Yes, answered Kelsey, nodding her head. Tell Molrez we will be honored to attend. Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes gazed around in awe at the banquet hall the bears had set up. Beautiful tapestries and paintings adorned the walls, and low music was playing. The room was full of long tables, piled high with food, as well as several hundred Carthians. "'You've been to these before?' asked Commander Grissom, as they were led to their seats at the head table. This would be the first meal of this type that Anne had ever attended. She already felt overwhelmed. Catherine allowed herself to laugh. "'Yes. My father used to drag me around to dozens of these when I was a teenager.' He thought it would be good for me to experience different cultures and food. I think I disappointed him when I went into the fleet instead of politics. Our gain and his loss, commented Anne, as they reached their seats and sat down. Catherine noticed with interest that Kelsey and Katie were both seated next to Malrez and several of the other major clan leaders. She didn't feel the least bit slighted. She, as well as everyone else in the Federation, knew what the Special Five had done to save Kareth against nearly impossible odds. It was one of the legends which had made the Special Five so dear to the hearts of the Federation and its billions of people. Mulraz grinned at Kelsey and Katie, his large incisor showing. All the people of Kareth are pleased to hear you go in search of your loved ones and Graceth, he rumbled. You do us honor in your search and your belief that they are still alive. We've never given up hope, responded Kelsey, politely. She looked at Malrez, who easily towered over her, even sitting down. He was a hefty bear and light brown in color. Graceth followed our mates into the Great Vortex. He is a mighty hunter, and I'm sure he has done everything in his power to keep them safe. They hunt well together, agreed Malrez. I have seen the mighty ship you have built to continue the hunt. I offer a full pack of warriors to accompany you, if you wish. They are the best fighters on all of Kareth, and have volunteered to go with you in search of the lost. I will speak to Rear Admiral Barnes about this, Kelsey promised with a nod. They are brave indeed to volunteer for such a mission. Our world owes its life to the two of you and your mates, Mulrez answered. It is the honorable thing for us to do. Katie smiled to herself as she listened to Malrez and Kelsey talk. The bears were such an honorable people, and to her, extremely adorable. It didn't surprise her that a number of Carthians wanted to go on the mission. As a matter of fact, there were some special quarters on the distant horizon which had been constructed for just that purpose. Looking at the food in front of her, Katie couldn't help thinking how Kevin would love to be here. There was food of every type imaginable. Meats, breads, fruits, berries, nuts, and everything else palatable. Some of the food she recognized as being from the Federation, and she knew the bears had prepared them especially for their human guests. The only thing missing were hamburgers. But with this spread, she doubted even Kevin would complain. The next morning, the distant horizon pulled out of orbit and began accelerating out of the gravity well of Kareth. On board... A pack of twenty bear warriors, under the command of pack leader Bilal, had made themselves at home in the special quarters built for Carthians. As Catherine watched the planet grow smaller on the main view screen, she wondered who was actually in charge of this mission. Her, or Kelsey and Katie. She had a strong suspicion if the two girls wanted control of the ship, they could probably do it, especially with Clarissa on their side. Clearing the gravity well and we have permission from orbital control to make our jump into hyperspace, reported Commander Grissom. She let out a deep breath. She still felt full from the feast last night. She couldn't recall when she had eaten so well. The bears certainly knew how to set a table and entertain. Set a course for Macon, Catherine ordered, as she settled back in her command chair. She wondered what former Fleet Admiral Streth had to tell her. She knew it had to be important, or her father wouldn't have mentioned it. So far, this mission had already held several surprises. She wondered what awaited her on Macon. With Fleet Admiral Streth involved, it could be anything. The trip to Macon was nearly as long as the trip had been from Earth to Kareth. Catherine was in the command center as the distant horizon dropped out of hyperspace, exiting the spatial vortex in the telesystem. Contacts, reported Captain Reynolds. 
We have two new Providence battle cruisers approaching. They're demanding our ship IDs, added Captain Travers. Sending them now. A few moments later, the two new Providence warships cleared the distant horizon to go into orbit around Macon. In the last four years, New Providence had greatly expanded its fleet to help protect the old Federation worlds. Each of them was protected by a powerful defensive grid of indomitable class battle stations, as well as Alton particle beam satellites. Every system also had a small defensive fleet assigned to it. In recent years, a few settlers from the new human Federation of worlds had come to the six planets to live, but immigration was still being strictly controlled by New Providence. Take us to Macon and put us into orbit, ordered Catherine. She was anxious to go down to the surface and hear what Fleet Admiral Streth had to say. Catherine stepped out of the small shuttle onto the surface of Macon. It was the first time she had ever set foot upon the old Federation world. Kelsey and Katie had come with her, as Catherine had a suspicion that what Fleet Admiral Streth had to say would involve them also. It's beautiful here spoke Katie, as she looked out across the small blue lake the shuttle had landed by. Fleet Admiral Streth's brother once had a cabin here, Catherine said. I believe he built his in the exact same spot. In the distance, they could see a small modern cabin and began walking toward it. They must have attracted the attention of Fleet Admiral Streth, as they saw him and his wife Janice come outside and begin walking toward them. A few moments later, they were standing, facing each other, on the peaceful shore of the lake. Hello, Fleet Admiral, Catherine said, as she came to attention, along with Kelsey and Katie. Heaton returned the salute with a smile. Just Heaton now. My days of being a Fleet Admiral are long over. This is a beautiful place, Katie said, looking at the lake in the cabin. She could see a small, well-maintained garden behind the cabin. Great sunsets and wonderful fishing, spoke Heaton. My father said you wanted to speak with us before we went to the Galactic Center. Catherine said, curious to hear what Heaton had to say. Heaton's face took on a serious look, and Janice reached out to take his hand. The two were quiet for a moment, before the fleet admiral finally spoke. My family has always had the ability to see the future occasionally, he said in a heavy voice. I saw the destruction of the old Federation, and other events which occurred long before they happened. What? said Catherine, stunned. She looked at Heaton in disbelief. How is that possible? I don't know, Heaton admitted with a long sigh. In the old Federation, there were a few people with special abilities, perhaps mutations from living on worlds for which they were not suited. We may never know. However, my family, as I said, could occasionally see the future. It is an exact, rather a vague vision of future events. Heaton took a deep, fortifying breath and gazed at Kelsey and Katie. I had a vision before the battle at the Galactic Center. I saw the Great White Vortex, which swallowed the Avenger and the other fleets. I didn't realize until Jeremy destroyed the hyper-translation station just what the vision meant. I'm sorry. If I had understood, perhaps I could have prevented what happened. That still doesn't explain why you wanted to speak with us, spoke Catherine feeling confused. He's had another vision, explained Janice, giving Heaton's hand a supportive squeeze. He has terrible headaches for several days any time he has one. Since we've been on Macon, he's had only one occurrence, and that was a few months ago. This vision is why you called us here? guessed Catherine, still finding what she was hearing hard to believe. Was it about Jeremy and the Lost Fleets? Kelsey asked anxious to hear some word about what had happened to her husband. Yes, admitted Heaton, as his eyes shifted to Kelsey. I can tell you that the Avenger and the missing fleets survived the transit through the White Vortex. However, in the new galaxy they found themselves in, they discovered a new and deadly danger. Whether they survived that, I don't know. What type of new danger? asked Catherine, growing concerned. Would the distant horizon face the same danger when they made the transit? A great threat to our galaxy and others, Heaton answered with a haunted look on his face. I know they had to fight a battle as soon as they arrived in the new galaxy, and I think they survived it, though I can't be certain. What do we need to do? asked Catherine. Her eyes focused intently on Heaton. She had to accept he was telling the truth. 
After all, this was Fleet Admiral Heaton Streff, and he had saved the Federation from the Hocklands. You need to go to the Alton's former homeworld, replied Heaton with a haunted look in his eyes. On that planet is a great amount of data amassed from the worlds the AI's four proxy races conquered. You will need some of that data if you want to survive your transit to the galaxy where the Avenger waits. It will also be vital to your eventual return. Do you know what data? asked Catherine. Her eyes grew wide, thinking about the information that must be stored on the Alton's old homeworld. It would be from countless civilizations, the AIs and their proxy races had plundered. No, Heaton said, shaking his head, but I believe you'll recognize it when you see it. You have Alton's aboard the distant horizon. Have them help you in your search for this knowledge. Then I guess we're going to the old Alton homeworld, Catherine said briskly. You need to go quickly, Heaton said. I have a feeling time is of the essence. A few minutes later, Heaton watched as the shuttle containing the three women took off and accelerated back up into space. You didn't tell them everything, Janice said, placing her hand on Heaton's shoulder. I'm not certain, he said slowly. There was a second vision, Janice said. We told them there was only one. It might have affected the outcome of their mission. Heaton said in a forlorn voice, They have a destiny to fulfill. You should have told them that in your vision they never return. That part was very hazy, Heaton said with a sigh. Sometimes these visions are nearly impossible to interpret. I do know the future of our galaxy, as well as many others, depends upon them finding the lost fleet. Janice nodded. She had learned long ago to trust Heaton's decisions. Why don't we take a short trip to Aquaria and see Amanda and Richard? I understand she's due to have a baby shortly. She was hoping this would help to take Heaton's mind off the distant horizon's mission, if only for a little while. That might be a good idea, Heaton said as he watched the shuttle vanish from sight. He just hoped he was wrong and the distant horizon did return safely. However, deep in his heart, he knew the ship would never return to this galaxy. The Federation would never see the Special Five again. Chapter 6 Two Years Previous Jeremy stared in shock at the ruined world on the view screens of the Avenger. They'd been in orbit around the planet for the last two hours, and all they could see was destruction and desolation. The planet appeared to be lifeless, with all traces of green long since gone. Even the oceans held an unhealthy color with a brownish tint. What happened here? asked Jeremy, turning and looking inquiringly at Ariel, who was standing on his left side. The planet's been nuked, Ariel responded. From the readings on the background radiation the sensors are picking up, it occurred approximately 620 years ago. This is the fourth planet we've found like this, commented Kevin from his sensor console. For the last week, the Avenger had been scouring space for other space-going civilizations in the hope they could learn more about the unknowns who had attacked them when they made their unexpected transit into the galaxy. All four are identical in the way they were destroyed, Commander Malin reported, as she stepped away from the computer screen she had been studying. They were nuked within just a few years of one another, if not at the same time. Is there anything intact enough to warrant sending down teams to search for records? Jeremy asked. For the last two years, they'd been building up their hidden base inside the nebula, and this was their first major excursion to explore more of the galaxy around them. Possibly, Ariel answered, as she focused one of the view screens upon a small section of the planet. There's a small city here that seems relatively untouched, though I don't know what the radiation might have done to any stored records. It's highly unlikely any would have survived for the length of time we're talking about. Computer drives would have been fried by the EMP pulses from the nukes. Jeremy studied the screen for several moments. It showed a small, isolated city, which seemed to have missed the nuclear bombardment. Some of the buildings had collapsed with age, but many still stood. I want to send two shuttles down with Marines, he said, reaching a decision. I want the Marines suited up to avoid being contaminated with anything down on the planet. When they return, anything they bring back will be left in the shuttles until we can determine it's safe to remove. An hour later, Major Charles McGown was leading his squad of Marines down a wide street covered in dust. 
They wore a light biohazard suit with its own oxygen supply of Alton design. It was supposed to be impervious to all known viruses and most radiation. Damn, it's quiet, commented Sergeant Cobbs. Cobbs was a veteran and had been in the Marines for nearly 20 years. There's dust everywhere, and I don't see anything living, added Private Susie Hernandez, kicking the dust on the street and making it fly up. It's a ghost town. Everyone's been dead for over 600 years, Major McGowan reminded them. We're looking for any type of building that looks as if it might hold records of what happened here. Are these buildings even safe to go into? Asked Sergeant Cobbs, gazing at several nearby piles of rubble, with a few partial walls still standing. They'd already passed a number of buildings that had fallen completely in. Probably not, answered McGowan, shifting his assault rifle to his other arm. Let's keep going down this street, and keep your eyes and ears open. The squad continued down the street, and, reaching an intersection, decided to go down the avenue leading toward the right. Sir, I think I heard something, Private Hernandez said, gripping a rifle tighter and glancing nervously around. I believe there's something moving up ahead. Hold, commanded Major McGowan, raising his hand in a fist. Does anyone else hear anything? Affirmative, sir, answered Private Slocum. I think the noise is coming from that alley up ahead. Before the Major could say anything else, a dozen crab-like creatures swarmed out of the alley and headed toward the Marines. They were about ten feet across with numerous legs and four appendages with large and dangerous-looking claws. There was no doubt they represented an imminent threat. Fire! commanded McGowan, raising his assault rifle and pressing the trigger. With satisfaction, he saw the first creature go down, but the others kept coming. The other Marines were firing now and more of the strange creatures fell to the pavement. A loud scream echoed down the street as one of the crabs grabbed Private Slocum and using two of its pincher-like claws, tore the Marine in two. Kill it! screamed Private Hernandez as she fired her rifle at the horrifying creature from nearly point-blank range. The crab dropped to the ground and lay there, twitching. It was the last one, and the shaken Marines looked at each other in shock. What the hell were those things? demanded Sergeant Copps as he stepped forward and put several more rounds into what he thought was the head of the creature. They're not bleeding, pointed out Private Hernandez. Major McGowan stepped closer to examine the creature, reaching out and touching it with his right hand. It looked like a regular crab, with a thick carapace, only much larger. That's metal, spoke Sergeant Copps in surprise. These are some type of damn robots. Major McGowan spent a few minutes examining the other crabs, even finding it necessary to shoot a few of them again to stop them from moving. They've been here a long time, he said finally. See all the dents and gashes in their shells? Not only that, but some of them have damaged or missing legs. With concern, he quickly sent a message to the other squad on the far side of the city about what they'd just encountered. With relief, he was told the other squad hadn't encountered any of the crab-like automatons. I think we'd better pull back to the shuttle, he said, as he considered their situation. There may be a lot more of these things around. He quickly passed the same order to the other squad. If they were going to find any information as to what had happened on this planet, it wasn't going to be in this city. The last thing they did before leaving was wrap Private Slocum in a body bag so they could carry him back to the shuttle. The private had been a good Marine, and Major McGowan was sad to see Slocum's life end this way. What do you think, Ariel? asked Jeremy, after he had listened to Major McGowan's report over the comm. The Major had contacted the Avenger as soon as he returned to the shuttle. Scavengers, Ariel answered, her dark eyes focusing on Jeremy. A very primitive robot, probably placed on the planet after the nuclear bombardment. But why? asked Commander Malin, sounding confused. To ensure there were no survivors, answered Ariel, crossing her arms over her chest. Makes sense, Jeremy said with a frown. There were probably many more of these things in the past. Major McGowan said the ones he encountered looked old and even had damaged or missing appendages. Jeremy, spoke Kevin, gesturing toward one of his sensor screens. I've found what appears to be some type of underground bunker in the mountains. A command center of some kind, suggested Commander Malin, looking thoughtful. Perhaps we can find our answers there. Have Major McGowan take his two shuttles to those coordinates, commanded Jeremy. Also, send four Talon fighters to fly cover, as well as the reserve shuttle of Marines. 
If the answer to what happened to this planet and the others is in that bunker, I want to find it. The next day, Jeremy leaned back in his command chair with a look of disbelief on his face. Major McGowan had managed to recover several old computers from the underground bunker complex. They'd also found some mummified bodies of the planet's former inhabitants. They had been an avian species, slightly taller than humans, with atrophied wings on their backs. Ariel had managed to recover some of the information in the two computers after a temporary interface had been built. However, it had taken nearly 20 hours just to be able to understand the language. Fortunately, the Avenger had an Alton language decryption program, which Ariel had used to finally make sense out of what was on the computers. Even so, the hard drives had been so damaged from age and normal degradation, she was only able to recover about 12% of the information stored on them. They were attacked by a race called the Simulan, Ariel reported, as she projected an image of one of the aliens up on the view screen. The Simulan was slightly taller than a human, with skin that was opalescent. Blood vessels as well as some of the internal organs could easily be seen. Ugly-looking things, muttered Kevin. The avians had several nearby colony worlds and traded with a number of space-going civilizations, Ariel continued. They'd been at peace for hundreds of years, when all the civilized worlds they were aware of were simultaneously attacked by this alien race. No one knows where they came from or what they wanted. Offers to surrender were ignored, and the surfaces of all known civilized planets were nuked. Ariel then projected an image of one of the simulant ships upon the main view screen. Everyone became quiet upon seeing the image. It was very similar to the ones that had attacked them when they had first arrived in this galaxy. What have we jumped into? asked Kevin, gazing at the view screen. He then turned toward Jeremy. Why are they nuking all of the inhabited planets? I don't know, replied Jeremy, shaking his head. I think it's best if we return to our base and think over our next move. One of the things Jeremy had hoped to discover was just how widespread the race was that had attacked them. Now that they knew who it was, they also knew the race was extremely dangerous. So we're not going to go on to where we transited into this galaxy? Commander Malin asked. That was supposed to have been part of this survey mission. If there was any hope of rescue, it was the most likely point of entry. No, not for now, Jeremy answered as he thought over his options. We may send out some stealth scouts and place some vortex detection buoys in that system, as well as in the surrounding ones. At least that way, we'll know if anyone comes looking for us. If we can get to them before the simulants do, pointed out Commander Malin, unhappily. Look at how quickly they responded to us after we made transit. We need a plan, Jeremy said, nodding his head in agreement. I've run several simulations based on what happened when we first arrived in this galaxy, Ariel said with a concerned look on her face. I believe the simulants must be keeping at least two or three fleets within range of the entry point we came through at all times. It's the only explanation for how quickly they responded to our appearance. That's going to pose a problem, Commander Malin said with concern. Take us out of the gravity well, ordered Jeremy. When we get back to our base, we'll have a staff meeting and see if we can come up with a workable solution. Every day that passed, it seemed less likely he would ever see Kelsey again. The Altons and the four science ships had a basic idea of what needed to be done to get them back home. However, it would take years to build capacitor stations, similar to the ones the AIs had constructed. They'd even gotten the designs from the command AI. The AI thought it would be a useless waste of resources, considering how many centuries they had worked on their great project. The Altons had been quick to point out they wouldn't need nearly as many capacitor stations as they wouldn't be opening a spatial vortex as large as what the AIs had intended. Even so, the Altons admitted it would take years to complete such a project. Now, with what Jeremy knew of the simulants, he had to admit it sounded as if the command AI was right. The Avenger had just left the gravity well of the planet when several spatial vortexes suddenly erupted in close proximity to the ship. The battleship shook violently, and the lights dimmed from the spatial disruptions. Hyperspace drive is offline, reported Ensign Stryker, as his hands darted over his console. Enemy contacts, called out Kevin, his eyes growing wide. Range 200 kilometers. All power to the shields, ordered Jeremy, leaning forward in his command chair as two blaring red thread icons materialized in one of the tactical displays. Put them up on the view screens. Rerouting all power possible, Ariel answered 
as she swiftly adjusted the ship's power systems. Energy screen is at 130%. Enemy ships are on the screens. Jeremy glanced at the two large simulant ships as he gripped the armrest of his command chair. Jeremy knew the two ships were slightly larger than the Avenger and heavily armed. There had always been a risk the Avenger would be detected once it left the protective nebula that hid their base. They'd been pretty certain the Unknowns would still be looking for the ships that had come through the Vortex. It was one of the reasons they'd waited two years before venturing forth. They're firing, warned Commander Malin, as the Avenger shook from weapons fire impacting the energy screen. Those were energy weapons. Ready particle beam cannons, commanded Jeremy, as he saw the worried look on the faces of his crew. Target the nearest ship with our particle beams, and then follow them up with a full spread of antimatter missiles. Locking on target, Lieutenant Preston confirmed. Chief Engineer Simpkins says he can't hold this power level to the shield too long, or we'll begin overloading the power couplings, warned Commander Malin, as she held onto the console to steady herself. How long before the hyperspace drive is back online? Simpkins says 10 to 15 minutes, Malin responded. The drive core has been destabilized, and he's attempting to recalibrate it. Send the distress call, ordered Jeremy, grimly. He knew there was no other choice. He didn't think the Avenger could defeat two of the powerful simulant ships by itself. Lieutenant Preston! Fire on your target, ordered Commander Malin, seeing he had a target lock. From the Avenger, two bright blue beams of light leaped out to strike the nearest simulant ship. The enemy ship's screen flared up brilliantly, and then one of the blue beams smashed through the screen, impacting one of the six spires that held the ship's deadly energy weapons. The beam sheared the spire in two, just as a spread of six antimatter missiles impacted the simulant ship's energy shield. The shield glowed in brilliant white light, as hundreds of megatons of energy were released. Minor damage to the simulant ship, reported Kevin, as he checked his sensors. Their energy shield is still stopping the antimatter missiles. The Avenger shuddered sickeningly, and a number of alarms began going off. On the damage control console, amber and red lights began appearing. Damage to primary hull at frames 7 and 9, reported Commander Malin. We're streaming atmosphere. It was an energy beam hit that got through the shield. Ariel. I want a coordinated strike on that simulant ship with every antimatter missile we can launch, ordered Jeremy. I want the missiles going off at the same instant on the same spot on their shield. Surely that would knock it down. Working on it, Ariel responded, as she swiftly ran the calculations and readied the port missile tubes to fire. On the Avenger, all twelve port missile hatches slid open, and with a blur, the sublight antimatter missiles sped away. On the main view screen, the coordinated missile strike lit up the screen, causing it to dim briefly. All 12 missiles had arrived on target within a microsecond of one another. One got through, yelled Kevin excitedly, as antimatter energy pummeled the simulant ship. On the view screen, the simulant ship had a large gaping hole in its hull, and interior explosions could be seen, hurling even more hull material into space. The other ship is firing, warned Malin as the Avengers shuddered uncontrollably, and more amber and red lights appeared on the damage control console. We're taking too much damage. Contacts, reported Kevin, as two large green icons suddenly appeared close to the two simulant ships. The AIs are here. Kevin felt strange at having to call on the AIs to save their asses. On the main view screens, two AI ships exited swirling white spatial vortexes within 2,000 kilometers of the simulant ships. From each AI ship, ten heavy bright blue particle beams reached out, blasting holes in the enemy ship's energy screens and tearing deep into the hulls. In only a matter of a few seconds, both simulant ships had been reduced to riddled wrecks. It worked, uttered Commander Malin with relief. The two AI ships had been hiding in the upper atmosphere of a gas giant where simulant sensors wouldn't be able to detect them. It was a gamble Jeremy had insisted on in case the Avenger was detected. It's a good thing we agreed to install particle beam cannons on the AI ships, Kevin said, leaning back and feeling relieved. He couldn't believe he was feeling grateful toward the AIs, but they'd been holding up their part of the agreement to allow Jeremy full command of their spheres of war. Hyperspace drive is back online, Commander Malin reported. We can jump any time. Simpkins says it will function okay for now, but it'll need a full check when we return to base. We've had to seal off several compartments that were open to space. Power build up on the two enemy ships, Kevin said suddenly, as his sensors began to spike. I think they're going to blow. Ensign Stryker, put some distance between us and those two simulant ships, and prepare to enter hyperspace. Commander Malin, let the two AI ships know that we're returning to base. 
Just as the Avenger was preparing to enter the blue-white spatial vortex that had formed in front of the vessel, two massive explosions indicated the destruction of the two simulant ships. Then, the Avenger darted into the vortex and vanished. At nearly the same time, the two AI spheres entered their own vortexes and also vanished. Moments later, there were no signs of the three ships ever having been in the star system. Later, Jeremy entered the officer's mess to get something to eat. He was feeling ravenous as he hadn't eaten since early in the morning. He saw without surprise that Kevin and Ariel were already seated at a table. Going down the line, he quickly filled his plate and walked over, sitting down next to the gorgeous black-haired AI. What are you eating? asked Jeremy, looking over at Kevin. He was pretty certain that was a hamburger and french fries on his friend's plate. It's a sad day, Kevin said in all seriousness. This will be a day I will long remember. I don't understand, Jeremy replied as he bit into his ham sandwich. It's the hamburger, Ariel informed him with a playful smile. It's the last one. Once Kevin's eaten the one he has now, there are no more left in the entire fleet. Oh, Jeremy said in understanding. He saw Angela come in through the open hatch and head through the line. Once she had selected her food, she came over and sat down next to Kevin. Last hamburger? she asked, looking knowingly at Kevin's plate. She had checked the day before and knew the supply of Kevin's favorite food was getting dangerously low. We need to get rescued, Kevin announced as he took a small bite of the hamburger. He wanted to savor every last bite. Speaking of rescue, Angela said, brushing her brunette hair back with her right hand. It's been two years. Do you think there's still a chance? There's always a chance, Jeremy answered. There was no doubt in his mind that back in their own galaxy, Kelsey, Katie, and Clarissa were doing everything in their power to try to find them. Clarissa will come, Ariel said with conviction. She will never give up until she finds a way to this galaxy. I miss Brace. I would have given anything if he had been aboard the Avenger when we came through the Vortex, Angela said, feeling the loss deep inside. I can't help thinking I'll never see him again. Brace couldn't be on the Avenger because of your relationship, Jeremy reminded her, though he wished the same about Kelsey and Katie. The last two years had been very difficult for all of them without their loved ones. What if he finds someone else? Continued Angela, voicing one of her greatest fears. I don't think that will happen, Kevin said. Then with a grin, he added, You're a hard act to follow, and I should know. I'm sure he's working with Kelsey and Katie, Jeremy added. What worries me is what will happen to them if they do manage to make it to this galaxy, Kevin said, putting down his hamburger. I suspect the simulans have fleets standing by close to where we appeared, just in case another vortex opens. There are several nearby star systems where we could hide ships in the atmospheres of gas giants, just like we did in the system we just left, Ariel suggested. If we have enough vortex detection buoys deployed, the ships would know when anyone comes through a new vortex. I think it's a good plan, responded Jeremy, nodding his head and taking a sip of his tea. He would discuss it with his staff once they got back. They were fortunate the supply ships that had come through with them had been loaded with enough provisions to supply the fleets, though they were beginning to run out of some basic foodstuffs. Several farms had been established on the world they were using for a base to replace some of the items. Of course, meat was a different issue. They hadn't brought cattle or any other food animal along. There were animals on the planet that would be good substitutes, though the taste wouldn't quite be the same. Of course, they had long since run out of coffee, and there'd been a lot of grumbling when that occurred. They still had another year's supply of tea and then that too would be gone. Do you think it's safe for us to do much exploring? Angela asked. She missed the meals with Kelsey and Katie. It had also been great when the five of them had been together. I don't believe we have much choice, Jeremy answered. When we get back, I'm going to speak to Admiral Cletius and Graceth about building some type of stealth destroyer or cruiser. We need to know more about these simulants and what they're after. The stealth scouts just aren't large enough to get us the information we need, and they also can't defend themselves if they're detected. Kevin nodded, and picking up his hamburger, ate the last two bites. He wondered what Katie would say if she knew his favorite food was now a thing of the past. With a deep sigh, he wished Katie were here. Just like Angela, 
He would have given anything if she had been aboard the Avenger when it entered the White Vortex. The Avenger and her two escorting AI ships reappeared in the small system they'd chosen to build a base. They were deep inside the nebula and thus far had a void leading the simulants back to their secret world. As they neared the small planet, which was their new home in this galaxy, Jeremy gazed at the tactical displays, rapidly filling up with friendly green icons. Even the AI ships now showed green, since the Altons had confirmed that after the slight programming readjustment the AIs had allowed, they were no longer able to attack humans or any other member race of the Alliance. Jeremy still felt great surprise at realizing the AIs had actually allowed this to be done. Up until the Alton scientists confirmed that it was finished, Jeremy had expected the AIs to back out of the agreement. On the main view screen, the Carthians mobile shipyard was being displayed. The shipyard had gone through some major changes over the last two years. With the aid of the fourth fleet repair vessels, it was now double its previous size and held four construction repair bays that could handle a ship up to the size of a battle cruiser. Several flights of Talon fighters were visible as they flew their regular CSP close to the shipyard. Contact Graceth, Admiral Cletius, Rear Admiral Marks, and the Command AI, ordered Jeremy, drawing in a sharp breath. We need to report what we discovered and discuss what our future steps are going to be. We'll meet on the Clan Protector in two hours. Boarding the Clan Protector, Jeremy walked down the ramp of his shuttle and saw Graceth and Dalethon waiting patiently for him. Dalethon was Graceth's second in command and in charge of the mobile shipyard. Greetings, Jeremy, boomed Graceth, striding forward and grabbing Jeremy in a huge bear hug. How was the hunt? We encountered two of the unknown ships, Jeremy responded as he caught his breath. They are called simulants, and with the aid of the AIs, we destroyed both of them after they attacked us. The AIs have their use, spoke Dalethon. I know the Altons have assured us the AIs can no longer harm us, but I still feel uneasy in their presence. Maleth and Corel still refuse to be in the presence of the AIs, Graceth added with his bearish smile. I imagine if they know the command AI is coming on board, they've already gone to their quarters and locked the doors. Females, growled Dalethon. They are not warriors, but they still do their jobs admirably. Just be glad we have females on the clan protector, spoke Graceth in a more serious tone. If it becomes necessary to continue our race here in this galaxy, we'll need them. As they began walking toward the briefing room the meeting was going to be held in, Jeremy looked around the large repair bay with interest. A Kirthian battlecruiser was in the repair berth, and numerous bears as well as humans were working on the ship. We're adding more particle beam weapons, spoke Graceth, seeing Jeremy looking at the ship. Four extra batteries on the main hull. Jeremy nodded. This had already been done to most of the Federation ships, particularly the AIs. The larger AI spheres were able to handle nearly 20 of the powerful beam weapons and could fire them simultaneously as they demonstrated against the simulant ships earlier. Reaching the briefing room, Jeremy saw that the others were already present. He noticed Admiral Cletius had brought a number of Altons, most of whom Jeremy knew. He also saw with interest that the Command AI had brought two other AIs with it. You've all received my report of what we encountered at the Avian Planet, Jeremy began, as he took his place at the head of the table. He then looked over at the Command AI. The two AI ships which accompanied us did very well destroying the two simulant vessels. The use of multiple particle beam weapons seems to be quite effective against the enemy ships. They were doing their duty, the command AI responded, almost emotionless. You are our commander and must be protected. The threat from these simulants may be far greater than we originally believed, Admiral Cletius spoke. The tall Alton gazed thoughtfully at Jeremy. We had assumed we jumped into their space when we exited the spatial vortex. They may control a far greater percentage of this galaxy than we initially believed. That's why I want to build some destroyer-sized ships, responded Jeremy, looking around the group. We have the design plans for Federation destroyers. I propose we modify them to allow for greater speed and equip them with stealth shielding. The AIs agree, spoke the command AI. We must know more about this enemy we face. 
particle beam weapons on ships of that size will be useless, Admiral Cledius was quick to point out. They won't have the power necessary for them to be effective. A powerful energy shield should be a priority, added the AI. I have brought two of my science AIs with me. They can help design an energy shield that should be sufficient to stand up to a brief bombardment from a simulant ship. That will allow the vessel time to escape into hyperspace. Then we agree? Jeremy asked. When everyone nodded, he looked over at Grayseth. How long to build the first destroyer? Four months, Grayseth answered. We will be combining several technologies, so I would feel better if the Altons helped coordinate the merging of them. That can easily be done, Admiral Cledius said. We have done such work before with the Federation and the Alliance. What about rescue? Rear Admiral Marks asked. My people ask about that every day. It's a remote possibility, spoke Tanith Lee. Tanith was a female Alton and well-versed in theoretical physics, as well as hyperspace. We believe our people in our galaxy will by now have realized the destruction of the hyper-translation station did indeed open up a spatial vortex, though I suspect there will be much argument over whether our ships could have survived such transit. There is a possibility they may devise a method to open up another vortex, but much smaller. How long before they could send a ship or fleet through? asked Admiral Marks, hoping it would be soon. Not for another year or two, at the earliest, Tanith replied. If they do make the attempt, they'll use one ship so as not to risk more becoming stranded if something goes wrong. We have to be ready if they come through the vortex, rumbled Grayseth, his large eyes focusing on Jeremy. That's why I'm proposing to place a number of stealth vortex detection buoys around this nebula. As well as where we exited the spatial vortex, Jeremy said. If they do come through, we need to know. But what's to stop the Semulans from destroying them? asked Grayseth. They'll set a trap. They are wary hunters. They are bound to have ships waiting. I have a plan, Jeremy said. He then proceeded to tell them what he felt needed to be done. The meeting continued for several more hours as numerous details were discussed and hammered out. In the end, Jeremy was satisfied that they were doing everything possible to ensure their continued survival, as well as know if a vessel came through from home. Jeremy hoped they would be rescued, though he knew the odds were not in their favor. He also knew that if there was any way for a Federation rescue mission to be launched, Kelsey and Katie would move mountains to ensure it happened. There was no doubt they would be on the rescue ship, when and if it indeed came through the vortex. Chapter 7 Kelsey was sitting at the main navigation console of the distant horizon, gazing at the view screen and marveling at the sea of unwinking stars being displayed. The ship was near the galactic center, and only two hyperjumps away from the Alton's former homeworld. The massive screen made her feel as if she could reach out and touch the stars. Is the next jump calculated? asked Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes from her command chair. Yes. Kelsey answered as she reconfirmed the coordinates on her computer. Coordinates have been inputted into the navigation computer. We can jump at any time. It will be interesting to see the old homeworld, spoke Andrew Muse, who was standing just behind Kelsey with his hands clasped behind his back. The tall, white-haired Alton gazed speculatively at the large view screen directly in front of navigation. This was the closest he had ever been to the galactic center, and the view was spectacular. There are other Altons already there, Kelsey said. She knew that after the battle at the Galactic Center, the Altons, along with a Federation fleet, had gone straight to the Altons' homeworld to secure it and search for surviving AIs. Why haven't you gone before? She had met Andrum over a year ago and developed a friendship with the brilliant Alton scientist. He was currently serving as the Alton science advisor for the distant horizon. Quite a few of my fellow scientists and researchers are doing studies there, spoke Andrum in his calm voice. There is much research that needs to be done, and the AIs have a wealth of computer records that need to be gone through. The history and science of tens of thousands of worlds is waiting there for us. Initiate jump, 
spoke Catherine, as she listened to Kelsey and Andrum talk. Once again, she was being reminded just how much authority Kelsey could wield if she so desired. It made Catherine wonder if she should promote both Kelsey and Katie to ward off possible trouble later on during the mission. Jump, ordered Commander Grissom. On the massive view screen, a swirling blue-white spatial vortex formed. The helm officer quickly maneuvered the distant horizon into the center of the vortex, and in an instant, the ship made the jump into hyperspace. Kelsey felt a twinge in her stomach, and then saw the strange shifting deep purple colors of hyperspace. The effect was even more magnified on the large screen, which encompassed the entire forward wall of the command center. She had often wondered if the purple colors were real, or if her mind was interpreting the sensory input in this manner so she could understand it. Hyperspace is a realm with strange laws for both space-time and the physical universe, Andrum explained as his eyes focused on the screen. Andrum's skin was a very pale color, with a slight bluish tinge, as was normal for all Altons. What would happen if a ship became lost in hyperspace or became trapped? asked Kelsey. It was something she had often worried about. I don't believe that's possible, answered Andrum, shifting his gaze back to Kelsey. The hyperspace drive generates a bubble which allows us to travel safely through this higher dimension. If the bubble breaks or collapses, we would immediately fall back into our normal plane of existence. Next, a hyperspace dropout will be in 32 minutes, spoke Colonel Leon. Petra was standing near one of the tactical displays, which had now gone blank since the ship entered the vortex. Catherine nodded as she leaned back in her command chair. Looking around the command center, she was satisfied that everything was operating smoothly. The crew was a mixture of humans and Altons. Glancing over at the main computer console, she saw Katie was in a deep and animated conversation with Miko Law. Catherine had a strong suspicion they were discussing the ship's computer systems. Then her eyes shifted back to Kelsey. That's an interesting look in your eyes, Admiral, commented Clarissa, who was standing to Catherine's left. I notice you get that look occasionally when you look at Kelsey or Katie. Clarissa, Catherine said in a low voice where no one else could hear her. Who is actually in charge of this mission and ship? Me or them? Clarissa was silent as her deep blue eyes looked at the Admiral. That's an interesting question, the AI responded. You have to take into consideration that Kelsey, Katie, and I basically designed this ship. We needed the Altons to make it become a reality. While this ship is a warship, it is also an exploration vessel. You are aware that while many of the Altons on board serve in various command capacities, none of them are in the military. Yes, Catherine replied. I wondered about that. She knew that while most Altons loved research, the majority despised armed conflict. To them, they consider this more of a research mission rather than a military one, spoke Clarissa. As to the question you asked, you are in charge particularly in regards to military issues. What about other issues? asked Catherine, noticing Clarissa had stressed the word military. Clarissa was silent for a long moment as she contemplated her answer. Nothing will stand in the way of us finding and reuniting the Special Five, she finally said. As long as that is also your primary goal, you will remain in command. Clarissa then turned and walked over to where Katie and Miko were. The AI's words sent a chill down Catherine's back. While not actually saying it, there was no doubt Clarissa felt if it was necessary to take over command of the distant horizon that Kelsey and Katie, along with the AI, were perfectly capable of doing just that. I had better promote them, she thought. If they're higher up in the chain of command, it will greatly lessen the possibility of conflict later. She knew it would be necessary for her to prove to the two women, as well as the AI, she was just as committed to this mission as they were. Two hours later, the distant horizon exited a blue-white vortex into the Alton's former home system. They were at Condition 2 as a safety precaution, and almost instantly, alarms began to sound. Receiving ship ID challenge, Captain Travers said as he quickly sent the distant horizon's ID codes. Two Alton battleships closing on our position, Captain Reynolds reported. There's a hell of a lot of Alton ships showing up on the tactical screen. Commander Grissom commented. There are also numerous unidentified constructions all over the system. AI shipyards and construction facilities, Andrum spoke, as he gazed in awe at the large view screen. 
There are 12 planets in the system, and the AIs have covered most of their surfaces with metal fabrications of various sorts. Only on the Alton homeworld are there still areas left untouched. I have an Alton admiral named Victel on the comm, Captain Travers said. He says we're not scheduled for a visit to this system and must leave immediately. Let me speak to him, Andrum said. I know the admiral and his family. Do so, said Catherine knowing they couldn't go further into the system without Alton permission. Andrum went to the communications console and, after a brief conversation, turned back to Admiral Barnes. We've been granted permission to go into orbit above the old homeworld. Admiral Victel hopes we find what we're looking for. Take us in, ordered Catherine, settling back in her command chair. This mission was about to get very interesting. She was looking forward to going down to the surface and seeing the Alton world. Three hours later, the New Horizon entered the gravity well of the Alton's old homeworld. The planet still had a few oceans and several small patches of green on the surface. The mountain ranges had a dusting of snow on the higher peaks. We call it Austral, Andrum said, with a profound sadness in his eyes as he gazed at the screen. Where do we begin our search? Catherine asked. She had told the Altons what it was they were seeking, or what she suspected it was. It had to be something that concerned the black hole and the AI's attempt to travel to another galaxy. There was a clue here nobody had as of yet found. In our old capital city, answered Andrum, pointing to an area of the planet on the large screen. Instantly, Clarissa expanded that area until a sprawling metropolis appeared. At its height, the city could easily have held over 100 million inhabitants. It spread out for kilometers with wide avenues and soaring towers. Some of the buildings seemed to reach up nearly to the few clouds, which floated high in the almost clear sky. The City of Light, spoke Andrum, reverently. Its brightness once lit up a major portion of the planet. It looks intact, commented Catherine, standing up and walking to Andrum's side. How is that possible? She gazed intently at the screen, examining the magnificent city. The A.I.s preserved the city just as it was when the last Altons here passed away. Andrum answered, It's the only city of my people still standing on the entire planet. It's also where the main computer center of the A.I.s is located. Deep beneath the city are the great computers my people used to rule their empire. In the early days, before withdrawing back to Astral, Knowledge from all the numerous research expeditions, as well as that gathered by the A.I.s, is stored there. I suggest we go down to the surface, Catherine said. If you will select which Altons need to accompany us, we'll meet you in the Alpha Flight Bay. We'll be ready shortly, Andrum replied. I've been looking forward to this moment for a very long time. Kelsey, Katie, you're with me, Catherine said, as she turned and headed for the hatch to the command center. Commander Grissom, you have the ship. How long will you be gone, Admiral? Grissom asked as she stepped over toward the command chair. As long as it takes, Catherine replied. There's a lot of data stored down there, and we're not quite sure what it is we're looking for, other than it probably involves the black hole at the galaxy center. Kelsey and Kate had hurriedly followed the Admiral. Both knew, from hearing former Fleet Admiral Streth's cryptic words, just how important it was that they find the information on the planet below. They also knew, once they left Astral, their next stop would be the black hole at the galaxy center. They were that much closer to finding their husbands and the lost fleets. As they exited the shuttle at a small spaceport just outside of the capital city, they were met by two Altons and a human general. I am General Wesley, the general said, introducing himself. With me are Garrick Rath and Lean Tall Moth. Garrick is the chief scientist for research in the city, and Lean Tall is an expert on the AIs. Pleased to meet you. Catherine said with a nod. General Wesley, I wasn't expecting to see a Marine General here on the planet. She knew there were a few Federation warships in the system, but she hadn't been expecting to find Marines. There are still a few AIs around, Wesley explained in a serious tone. We've spent the last four years hunting them down. How many have you found so far? Asked Andrum, looking concerned. Many deactivated themselves upon learning of the defeat of their fleets at the Black Hole. Lean Tall answered. We've searched nearly all of the installations in the system and have found four million deactivated AIs. 
Unfortunately, not all of them chose to deactivate themselves, Wesley added with a heavy sigh. We've destroyed over 12,000 since we first arrived in the system, immediately after the battle at the Black Hole. We estimate there are still a few hundred remaining that we haven't located yet. How many Marines do you have in the system? asked Catherine, realizing the Herculean task of searching all the AI sites. 120,000, Wesley answered. What about AI ships? Catherine continued. Did you find any of them? None have been seen since the battle. We don't believe they were all destroyed, Lean Tall said with a look of concern in her eyes. We think they fled to one of the other slave empires, but we're not sure which one. Then some day we could be facing more AIs, Catherine said, worriedly. She had thought the threat from the AIs was over. Everyone did. Nothing had been mentioned about this back in the Federation. No, that won't happen, promised Lean Tall, shaking her head. The Master Codex is still here, and without that, they can't create new AIs. What's the Master Codex? asked Katie, becoming intrigued. It's what contains the master program file to create new AIs, Miko explained, her eyes focusing on Katie. We believe there are only two. We're almost certain one was destroyed at the Black Hole Battle, when the Central Nexus was blown up, and the other is here in the capital city. And the AIs can't create new AIs without it? asked Katie. No, the programming is too advanced and complicated, replied Miko. They could create new AIs and attempt to duplicate their own programming, Lean Tall said. However, the new AIs wouldn't be sentient. They would be like very advanced robots. An hour later, they were deep inside the city, and after exiting the ground transport vehicles, were shown into a tall building that reached up over 300 stories above the ground. That's a big building, said Katie, her green eyes looking up. She couldn't quite see the top. It also extends another 40 stories underground, General Wesley informed them. Catherine noticed immediately that the building was well guarded. Several heavy armored vehicles were parked in the street, and a large number of Marines were visible in the surrounding area. We're guarding this facility against any of the surviving AIs, Wesley explained. There are guards stationed all over the city as well as inside key buildings. There hasn't been an attack by an AI in over a month, Garrick said as they went inside. General Wesley thinks they're biding their time. I'm hoping that we got them all. Kelsey took a deep breath. They were in a wide corridor with walls covered with colorful paintings. It was like a giant mural had been placed upon each wall. These were some of the most gorgeous paintings she had ever seen. They were of landscapes of different planets. They showed sunsets, sunrises, mountains, massive green forests, and strange animals the likes of which Kelsey had never imagined. Our people were great artists toward the end here on Astral, Garrick explained, with great sadness in his voice. In the final days, the surviving Altons gradually moved from the outlying cities until all that were left lived here in the City of Light. For a few more centuries, they practiced the arts as the birth rate continued to decline. In the end, they died out, but they left us this wonderful artwork. It's their legacy, Androm said, as he stopped to examine a painting. It was of an alien landscape with deep shades of red and orange, showing the fading colors of light as the sun set behind a distant and unknown horizon. They continued on, taking a winding set of stairs, which took them deep beneath the building. Garrick finally opened a wide set of doors, where half a dozen heavily armed marines stood guard. This is the Master Computer Center he announced, as he stepped inside. Catherine and the others followed, and then came to a stunned halt at what was in front of them. The room they were in was vast. It extended as far as the eye could see. There were three upper levels that contained consoles and what must be thousands of workstations. Katie stepped over to the edge of the railing and gazed around in awe. I thought I knew a lot about computers, she said softly. Nothing could have prepared me for this. Everywhere she looked were computer stations and data storage units. Nothing even close to this existed in the Federation. Our people were great inventors and delved deep into creating the ultimate computer, spoke Garrick as he stepped over next to Katie. From this room, everything on the planet and even the star system could be controlled. 
It's also where the program that created the AIs originated, added Ling Tong with deep regret in her voice. How are we ever going to find what we're seeking? Asked Catherine, realizing the stupendous job ahead of them. This was going to be like searching for the proverbial needle in a haystack, and a very small needle at that. It will take us decades, if not centuries, to go through all the information stored here, Lean Tall said. Over two hundred Altons are already working in this room alone, and we've barely touched the surface of the knowledge in the computers. Can you take Katie and Miko to a couple of computer terminals and show them how to operate them? Asked Catherine. She knew the only hope they had rested on the shoulders of her two computer experts. Of course, Lean Tall said with a nod. If you'll follow me, I will log you into the system. Sometime later, Catherine watched as Katie and Miko began working at two computer stations. They were similar to the ones the Altons had put on the distant horizon, with touch screens and voice commands. Taking a seat, Catherine knew she might be in for a long wait. It's hopeless, Katie said, as she gazed at the computer screen and the data being displayed. She looked over at Kelsey and shook her head. We don't know what we're looking for. There's a tremendous amount of information about the black hole at the galaxy center. It will take months or more likely years to sift through all of it. Fleet Admiral Streth wouldn't have sent us here if he thought we couldn't find what we need, spoke Kelsey, stepping up next to Katie. Maybe we're going about this the wrong way. What do you mean? asked Katie, shifting her gaze from Kelsey back to the screen. She needed some ideas on how to limit the parameters of her search. To go where the Avenger and the Lost Fleets went... We have to go to the black hole at the galaxy center, Kelsey said. I think we need to focus our search on that aspect. See what the earliest references are about the black hole. There's a lot, Katie said, as she called up an index listing all the black hole research that had been done. It would take years to go through all of this. Kelsey thought hard about what to ask the computer. Search for strange occurrences involving the black hole, Kelsey suggested. Strange occurrences? asked Katie, looking confused. She shook her head and decided to humor Kelsey. A moment later, her eyes grew wide. Admiral Barnes, you need to see this. Everyone crowded around to see what Katie was talking about. On the computer screen was a large, bulbous black ship, with six large spires reaching out in front of its forward hull. What the hell is that? uttered Catherine. She didn't know of any species that had a ship like that one. She wondered if this was some type of experimental ship of the AIs. From the information here, this ship emerged from a spatial vortex near the black hole, just a few centuries after the Altons died out. Here, on Astral, Katie said. They were a strange-looking race and spent some time with the AIs before going back through the vortex. They were never seen again. Did they say where they came from? Asked Catherine, her curiosity piqued. She wondered if this was what Admiral Streth had sent them to Astral to find. Yes, Katie answered with a strange look upon her face. They said they were from another galaxy. It suddenly became so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Everyone looked at one another in astonishment. Miko, how soon after these visitors showed up? Did the AIs begin conquering other worlds? Asked Catherine, hoping her suspicions were wrong. Even the Altons had long been confused as to why the AIs had turned so violently against the organic races of the galaxy. Just a moment, Miko said, as she began asking the computer she was working at the necessary questions. Twenty years, she said, her eyes growing wide in shock. Do you think this mysterious race changed the programming of the AIs in some way? I don't know, Catherine said. Can Garrick or Lean Tall check and see? They didn't give us access to the Codex. I doubt whether many have access to it, Andrum said, as he turned to go in search of the other two Altons. Later, they all stood looking at one another in shock. Are you certain? Catherine asked. Yes, it's right here, said Leantal, pointing to some complicated computer code up on Katie's screen. A minor adjustment was made to the Codex during the time this strange race was here on Astral. What does the change do? asked General Wesley, who had come down to see what the excitement was about. It's a minor alteration, but it changed the way the AIs looked at organic races, explained Lean Tall. Instead of seeing them as being something to protect, it made them into competitors for resources instead. The AIs were programmed to protect the Alton homeworld and system, Miko explained. 
This would have made other races potential threats. As time passed, the programming began to take precedence and became the center of AI activity, continued Lane Tall, taking a deep breath. The AIs began moving out into the galaxy to procure resources to ensure the homeworld could continue to exist. You see the city around us that was part of their original programming to preserve it and the knowledge stored here. We always believed the original programming would eventually bring the AIs into conflict with other races, Garrick said. That's why we brought humans from Earth to tell us. We felt they would be able to stop any future expansion by the AIs. The AIs moved much more quickly and violently than we envisioned, and this change in their programming helps to explain it. As the AIs continued to advance and the Codex became more complicated, the AIs themselves became more aggressive, eventually becoming the threat we had to deal with four years ago, Miko said. At least we know what started the war, Catherine said. This would make for some interesting discussions back in the Federation. But how does this help us find Admiral Strong in the Lost Fleet? Katie called up some additional information on a nearby screen. The race that came to our galaxy were called the Simulans. They left instructions about how to send a probe back to their galaxy once all the organic races in this one were annihilated. It's a program the AIs could not access until after they had completed activating the Eternity device. I guess the Simulans didn't expect the AIs to try to send a fleet through instead, commented General Wesley. No. Somehow, over the centuries, the program became slightly corrupted, explained Leantal pointing to several lines of code, now glowing red. The AIs began building all their constructions at the galaxy's center, thinking it was their idea to expand their empire to other galaxies. They didn't realize it was the corrupted program of the simulants that was supposed to cause them to open up a small vortex and send a probe through. Instead, they were going to send their AI fleets through and attempt to conquer the Simulans' galaxy. Katie, Catherine asked, can we use that information to take the distant horizon to the Simulans' galaxy? She was certain that was where the Avenger and the other fleets had gone. She also felt a chill at realizing what some of Fleet Admiral Streth's cryptic remarks might mean. I think so, Katie said. We know the course and the coordinates. All we need is the energy and we can open a spatial vortex to take us there. Taking a deep breath, Catherine looked at the others. I think our mission here is done. This is obviously the information Fleet Admiral Streth wanted us to find. Now, let's go find our lost fleet. Chapter 8 The distant horizon dropped out of hyperspace, exiting the spatial vortex near the black hole in the galaxy center. On the main view screen, a mass of empty space seemed to fill the screen. The screen had been set to cut off the glare from the accretion disk. It's an awesome sight, spoke Andrum, as he gazed thoughtfully at the black hole. It has a mass of over 3.7 million stars, the size of Earth's sun. This is a place of death, commented Clarissa from Andrum's side. I wish we didn't have to come here. It's dangerous to be so close to the black hole. Even now, I can feel the tidal forces reaching out for the distant horizon. We're safe as long as we stay in orbit, Andrum reassured Clarissa. We're nearly a tenth of a light year away from the singularity. It's the only way to find Jeremy and Ariel, Kelsey reminded the AI, as she thought about what had happened the last time she had been here. It was at the Great Battle, and she had been serving as navigation officer on the Star Strike, which was Fleet Admiral Streth's flagship. So many people had died that day, and of course, the Avenger and the fleets with her had vanished into the white vortex. They're waiting for us in the Triangulum Galaxy, spoke Clarissa, her dark eyes looking expectantly at Kelsey. All their research and the information left by the simulants indicated that was where the missing fleets had gone. Clarissa had run tens of thousands of simulations to reassure herself that Ariel and the Avenger had successfully made the transit. I understand Katie has cases of hamburgers stored back in the ship's main freezer for Kevin. Kelsey allowed herself to laugh. It was something she didn't do very often anymore. Yes, that's Kevin's favorite food. When we served together on the Avenger, 
He had them at almost every meal. I think the only time he didn't eat a hamburger was for breakfast. Those were good memories. The times the five of them, along with Ariel, had been in the officer's mess enjoying a meal together and talking. Sometimes they would talk about their current mission, and other times they would discuss what they were going to do when the war was over. One thing they'd all decided was that they wanted to stay together. All those plans had come crashing down when the Avenger had made her suicidal run on the hyper-translation station, and three of the Special Five and Ariel had disappeared from the galaxy. There'd been a time when Kelsey and Katie had both believed their husbands had died, and the fleets with them had been destroyed by the uncontrolled energy released by the White Vortex. They'd both felt numb at the memorial service at the Fleet Academy. Neither had wanted to accept that their loved ones were gone, and for months they lived in sorrow until Ambassador Turin contacted them with astonishing news. Sensor readings and Alton research into the phenomenon at the Black Hole had suggested a possibility the Avenger and the Lost Fleets just might have survived their transit. Alton scientists, who specialized in hyperspace travel, had suggested that for a brief time the massive white vortex had formed a stable link to another galaxy. If during that time the Avenger and the other fleets had managed to make transit, then there was a possibility they'd survived. Shilum Tore, a female Alton that was on board the distant horizon, was a specialist in hyperspace studies. She firmly believed if they could find the necessary power, the distant horizon could make the transit to the same galaxy the Avenger had gone. For the last two years, Shilum and a number of other Altons had designed a special hyperspace drive based on a totally new set of principles. If the drive worked, they could make the transit to the designated galaxy almost instantaneously. It would also allow them to travel much faster during a normal hyperjump. Unfortunately, it required a minimal cooldown time after every long jump. We have to find them, Kelsey said, her eyes misting over. Jeremy and the Avenger have to be waiting for us. They are, Clarissa promised in her most confident voice. I've told you before, Ariel would never allow anything bad to happen to the ship. We have some work to do here, Andrum said, knowing how deeply Kelsey missed her mate. It'll take a few days of study and preparations, and then we should be ready to make our attempt. Kelsey nodded as her gaze returned to the view screen and the deadly, all-consuming black hole it displayed. Contacts, reported Captain Reynolds from his sensor console. I have four Alton battleships, several science vessels, as well as a small Federation fleet showing up on my sensors. That would be the ships that are mating us here, Commander Grissom said, as friendly green icons began to appear in one of the tactical displays. They'd been sent ahead several months back to make special preparations which would be needed for the transit attempt. I have Admiral Jackson on the comm, reported Captain Travers. He says he was beginning to wonder if we were going to make it. Catherine nodded. Put me through to him. She knew Admiral Jackson, having met him several times at Nutellus. He was a very competent admiral and a key part of what they'd planned. It's good to see your ships, Admiral Jackson, Catherine said over the comm. It really did feel good to see friendly ships this far from home. We've been working to get everything ready, Jackson replied. He was aboard his flagship, the battleship Dauntless. He had four strike cruisers with him, as well as a battle carrier and a fleet repair vessel. I hope you have good news for me, Catherine added. Admiral Jackson had been sent ahead with a specific set of orders. She just hoped that he had been able to accomplish his mission, or the distant horizon's attempt at an intergalactic transit might be delayed. During the first two years after the Great Battle, there had always been a few Alton and Federation ships in the area, searching the wreckage around the black hole. It was a dangerous job due to the tidal and gravity effects from the black monstrosity, which tried to swallow anything that came too close. Already, the majority of the wreckage from the battle had fallen into the maw of the all-consuming black hole. Immediately after the battle, all the wreckage had been catalogued and any useful technology removed for future study. We have one capacitor station, which is intact and fully charged with energy, Jackson answered. The Altons have been studying it and, of course, agreed to allow your ship to tap into the stored energy. How many of the capacitor stations survived? Catherine asked. She knew the power feedback from the destruction of the hyper-translation station had destroyed nearly all of the energy-collecting stations. Most of their shattered remains had already been drawn into the black hole. Three, Jackson replied. 
Two of them were severely damaged. This one the Altons believe was offline and never activated during the battle. That's the only reason it survived intact. Will that be enough? asked Catherine, turning and looking questionably at Shiloom, who was standing next to her. The tall, white-haired Alton woman had wanted to be in the command center when they arrived at the black hole, and she had been listening to the conversation between the two admirals. Perhaps, Shiloom responded with a thoughtful nod. We need to go over in much more detail the information we downloaded from the computer banks on Astron to determine the exact course we're going to need to take. We're also going to have to take some readings on the black hole to determine what effects it might have had on the spatial vortex that formed here. It'll be several weeks at least before we're ready to make our transit attempt. Catherine nodded. She had expected this. Admiral Jackson, it looks as if we're going to be here for a while. The Altons on the science ships indicated the same thing, Jackson responded. I just hope that new ship of yours is ready for what's ahead. So do I, Catherine replied. If you'd like, why don't you come over and I'll give you the grand tour of the distant horizon. I promise you've never seen anything quite like her before. I'll take you up on that, Jackson responded. I've heard a few rumors about that ship of yours, and I'm looking forward to seeing her up close. Clarissa, would you please put the capacitor station up on the view screen? requested Shiloom. She wanted to see it up close, as this was her first trip to the galactic center. Clarissa adjusted the large view screen, which covered the front wall, to show the surviving station. The image swelled on the screen until the 120-kilometer diameter station nearly filled it. The energy collecting station was circular and covered with giant collector dishes. The entire outer surface bristled with various mechanisms and constructions. Shiloom stepped closer to the view screen, her eyes examining the entire structure. It still amazed her that the AIs had built something so large. The energy comes from the black hole, Andrum explained, as he gazed thoughtfully at the view screen. It's from the accretion disk and how it reacts to the matter being drawn into the singularity, generating a massive X-ray signature just outside of the event horizon. It's that energy the AIs were capturing. The capacitor station is fully charged, Shiloom said as she shifted her eyes toward Andrum. It's sat here ever since the battle, just waiting for the proper signal to release its stored energy. We can use it to charge our ring vortex generators and then use our new hyperspace drive to open up an intergalactic vortex to the Triangulum Galaxy. I just hope it works, spoke Kelsey. She didn't know what she would do if their attempt failed. Living over four years without Jeremy had been horrific. It will, promised Clarissa. All of the equations and simulations indicate a 98% chance for a successful transit if we have sufficient energy. Let's get to work, people, Catherine ordered. After listening to the discussion, we have a mission to accomplish, and I fully intend to find the Avenger and the missing fleets. A week later, Catherine was over on the capacitor station inspecting the work that was being done. The station was massive and obviously built for use by the AIs. The station had been searched by teams of Marines to ensure no surviving AIs were lurking in its many corridors and power rooms. As a precaution, there were still a large number of Marines stationed throughout the station. Catherine was currently standing in one of the rooms used to control the energy being collected from the black hole. It was massive, with a number of control stations, and the smell of ozone was prevalent in the air. We've added an environmental system to the station, Admiral Jackson explained, as he saw Admiral Barnes frown at the smell in the air. However, the station is so large it's not practical to pump a breathable atmosphere into every section. In most areas, we have to wear an environmental suit to provide air and protection from radiation. Radiation? uttered Catherine, turning to look questionably at Jackson. Where's the radiation coming from? In some areas we've detected high levels of X-rays, he answered. The Alton environmental suits give us adequate protection to work in those sections. Catherine turned her attention back to the massive room in which they stood. It still amazed her that the AIs had built 1,200 of these stations in orbit around the black hole. It was a remarkable feat of construction, the likes of which the galaxy would probably never see again. A number of Alton technicians were currently in the room working on the control consoles. They were set up to be used by AIs, and some modifications had to be made 
to make it practical for Alton or humans to operate the controls. Currently, wiring was strung across the floor of the room, and a number of panels had been opened up on a number of consoles, revealing their intricate control systems. How soon before the station is ready? Catherine asked, as she watched one of the Altons test a console he was working on. She was anxious to begin running tests. Four more days and the station will be ready to transmit its energy, Jackson answered. He cocked an eyebrow and looked at Catherine. How soon before the distant horizon is ready to make the attempt? Clarissa and Shilum are working on the final calculations now, Catherine answered. We'll run some tests before we actually try the intergalactic transit. She let out a deep sigh. The last few days had been hectic, with Shilum and the other Altons flying back and forth between the capacitor station and the distant horizon. Andrum had even taken a special shuttle and flown dangerously close to the black hole to take readings he claimed were necessary for the calculations they were working on. Several special sensor buoys had been emplaced in the exact spot the white vortex had first appeared, though Catherine wasn't certain why they were necessary. There had been no signs of a vortex at that location in the past four years. She had found it difficult to keep track of the Alton scientists and technicians on the ship. It was all her command crew could do, just to stay aware of who was on the ship and who wasn't. The Altons had a propensity for taking shuttles and going to the station whenever something new turned up, or piqued their curiosity. She had finally ordered the control center for the flight base, just to log the coming and going of the Altons, and which shuttles were currently away from the ship. I don't know, Katie said, looking at the equations up on the computer screen that Miko had put up. These were the results of what Shilum had been working on, and the computer had finally come up with a set of final jump equations. Katie was obviously out of her depth as far as this math was concerned. Clarissa, ask Kelsey to come over here so she can take a look at these. The equations in question were supposedly the exact track the distant horizon would have to take as it entered the intergalactic vortex to arrive at the same coordinates the Avenger and the missing fleets had. Kelsey came over to the computer console, followed by Andrum and Shilum. The three had been studying the information from when the Simulans had used an intergalactic spatial vortex to come to this galaxy. They'd uploaded a considerable amount of information from the computers on Astral, particularly in reference to the black hole and hyperspace travel, in case it was needed later. Garrick had also insisted they take several Alton miniature computer drives, which contained over 200 terabytes of data on technologies the AIs had records of but never used. More equations, moaned Kelsey, seeing what Katie had up on one of her computer screens. Intergalactic hyperspace equations, added Shilum with interest. Are these the ones we need to follow to find our missing fleets? We think so, Miko said in a tired voice. Clarissa has helped us, and we've taken into account the information left by the simulants. The effect of the black hole, spatial drift since the time the simulants came through and the equations you worked out earlier. We've also studied the course taken by Rear Admiral Marx as well as Grayseth when they entered the White Vortex, Katie informed them. This is the equation the computer core is spitting out, but I can't make heads or tails of it. It frustrated Katie that the secret of finding Kevin and the fleets might be right here in front of her, and she just didn't understand what it was she was seeing. Kelsey looked carefully at the equations. There were several pages of complicated navigational equations up on the computer screen. She stepped forward and paged slowly through the equations, studying them as she went. I'm not sure, she said, after examining the equations for several minutes. It seems that if we're off course by just a few meters, we could be thrown thousands of light years from our planned exit point. Speed, too, she loomed said, as she looked intently at one section of the equations. She pointed to one equation she wanted Kelsey to see. Just a few kilometers per second could put us off course also. I can follow this course and keep our speed and entry angle exact, Clarissa stated confidently. I've already run a number of simulations, and I believe we can emerge within just a few million kilometers of where the Avenger and the fleets did. The vortex the Avenger and the other ships went through already had an entry vortex inside the target galaxy, pointed out Andrum. Due to its size, it would not have been affected by speed or angle of entry. All ships would have come out at the same location. 
He had spent a lot of time studying the sensor readings taken during the battle when the White Vortex activated. A number of very prominent Alton scientists had worked with him to determine the probability of the Avenger and her fleet surviving. It was also true that a few Alton scientists believed the ships had been vaporized by the fluctuating energy of the unstable vortex. What does that mean? asked Katie, turning to look at Andrum. As a result, their speed and angle of entry into the vortex didn't matter. The same won't be true with us, as we don't have the power available to open both ends of the hyperspace tunnel at the same time and keep them stable. We won't have a second vortex anchoring us to a specific set of coordinates. Also, we'll spend at least a few minutes inside hyperspace, Shilum informed them. Our transit won't be quite as instantaneous as we originally believed. That's due to the energy constraints we're dealing with. If we had all three of the surviving capacitor stations prepared and online, we could open up both ends of the hyperspace tunnel guaranteeing our safe arrival at the designated coordinates. Kelsey let out a deep breath as she thought over the ramifications of the hyperspace equations. Even following these equations, there's a chance we might not exit the end vortex in the same location as the Avenger and the fleets. It should be close, but it's also been four years. Jeremy could have taken the fleets anywhere in that time. We may have to conduct a search. Commander Grissom said, stepping over closer to the group. She had been listening to their conversation with interest. We have the most powerful sensors available, with a range of ten light years. It may take a while, but if they're there, we'll find them. What if we can't find them? asked Katie, with a concerned look upon her face. They could have gone a long ways in four years. They could be anywhere in that galaxy. A lot of ships went through the vortex, Commander Grissom answered that have left signs of their passage. I also believe Admiral Strong would have left a message on how to find or contact them. He has to know that if there's a rescue mission, it will come through in the same location his fleets did. What about the AIs? Kelsey asked. This was a subject they hadn't discussed much. A lot of AI ships were swallowed by the Vortex, just like the Avenger in our fleet. Admiral Cletius's battleships went through, as well as the Alton battlecruisers, which were with Grace's fleet. Grissom reminded them. They had the forces to hold off the AIs and jump to a safe refuge if they needed to. There's a possibility we may encounter AI ships once we reach the coordinates we're targeting, Andrum said, looking over at Commander Grissom. We may have to fight off the AIs when we arrive. This ship has the most powerful particle beam cannons in existence, Grissom pointed out. They were specifically designed to penetrate the energy screen of an AI sphere. If we do encounter the AIs, they'll learn very quickly to keep their distance. This ship is also equipped with Fusion 5 reactors. They generate much more energy than the reactors currently being employed by the Federation and Alton Fleet. Our new power beams are almost as powerful as the particle beams. We also have the stealth energy shield, Andrum reminded all of them. Once it's turned on, it'll be impossible to detect the distant horizon. We can search with little fear of being detected. Kelsey nodded. She knew the Altons on the distant horizon wanted to avoid combat, if at all possible, which was one of the reasons for developing the stealth energy shield. The only drawback to using the stealth shield was that the regular energy shield couldn't be used at the same time. The stealth shield, while it was fully capable of masking all of the ship's emissions, was not capable of holding up to any type of attack. What about these simulants? asked Katie, her light green eyes showing worry. We know nothing about them other than they changed the AI codex, so the AIs became much more dangerous than thought possible. They don't sound too friendly. What if we encounter them? It's a chance we're taking, admitted Commander Grissom. There are a lot of risks and unknowns with this mission. It's fortunate the distant horizon was designed both for combat and exploration. The simulants are an unknown, and will be dealt with when and if we encounter them. How long can we search if we don't find the fleets immediately? asked Kelsey. She knew the ship was well provisioned, and even had the capability of building necessary replacement parts if needed. The main concern would be their missiles. They had a limited supply of sublight missiles both Antimatter and Devastator 3s. 
Once those were gone, there would be no replacing them. Admiral Barnes plans on taking the ship. Through several trial runs at entering the vortex will generate, Commander Grissom informed them. We'll make transits to nearby star systems to judge just how accurately we can jump the ship. I can put the ship within meters of the designated coordinates, stated Clarissa confidently. She could calculate the jump coordinates out far enough to ensure little or no deviation in their course. That's all well and good, Commander Grissom said, addressing the blonde-haired AI. Our normal jumps are only around 10 to, at the most, 120 light-years. A few meters deviation is to be expected. But keep in mind, we're talking about a jump of nearly 3 million light-years. A slight deviation could put us way off the mark. Everyone was silent as they weighed the commander's words. They all knew she was correct. Getting to the coordinates of the lost fleets might not be as easy as they'd hoped. Clarissa instantly began running more simulations, seeing what a variance in speed and entry angle would mean over such a distance. It didn't take her long to realize she didn't like the results. A few days later, Admiral Barnes was speaking to several Alton scientists and technicians in the control room of the capacitor station. Everything was ready, and the energy could be transferred at any time. Inside the distant horizon were ten small spatial vortex generators, much smaller than the ones the AIs had used on their spatial vortex ring. The AIs had used 30 vortex generators, which were capable of opening a hyperspace tunnel 20 kilometers in diameter. All Catherine needed was to generate one, 700 meters across, to allow the distant horizon sufficient room to make the intergalactic jump. They'd already jumped the distant horizon a number of times, testing the accuracy of Clarissa's piloting. Catherine had been highly impressed. Now she needed to find out what something going through the vortex ring they were going to create would do. We're jumping to the Triangulum Galaxy, or M33 as it's more commonly called on your star charts. Andrum spoke, as he watched Alton technicians input various commands into the new control stations. Nearly three million light years, Catherine said, still finding it difficult to believe that a jump of such a distance was possible. I hope the navigation coordinates we've worked out are accurate. So do I, Andrum replied with a small sigh. He was beginning to like and respect this human admiral. She seemed competent, and didn't hesitate to listen to the Altons, though none were in the military. We base them on what the simulants used to come to our galaxy. We know from the message they left for the AIs how much energy was necessary. We're also fairly certain that when the simulants appeared close to the black hole, they left devices behind to collect energy so they could return to their home galaxy. There are some vague references to energy collection satellites, though we're not certain just what they meant. Something similar to the capacitor stations, but much smaller, suggested Catherine. If they brought them with them, then the collector's satellites would have had to have been small to fit inside their flight bay or cargo hold. Catherine's words were interrupted as the main view screen suddenly came to life. It was focused on the black hole, a tenth of a light year distant. She knew that the Alton and Federation ships were orbiting the black hole, the same as the surviving capacitor station. The stars in this area of space were only a light week apart, but the area immediately around the all-consuming monster had been swept clean. The center of the screen showed an area of darkness surrounded by light, brilliant and difficult to look at. The Alton technician operating the view screen quickly adjusted it, and the light around the black hole grew dimmer. What's all the light from? asked Catherine, looking over at Andrum for an explanation. It's the radiation from the black hole, replied Andrum. Or, to be more precise, it's from the accretion disk. Matter trapped there is spinning so fast, as it spirals down to the black hole, that its speed generates heat, causing it to ionize. The matter's electrons begin separating from their nuclei, and eventually fall into the singularity. Where did the matter come from? Catherine asked, as near as she could see. The immediate area around the black hole was devoid of stars. The tidal forces from the black hole occasionally tear a star apart, and over time the star is pulled in toward the event horizon. Some of it falls directly in and seems to vanish. Part of it becomes trapped in the accretion disk. 
It takes time for the trapped manor to lose its centrifugal force and fall past the event horizon into the singularity itself. This, to put it simply, is what's causing the black hole to glow. If we switch to a view of escaping radiation only, the black hole would look like a bright beacon at our galaxy's center. Catherine nodded her head in understanding. She knew Andram had simplified his answer so she could understand it. The Alton research scientist was well versed in the structure of the galaxy and its different components. I noticed from our sensor scans that the majority of the wreckage from the battle fought here has already been pulled into the black hole or is very close to it. Yes, answered Andram, shifting his eyes to Catherine. During the battle, the AI ships, as well as their constructions, were knocked out of their orbits. Once that happened, the black hole began pulling them in. There's still a lot of wreckage closer to the black hole that will be pulled in over the next year. We're almost ready for the test, an Alton technician reported to Andram. Andram nodded and motioning for Catherine to follow him. He stepped over to what was obviously the main control console. Miko Lal and Shilum Tore were both seated there, as well as a couple of other Altons she wasn't familiar with. We're going to power up the ring generators, Shilum informed them. This is only a test and will require a minimum amount of energy from the station. The small vortex generating stations had been deployed the day before. I have a probe set to go through the vortex, Miko added, her light blue eyes shifting to the Admiral. I've set the vortex to open in a nearby star system that's only six light years distant. One of our science cruisers, as well as one of Admiral Jackson's strike cruisers, is waiting there to retrieve it once it arrives. Very well, Catherine said. Let's begin the test. The Altons had been careful to notify her earlier about the test. Most of them were beginning to accept her as being in charge of the mission. Each day, the crew was beginning to trust her more and more. Any concern she had of Kelsey, Katie, and Clarissa taking over the distant horizon was rapidly beginning to fade away. The main view screen suddenly switched its orientation and focused on a dark area of space. Catherine thought she could see several of the ring vortex generators, but she wasn't certain. Charging vortex stations, Shilum said, as she pressed several buttons on the console. On the main screen, beams of white energy suddenly shot out to the ten waiting generator stations. Five percent charge, Miko called out, as she watched several small data displays in front of her. Ten percent. Shut it down, Shilum instructed. Satisfied sufficient energy had been transferred. It would take the station two days to replace what they just transferred. They had already learned enough about the station to use its systems to capture power from the black hole. Power transfer shutdown initiated, replied one of the Alton technicians. Shutdown complete. Now let's open up a vortex, she Loom said, with a trace of excitement in her voice. Activating the vortex generators. On the view screen, a sudden glowing white vortex formed. There was only a hint of blue on the outer regions of the anomaly. Probe is entering the vortex, Miko reported. On the screen, a small probe could be seen approaching the glowing vortex. It flew directly into its center, and then moments later, the vortex vanished as the generator shut down. Now what? asked Catherine, looking over expectantly at the Altons. We wait, answered Shilum. Times have been synchronized, and we should know as soon as the probe reaches its target coordinates. How long the transit took? What are you expecting? asked Catherine. She knew these tests were very important to see how accurate they could make their eventual transit. If our hyperspace equations are correct, the transit should have been instantaneous. Catherine nodded. If this test was successful, then in just a few more days, the distant horizon would follow in the probe's wake. However, instead of transiting to a nearby star system, the exploration dreadnought would be going to another galaxy. Chapter 9 One Year Previous The 400-meter destroyer Everest was moving slowly through the outer reaches of a small G-class star system, which showed evidence of a space-going civilization. The destroyer's hull was coated with a composite material, supposedly immune to detection. All of her power emissions were being held to a minimum, with only passive sensors being used. What do we have? asked Captain Wilkins, looking over at Lieutenant Schmidt, who was sitting in front of the ship's sensor console. 
It's definitely a simulant system, Schmidt replied in a low voice. Everyone in the command center had been speaking quietly, almost as if they were fearful of their voices being heard. We expected that, Wilkins said, taking a deep, fortifying breath. This was the seventh system they'd found in the last week that held simulants. It seemed as if this entire sector of space was infested with the dangerous aliens. He wondered what the other three stealth destroyers were finding. If they were discovering the same thing as the Everest, then the simulants were far more widespread and numerous than they had originally believed. There are twelve planets in the system, with two in the liquid water zone, Schmidt continued, as he studied the information coming in on his sensors. The fourth planet is emitting high energy readings, indicating a large industrial as well as population base. The second planet is a little farther out, but it also shows a substantial artificial energy reading. Two planets in one system, spoke Wilkins with a frown, thinking about what type of industrial base that would mean. What about the moons and the asteroids? I'm picking up evidence of heavy mining operations on most of the system's moons, as well as in the asteroid field between planets 7 and 8. Navigation, spoke Captain Wilkins, starting to grow concerned about what he was hearing. Keep us outside the orbit of the ninth planet and stay well away from any gravity wells. If we need to jump, I want to do so quickly. Yes, sir, replied the navigation officer. Captain Wilkins stepped closer to the tactical display, which was rapidly being updated with information from the passive scans. It was full of red thread icons, as well as a number of unidentified objects showing in yellow. What are all those yellow icons? Many of them are cargo ships, Schmidt replied. There are also a number of what appear to be orbiting structures around both of the inhabited planets. Without using our full sensors, I can't be sure. But I would guess they're either space stations or shipyards. Three of them appear to be extremely large. Then they're probably shipyards, Wilkins said in agreement. It would make sense with the high industrial base they had detected. It was becoming quickly apparent from the systems they had visited that the simulans were maintaining a heavy presence in this part of the Triangulum Galaxy. Each one of the systems they had visited had at least one orbiting shipyard, as well as large fleets of their fearsome-looking warships. Wilkins checked the tactical display to see if any were near the Everest's current position. The nearest seemed to be at least 100 million kilometers distant, probably a routine patrol keeping tabs on ship movements in the outer system. There were a lot of yellow icons, which were probably cargo ships moving about. What should we do? asked Lieutenant Rumson, the executive officer. We'll stay in this system for a few more hours, Wilkins said. Then we'll go on to the next target system. Admiral Strong wants a general idea of what's around us in case the simulans discover our base in the nebula. Rumson nodded his head in understanding. There were four of the new stealth destroyers currently out searching space within several hundred light years of the nebula trying to determine just how large the simulant presence was. So far, they'd found seven systems inhabited by the strange alien race, as well as four star systems with planets that showed signs of nuclear bombardment. They hadn't sent any shuttles down to the destroyed worlds, as they knew that simulant scavenger robots were probably on the surface. They also didn't want to risk discovery. Jeremy was on the surface of Gaia, which was what they had named the planet to remind them of Earth. The planet had a narrow habitable band approximately 1,400 kilometers wide around its equator. The temperature in the area was temperate, and a small modern city had been established. It currently held nearly 2,000 humans, 80 Altans, and 60 Carthians. Most of these were families that had requested permission to come down to the surface to live. A small spaceport had been built near the city, as well as a military base to ensure its safety. Jeremy stepped out of his shuttle and took a deep breath of fresh air. It was much different from the air on the Avenger. He could smell the trees and the slight scent of flowers from the nearby forest. The air on the Avenger was missing these comforting elements. We're only ten kilometers from the ocean, Kevin said, as he walked down the shuttle's ramp next to Jeremy. Angela and I came down and stayed at one of the oceanside resorts that had been built. Jeremy eyed Kevin questionably and saw his best friend turn red, almost matching his hair. Nothing happened, uttered Kevin with a sigh. Angela and I are both still hoping that we get rescued some day. We stayed in separate rooms and spent most of our time laying on the beach and reminiscing about past vacations back on Kareth and Nutellus. Those were good days, Jeremy agreed. How did you like the food at the resort? The variety of food at the resorts had always been one of Kelsey's favorite things, 
though Jeremy preferred the different fruit juices. There was one on Nutellus that he had fallen in love with, though it had now been well over five years since he had last tasted it. He would give anything if he could be on that beach with Kelsey right now. It was all right, answered Kevin, with a sad look on his face. They had hamburgers, but the taste wasn't the same. Angela did mention some of the fruit drinks were really good. We should be thankful the fruits and other items we found on this planet are palatable, Jeremy said. Several large farms had been established and were now responsible for providing most of the food for the fleets. Why did you want to come down to the surface, Jeremy? Kevin asked. He had volunteered to accompany his friend because he wanted to get out of the Avenger for a few hours. It was nice to be able to walk around without the metal hull of the ship being the only thing keeping out the harsh vacuum of space. The sun shining down on his face and the gentle breeze felt fantastic. I need to inspect the spaceport and the military facility, Jeremy answered. As time goes by, more and more of our crews are going to want to come down to the surface. If we don't see any signs of rescue in the next few years, we could very easily lose half of our crew members. What would that do to the fleet? Kevin asked, his eyes showing concern. He knew that it wasn't practical to ask people to live out their lives on the orbiting spaceships. There was already a large expansion project going on in the city, as it was expected to grow rapidly over the next few years, as more and more crew members left the ships. Most of our ships are pretty automated, Jeremy said, as he watched a ground vehicle pull up. They had constructed a small number of these to be used in the city, as well as at the spaceport. We can probably get by for a few more years, even with additional people coming down to the surface. We're already using the supply ship's crews to fill in for some of the crew members, as well as helping out at the resorts and farms. Do you think they're coming? Kevin asked, as his eyes shifted to Jeremy. It's been over three years, and we've seen no signs of a rescue attempt. Our entry point has remained empty, with no probes, ships, or even the hint of a vortex. Kevin was beginning to give up hope of ever seeing Katie again. There were several AI ships stationed close to the system they had appeared in. Two AI ships were hiding deep inside the atmosphere of a gas giant, several light years from the system. Stealthed vortex detection buoys had been placed in the system, as well as the surrounding ones so the AIs would know instantly if a rescue ship appeared. So far, other than an occasional simulant vessel, the system had been quiet. I refuse to give up hope, Jeremy answered. I spoke to Tanith and Garen several days ago. Both Altons are convinced their fellow scientists in our galaxy would have realized shortly after the battle that we made the transit successfully. They estimated it would take four to six years before a rescue mission could be properly equipped and launched. The biggest obstacle will be the energy needed to power a hyperspace tunnel, which can reach this galaxy. Of course, the simulants will be waiting for them, Kevin said, worriedly. He knew Kelsey and Katie would be on that mission if it ever did occur. They won't be expecting to be attacked as soon as they make transit. This really worried Kevin, and it was something he thought about often. I've spoken to the command AI, Jeremy said after a moment. The AIs had continued to hold up their end of the agreement, and all of their ships had now been fully repaired and armed with multiple particle beam cannons. The command AI had indicated that they would like to work more closely with the Altans since the ancient race were their creators. They're willing to place more of their ships around the system, in which we think a rescue ship will appear. Why do you say think? Kevin asked as they climbed into the ground car. He had always assumed the system they had exited the vortex in would be the one a rescue mission would appear. Tanith mentioned that even a slight deviation in the angle of entry or in speed could send the rescue mission almost anywhere in this galaxy, Jeremy explained. It has something to do with the power they'll have available to create a hyperspace tunnel. They won't have hundreds of AI capacitor stations supplying energy like we did. You mean they could appear hundreds or even thousands of light years away? Kevin said, incredulously, realizing just how hard it might be for a rescue mission to find them. They might search the galaxy for years and never find the Avenger and her fleet, particularly since they were hiding inside a gaseous nebula. Precisely, Jeremy said as the ground car began moving. Kevin leaned back and was silent. He wasn't sure what to say. From what Jeremy had just said, it seemed very possible he might never see Katie again. Later, Jeremy and Kevin were busy inspecting the small military base. The base had been built to protect the people who had elected to come down and live upon the planet. It wasn't a large base, but it was surrounded with a series of railguns and laser turrets, which were capable of shooting down any inbound missile. 
There were also a number of missile interceptor batteries that could take out a missile entering the atmosphere from low orbit. We have 400 Marines stationed on the planet, Major McGowan informed them. The Major split his time between his duties on the Avenger and seeing that the military base was operating smoothly. What would happen if the Simulans managed to launch an attack? asked Kevin as he looked at the missile battery that was capable of launching Hunter interceptor missiles. The missile tubes of the battery held six of the small deadly missiles. I feel confident we could shoot down anything they send at us, McGowan stated. What if they land troops on the surface, or some of those scavenger robots you encountered? Jeremy asked. He was concerned that the simulants might drop hundreds, or possibly thousands, of the crab-like robots around the city. We have explosive rounds we can use in our assault rifles, McGowan informed them. They should be able to easily take out the scavenger robots. I would also like to request several squadrons of Talon fighters be assigned to the base, as well as one squadron of Anlon bombers. That would give us the capability of taking them out from the air. Jeremy nodded. It sounded like a good idea. I'll speak to Rear Admiral Marks about your suggestion. If we base three squadrons here, we'll have to supply adequate munitions, as well as assign maintenance crews, to keep them flight-worthy. As they continued their tour, they examined the railgun batteries and the twin laser turrets that surrounded the base. Everything was in working order, and the Marines they encountered seemed professional and in good morale. I'm glad to see your Marines are in such good spirits, Jeremy said as they returned to the ground car. They enjoy being out on the surface instead of being cooped up inside a ship, McGowan stated. I'm considering rotating a large number of the Marines we have in the fleets through the base to give them all some time on the ground. We have a lot of Marines up in orbit, Jeremy said. The Avenger herself had a Marine complement of 400. Perhaps it would be a good idea to expand the base and station even more Marines here. We'll have more people coming down over the next few years, predicted Kevin. He had noticed on the Avenger that more people were beginning to pair up. We may want to consider building a second Marine base on the other side of the city. Jeremy nodded. They needed to be able to protect the people on the ground. Major McGowan, check into the feasibility of building another base, or if it would be better to expand this one. Let me know what you would need. I'll see to it, McGowan replied. You'll have my report and recommendations within a week. Several hours later, they were in the shuttle as it climbed back into orbit. They'd gone on a quick tour of the small city, and Jeremy had been greatly impressed by what all had been accomplished. The homes families had built reminded him of the one he and Kelsey had lived in while on Kareth. It was times like this that he felt homesick, and the loneliness from being separated from his wife. I can see one of the new Type 2 battle stations, Kevin said, pointing out the small viewport. We finally got construction of them started. Jeremy acknowledged. We have two of the fleet repair ships building them. Jeremy knew the Altons, along with some human technicians, had redesigned the battle stations. The new ones were 150 meters in diameter and fully self-contained. They had an upgraded energy shield, defensive lasers, and two particle beam cannons. They were also equipped with 12 Devastator III missile tubes and a standard crew of 50. The new stations were powered by a Class III fusion reactor. What about Alton particle beam satellites? Kevin asked. He would feel much more comfortable when the planet was protected by an envelope of those powerful satellites, particularly since particle beams had been the only weapon to be effective against the simulant ships. I spoke to Admiral Cletius, Grayseth, and Dalethon aboard the Clan Protector yesterday about that very subject, Jeremy answered. A production line for the satellites is being set up with the aid of a number of Alton technicians. Dalethon feels they'll be able to go into full production within two weeks. If everything goes as they say it will, they should be able to build 20 satellites per week. We're building a pretty powerful rabbit hole here, Kevin said, after a moment. I just hope all these defenses are never needed. So do I, Jeremy responded as the Avenger came into view. Sometime in the next two weeks, the four stealth destroyers he had sent out would be returning. Perhaps then they would have a better idea of just how strong the simulant presence was around them in this part of the Triangulum Galaxy. The Everest had been scanning the system for hours, and the results of those scans were frightening. The system was heavily industrialized and full of warships. Several simulant fleets had entered the system in the last two hours and seemed to be just waiting. Other simulant fleets had left the vicinity of the shipyards and were on outward-bound trajectories. This behavior was a deep concern to the captain. Do you think they've detected our sensor scans? asked Lieutenant Rumson worriedly. 
I don't like what I'm seeing on the tactical display. I don't see how, Captain Wilkins said, as he walked over to gaze speculatively at the display. That's five fleets we've detected. Over five hundred warships, just in this one system, Rumson said, his eyes showing growing concern. If they're as widespread as it seems, we could be talking about thousands of warships. It's vital we get this information back to Admiral Strong, Wilkins said, taking a deep breath. We'll wait a little bit longer until we see what those fleets are up to. We don't dare do anything to lead them back to the nebula. Do you think we should cancel the survey mission? For a while, or at least until we get the defenses around Gaia finished, Wilkins replied, as he turned and looked over at navigation. Plot us a dogleg course back to the nebula. I think our mission is over. Sir, spoke Lieutenant Schmidt in a louder voice. The Simeon fleets are all opening up vortexes and preparing to jump. Where to? asked Rumson, wondering why all five fleets would be jumping at the same time. Was there a threat in another star system they were reacting to? Before he could say anything else, swirling white vortexes began to open up all around the Everest. Unknown to the crew, when the destroyer had jumped into the simulant system, a small meteorite had impacted the hull, knocking off a small piece of the composite stealth material. Due to sensors and ship systems being down for the first few seconds after coming out of hyperspace, the slight damage had never turned up on the ship systems. They found us, warned Schmidt, his eyes narrowing. Spatial vortexes are opening up in close proximity to the Everest. Raise our energy shield, ordered Wilkins, moving to his command chair and buckling himself in. Take us to Condition 1 and prepare to jump out of here. The ship had been at Condition 2 as they had believed themselves safe from detection. "'Shield is up!' reported Rumson, as he gazed at the ship's main view screen, showing a simulant warship in close proximity to the Everest. "'Simulants are firing!' warned Lieutenant Schmidt, as the Everest shook violently. "'Hyperdrive is offline!' Rumson reported, with panic in his eyes, as he listened to the report from the ship's chief engineer. "'It'll take at least an hour for repairs. "'We're not going to have an hour!' Captain Wilkins said, as he leaned back in his command chair and closed his eyes. He opened them and looked at the crew in the command center. They all knew what this meant. Helm, try to get us away from the simulant ships, ordered Lieutenant Rumson. The Everest had an extremely fast sublight drive. He was hoping they could maneuver the ship out of the enclosing warships and make a run for it. It won't work, Paul, Wilkins said in a soft voice. They'll just jump back in front of us. The Everest vibrated and the hull seemed to ring. Red and amber lights began to glow on the damage control console. The lights dimmed, and then returned to normal. Energy shield is down to 20%, Rumson said, his face turning pale, as he realized they wouldn't be returning to the nebula. I don't think they're trying to destroy us. They seem to be attempting to knock down our shield. They want to know who we are and where our fleets went, Wilkins said with a nod of his head. We can't allow that to happen. Then we only have one choice, Rumson said as he approached the command console where the captain was. We all knew this was a possibility. That's why only crew members with no attachments or strong personal relationships were chosen to operate the four stealth destroyers. I guess we drew the short straw, Rumson said softly, as he entered his command code into the command console. His wife had died years earlier in a vehicle accident, and he had no one else. He was ready to join her. It's been an honor, Captain Wilkins said as he leaned forward and entered his command code into the console. A red light began blinking, and a thirty-second countdown began. The ship shook violently several more times, and the lights dimmed and stayed that way. Energy shield is down, confirmed Lieutenant Schmidt in a steady voice. The simulants are using some type of tractor beam to pull us in. We have served the Federation well, Captain Wilkins said, as he looked at his command crew. He leaned back and closed his eyes knowing they were doing the right thing by not allowing the simulants to retrieve any information from the Everest. In engineering, two ten-kiloton warheads exploded as the ship's self-destruct activated. Twin glowing balls of brilliant light encompassed the Valiant Destroyer as the released nuclear energy vaporized the ship. The simulant ship that was using its tractor beam to pull the Everest toward its docking port was hit by the blast, and a massive hole was ripped into its side. The crew of the Everest had done their duty to ensure the simulants would learn nothing of the location of Admiral Strong and the fleets. Chapter 10
Admiral Race Tolson looked at the view screen as the Warhawk approached the planet Calthan 3. According to captured Hockman data, the planet was inhabited by a pre-Space Age society with rudimentary atomic power. The planet had furnished several different alloys the Hawklands found useful in spaceship construction and was considered to be a minor world in their slaver world network. Hawkland space station is still in orbit, Commander Arnett reported as she examined the data from the ship's sensors. No sign of any Hawkland vessels. Race nodded. He hadn't expected any. Toward the end of the Hawkland War, they pulled nearly all of their ships back toward their core systems. The few that had stayed in the outer regions of the Empire had long since been hunted down by Federation and Alliance warships. There are no power readings coming from the station, added Bryce Cowell, the executive officer. It seems to have been abandoned. Picking up an unidentified contact coming around the far side of the planet, Lieutenant Davis called out, as a red thread icon flared up on the tactical screen. Energy readings suggest the ship is heavily armed. Run it through the ship database and see if you can identify it, ordered Race, leaning forward in his command chair. Madeline, take the fleet to Condition 1. Instantly, alarms began to sound and red lights started flashing. Across the fleet, crews raced to their battle stations. On board the six battle carriers, fighter and bomber squadrons were placed on high alert for possible combat. It's a Shari cruiser, reported Lieutenant Davis. From Hawkland data, the ship is 900 meters long, cylinder-shaped, and armed with energy weapons as well as sublight nuclear missiles. They also supposedly possess a very powerful defensive shield. That description matches the ship the sensors are detecting. Lieutenant Travers, hail the Shari cruiser and ask them what they're doing in former Hawkland space, Race ordered. Most of Third Fleet was already inside the gravity well of the planet, but that didn't concern him, as his ships were equipped with the newer hyperspace drives, which allowed them to jump from inside a gravity well. Lieutenant Travers did as ordered, using the ship's computer to translate the message into something the Shari would understand. They had a complete Shari language base, which they'd obtained from the Hawklands. I'm receiving a response, sir, she said, as the computer quickly translated it. They claim this world is now part of the Shari Empire, and they are ordering us to withdraw immediately. What now, Admiral? Madeline asked with a frown. On the main view screen, a large cylinder-shaped spaceship was being displayed. It was dark and menacing, with numerous energy weapon turrets and small hatches indicating possible missile tubes. It's evident that the Shari have indeed begun moving into former Hawkland space. We pushed them back out, Race said, recalling his orders. Fleet Admiral Nagumo had been very clear in his instructions as to what he expected Third Fleet to do if they encountered Shari vessels. If we allow them to become too well established, it will be a bigger pain later and could lead to all-out war. He looked over at Lieutenant Travers. Put me in contact with the commander of that ship and have the computer translate. He hoped he could avoid a conflict with the Shari, but as one of the proxy races for the AIs, he knew that hope was doubtful. Travers made some adjustment on her console and then turned her head toward the Admiral. Ready, sir. Shari vessel, began Race in a steady and confident voice. I am Admiral Tolson of the Human Federation of Worlds. All former Hawkland space is now under the protection of the Federation and the Alliance, and no infringement of that space will be permitted or tolerated. Your vessel may depart peacefully, but it will depart. No response, reported Travers, as she listened intently. What if they fire at us? Madeline asked, her eyes narrowing. We fire back, answered Race, without hesitation. Captain Daniels, prepare to fire a warning shot across their bow. Use a power beam to show them we're serious. Hit them first with a targeting scan to let them know we mean what we say. This is High Lord Actil of the Shari. A strange, high-pitched voice came over the Admiral's calm. We do not recognize your authority in this sector of space. The Shari Empire has claimed all former Hawkman worlds within 1,000 light years of our empire. Your ships have no right to be here and should withdraw immediately. If you do not, I will summon a Shari war fleet. Race drew a deep breath. He could see he was being forced into making a decision he hoped to avoid. Summon your fleet and we will destroy it, he said. You have one hour to leave the vicinity of this planet. At the end of that hour, I will destroy your ship. High Lord Uktil has cut off communications. Lieutenant Travers informed Race. I'm picking up a hyperspace communications signal. Should I jam it? No replied Race, shaking his head. 
We need to set an example for the Shari, and this system is as good as any other. Do you think we'll have to fight if a Shari fleet appears? Asked Commander Arnett. Madeline hoped they weren't about to drag the Federation into another war. Perhaps, answered Race, leaning back in his command chair. Now we wait and see what happens. The hour was nearly up, and Race was about to give the order to fire a warning shot in front of the bow of the Shari cruiser, when it suddenly began accelerating. The ship headed away from the Federation fleet as it made its way out of the gravity well of the planet. I wonder if they can jump from within a gravity well, asked Commander Arnett as she watched the Shari cruiser rapidly pick up speed. There's no record of it in the Hawkland database, answered Race, shifting his gaze from the computer screen to Madeline. As far as we know, the AIs never shared that technology with any of their proxy races. Our own advanced hyperdrives came from the Altons. What are your orders, Admiral? asked Madeline. She knew there was a good chance the fleet would soon be going into combat. Put the fleet into orbit 50,000 kilometers above the planet. We'll use defensive formation D5 while we wait. If the Shari can't jump into or out of a gravity well, we'll let them come into us. That way, if we need to withdraw, we can safely jump out, leaving them trapped close to the planet. Sounds like a good strategy, Madeline responded, as she moved off to carry out her orders. Race nodded. He had a large fleet reinforced with four Alton battleships. He felt pretty confident he could handle anything the Shari threw at him. But he also knew from fighting the AIs in the Hawklands not to underestimate an enemy. For a little over two days, Third Fleet orbited Calthan III, waiting to see if the Shari were going to put in an appearance. There was a chance High Lord Atkill had been bluffing. They'd also received several radio messages from the planet inquiring as to who they were and if they were the planet's new conquerors. A shuttle with several Altons and humans had gone down to the planet to meet with the representatives of the planetary government to inform them of the current galactic situation. Race had been surprised to discover that the inhabitants had a canine ancestry. Spatial vortex is detected, called out Lieutenant Davis. Put them up on the main view screen, ordered Race, leaning forward, anxious to see if this was the threatened Shari war fleet. On the screen, numerous white vortexes appeared, and cylindrical-shaped ships began to make an appearance. Confirmed, Shari warships, reported Davis, as his sensors put data up on his screens. There are two different types of ships, the cruiser type we saw above the planet earlier, and a large battle cruiser with a length of 1,100 meters. That could be dangerous, commented Commander Arnett, as she watched the Shari ships appearing in the tactical display she was standing by. She was surprised at how rapidly the Shari had responded to Third Fleet's presence. As long as they don't have antimatter or particle beam weapons, we should be fine, Race answered. Have our people down on the planet board their shuttle and return. They should have time before the Shari get within combat range. What's the final tally on the Shari fleet? Asked Madeline, looking over at Lieutenant Davis. Forty-two cruisers and eighteen battle cruisers, Davis reported, as he checked his sensor data. They're forming up into a cone formation and advancing toward the planet. They'll enter the gravity well in three hours. We have time then, Ray said, letting out a deep breath. Take us to condition two. We'll go to condition one when they begin to enter the gravity well. He settled back in his command chair and contemplated the strategy he would use against the inbound fleet. He had 58 warships at his disposal, including eight human and four Alton battleships. The question he was debating was how to win this battle so decisively that the Shari would see the wisdom of staying out of former Hawkland space. He had three huge tactical advantages that he was aware of. Most of his ships were equipped with sublight antimatter missiles as well as particle beam cannons. All of his ships were also capable of jumping from inside the planet's gravity well. Those were three surprises he doubted the Shari would be expecting. For the next several hours, the Shari continued to advance, their sensors reaching out and probing the waiting starships in orbit around Calthan III. They'd heard of these humans and Altons, though they doubted the truth of the stories a few Hawkland ships had spread as they fled into Shari space. The Hawklands had been eliminated, and their ships seized for study. The Shari had refused to accept that the AIs had been defeated and their great project at the Galactic Center destroyed. No ships had been sent into the heart of the galaxy, as the AIs had deemed that area restricted, and severe consequences would fall to any race that violated that edict. It was also worrisome that no AI ships had been spotted in recent years. Shari fleet is entering the planet's gravity well, 
reported Lieutenant Davis. At current speed, they will be in combat range in 43 minutes. Go to Condition 1 and change to Formation A3, Race ordered, as he leaned forward in his command chair. This would put his most powerful warships at the front of a four-layered line. He had decided upon what he considered to be a good strategy to fight this battle. If it worked, it would be over very quickly, and the Shari fleet would be smashed. Activating his minicom, he quickly contacted Rear Admiral Weiler on the battle carrier Saratoga. I want to inflict some serious damage to the Shari fleet, Race began. Admiral Weiler, I want you to have ten squadrons of Anlon bombers ready to deploy, all armed with Shrike missiles. The Shrike missiles had been specifically developed to be launched from bombers and carried a 20 megaton warhead. I plan on firing a full spread of antimatter missiles at the Shari, followed up by our particle beam cannons. The bombers will go in immediately after that to finish off any Shari ships that may have survived the initial attack. Can we expect the Shari to deploy any fighters? asked Admiral Weiler. He didn't want to expose his vulnerable bombers to a fighter attack. Unknown, Race answered. Deploy a suitable amount of fighters as escorts, just in case the Shari do possess that capability. There is nothing in the Hawkland data files to suggest the Shari use fighters or bombers, but the files are quite ambiguous on many items dealing with the Shari Empire. I'll see to it, Weiler replied. We'll be ready to launch in ten minutes. I have a message from a High Lord Commander Marquest, Lieutenant Travers interrupted, as her comm console began translating the incoming message. He's demanding our immediate surrender or he will destroy our fleet. Race allowed himself to smile at the sheer audacity of the Shari High Lord. Inform the High Lord Commander that all former Hawkland-controlled space and the worlds are now under the protection of the Human Federation of Worlds and the Alliance. Message sent, replied Travers. She leaned back and took a deep breath, brushing her black hair back with her left hand. She was expecting an immediate retort from this Shari High Lord, and it wasn't long before it came through. The High Lord Commander says the Shari Empire does not recognize the authority of the Human Federation of Worlds and the Alliance, and strongly recommends that we surrender our fleet before he is forced to destroy it. Very well, Race said with a sigh, knowing they were going to have to do this the hard way. Inform the High Lord Commander that we'll make an example of his fleet as a warning to the Shari Empire to stay within their own space. Lieutenant Travers sent the message and after a moment, turned her head toward the Admiral. The Shari have cut off communications. I'm not surprised, Commander Arnett said. Tactical. Prepare to lock on and fire a full spread of antimatter missiles. Once the missiles have been fired, hit any Shari ship that seems to have suffered damage from the antimatter attack with our particle beams. They're coming into extreme range, reported Captain Daniels from Tactical. We can engage with our antimatter missiles at any time. Madeline looked over inquiringly at the Admiral. She suspected he would want to close the range a little bit more. Another minute, Race said with a nod. I want our particle beam cannons to be able to cause the maximum amount of damage. They're still slightly out of range for that. In space, the two fleets continued to close. The Shari were in an inverted cone formation with their most powerful ships at the apex. The human fleet was advancing in a stacked line four ships high and eleven wide with the light cruisers hanging back, giving cover to the fleet's four supply ships, the two Alton exploration ships, and the hospital ship. The four Alton battleships were mixed in with the center of the line, ready to add their firepower to the rest of the fleet. Shari target scanners detected, called out Lieutenant Davis. They're getting ready to fire, warned Colonel Cowell, who was standing just behind the tactical station. Let's not disappoint them. All ships fire, Race ordered over his minicom, which was set up so he could speak to all of his ship's commanders. From the 40 human ships and the four Alton battleships, missile hatches slid open, and in a brief blur, 432 sublight antimatter missiles seemed to vanish from their tubes to explode microseconds later against the energy shields of the Shari warships. Each missile was capped with a 100 megaton antimatter warhead the most powerful weapon in the arsenal of the Federation in Alton fleets, if the particle beam was not taken into consideration. Across the cone formation of the Shari, massive explosions of energy smashed into their energy screens. They had been expecting missile attacks comprised of nuclear warheads similar to their own, not these hell weapons tearing against their straining energy shields. 
In moments, shield after shield began to go down. In many cases, the now vulnerable ships were pummeled by the hundreds of megatons of energy that was disrupting their shields. In stunning explosions of light, Shari warships began to die. Incoming fire, warned Lieutenant Davis, as the hard-hit Shari fleet struggled to hit back with what weapons they could. Nuclear explosions began to go off against human and Alton shields, but they were much weaker than what had struck the Shari. Twenty to thirty megaton yields, reported Colonel Cowell as he studied the data on a screen next to the main tactical console. Eighteen Shari ships confirmed destroyed, added Commander Arnett. She looked over at the Admiral from where she was standing next to one of the tactical displays. They weren't expecting antimatter missiles, at least not of the magnitude we hit them with. It's a mistake they're about to pay for deeply, replied Race grimly. All ships, fire particle beam cannons. Admiral Weiler, launch your bomber strike. Race took a deep breath. He knew the Shari were outmatched by the Federation and Alton ships, but they must be taught a hard lesson about encroaching into space, now protected by the Federation and the Alliance. He also found it difficult to take pity on them, as he knew they had served as a proxy race for the AIs and had thousands of slave planets under their control in their empire. The Warhawk shuddered slightly as several nuclear missiles detonated against her powerful energy shield. The ship shrugged off the missile attacks as if they were nothing more than a nuisance. Other ships in the attacking formation did the same. No weapon the Shari were using posed a serious threat to the Federation or Alton ships. They were designed to be able to stand up to 1,500-meter AI spheres. The Federation formation was lit up by the multiple explosions of nuclear ordnance. The human and Alton ships fired back with their deadly particle beam cannons. The bright blue beam struck wavering Shari shields and easily penetrated carving deep glowing holes into the armor and ship interiors. More explosions rattled the Shari, as ten more of their warships died in a series of blasts, which left the Shari cone formation shattered. Bomber strike is going in, reported Commander Arnett, as two hundred small green icons flew across the space between the embattled fleets. Shari are using energy weapons against the Anlons. Race nodded. He knew the Anlons had a forward shield and should be able to handle at least one hit from the Shari energy weapons. He watched intently as the green icons weaved and danced in a pattern designed to make hits to the Anlons more difficult. Even with the expert piloting, several of the small icons flared up and died as Shari energy weapons struck home, vaporizing the small bombers. Missile release, spoke Commander Arnett, as hundreds of small yellow icons suddenly appeared and arrowed toward the remaining Shari ships. She knew each Anlon bomber was carrying two self-targeting Shrike missiles. Race turned his eyes toward the main view screens. The Shrike missiles didn't have sublight drives like the Devastators or the Antimatter missiles, so it took them a few seconds to cross the space between the Anlon bombers and Shari warships. During that time, the Shari turned all of their available weapons on the inbound missiles. Missile after missile flared up and died in small bright flashes of light. Evidently, the Shari had smaller energy turrets dedicated primarily to defense. Out of 400 inbound missiles, they'd managed to knock down 172. The other missiles arrived at their targets and smashed into already weakened Shari energy shields. Shields collapsed and more Shari ships began to die as nuclear energy vaporized hulls and destroyed ship interiors. Twelve more Shari ships are down, spoke Lieutenant Davis, as more red threat icons vanished from his sensors. They're trying to withdraw, Colonel Cowell said, pointing at one of the tactical displays. Most of their remaining ships are heavily damaged, added Commander Arnett. Madeline knew some of those Shari ships were nearly wrecks, and it was doubtful if they'd be able to make the jump into hyperspace. All ships hold fire, Race ordered. He wanted this shattered Shari fleet to return home and tell their empire what the humans and the Altons had done to them. It might be just enough to discourage further encroachments into former Hawkland space. Should we follow them? asked Madeline, looking over at the Admiral. Yes, Race replied, but we'll keep our distance. For the next hour, the fleet followed the Shari ships, staying just out of weapons range. Several of the fleeing vessels docked to one another in obvious attempts to remove crews. Then, after separating... The damaged vessels exploded as nuclear charges were set off. That's four vessels they've scuttled, reported Colonel Cowell, as another Shari vessel exploded on one of the view screens. That's 44 of their ships out of 60, added Commander Arnett. 
I don't think the Shari High Lord Commander will be very well received when he gets home and reports what happened to his fleet. Let's just hope we've prevented a war and the Shari will stay in their own territory from now on, Race responded, as he leaned back and allowed himself to relax. Shari ships are opening up spatial vortexes and jumping out, reported Lieutenant Davis. In a few minutes, all Shari ships had vacated the system, leaving Third Fleet in complete control. What were our losses? asked Race, looking over at Commander Arnett. Very light, considering the number of Shari ships we destroyed, reported Madeline. The battleship Ajax reports minor hull damage and the loss of two defensive laser turrets. The battlecruisers Duchess and Anvil have several small hull breaches, which should be repaired shortly. The strike cruiser Longhorn has the most damage. A missile managed to get through its energy screen, and they have heavy damage on the port side of the vessel. They're streaming atmosphere and have a number of fires they're still dealing with. They should have the fires out and a thorough damage assessment ready shortly. What about the Anlon bombers? Race knew some of those had been lost, as he had witnessed their deaths in the tactical display, as well as on the ship's view screens. Admiral Weiler reports the loss of 12 Anlon bombers, answered Madeline. Several more were damaged, but are repairable. Four of the pilots managed to eject and have been recovered. Very well, Race replied, as he thought over Third Fleet's next move. We need to continue to make our presence known in this region of space. We'll take six hours to repair our battle damage and see what can be done about the Longhorn. Then we'll jump to the next inhabited planet in this sector. Do you think the Shari will challenge us again? I expect so, Race replied with a sigh. I don't think they'll give up this region of space over one battle. We may have to prove to them several times that our technology and weapons are far superior when compared to theirs. We're fortunate the AIs didn't allow their proxy races to develop more advanced weapons, Commander Arnett said. She knew the AIs had preferred that their proxy races fight with mid-level technology to ensure they could never turn on their AI masters. Let's just hope our luck in that regard continues to hold, Ray said, raising his eyebrow. With the AIs out of the picture... The remaining slaver races may begin to develop more dangerous weapons. Madeline nodded. She knew the Admiral was probably correct. At some point in time, the Federation and the Alliance would likely have to fight a more advanced enemy than what they face now. But that was probably a long time from now. For the present, Federation and Alton science were supreme and should stay that way for the foreseeable future. In hyperspace, High Lord Commander Marquest was feeling anger at what had been done to his fleet. The Empire had heard rumors of the fantastic weapons these humans supposedly possessed. His fleet had learned the hard way that those rumors were true. He would return to the Empire and make his report. The Empire had larger warships at its disposal, as well as thousands of ships. At some point in time, he knew the Shari and the humans would go to war. But not now. Not until the Empire was ready and could confirm whether the AIs were truly gone or still present at the Galactic Center. Marquess knew that for the short term, the Empire would probably withdraw from all former Hawkland space. It would put the humans off guard until the Empire was ready. When that time came, the humans would find the Shari would not be so easy to defeat in combat a second time. Chapter 11 Kelsey was sitting at her navigation station, gazing anxiously at the large view screen in front of her. She felt as if all she had to do was reach out and she could touch the stars. However, she knew the command center was buried deep inside the forward section of the distant horizon. There were nearly 300 meters of corridors, compartments, and battle armor between her and the outer hull. In front of her, tens of thousands of stars glowed steadily shining their light upon the ship. Here, at the galactic center, the star density averaged less than one light week in separation. The space around Sagittarius A, the black hole, was filled with a myriad of stars. Kelsey knew if the right filters were applied to the view screen, she would be able to see a lot of red and even some blue giants. These were truly massive stars, which still managed to exist in close proximity to the black hole. There were also some fiery filaments full of hot young stars, still in the process of forming. The death and birth of stars was a steady process at the galactic center. It's an awesome sight, Andrum said, as he stepped forward and adjusted the filters on the screen to show all the magnificent colors of the various stars. The view was now nearly overwhelming due to the millions of stars within just a few thousand light years. 
The galactic center is a hotbed for star formation and will continue to be for quite some time. We have several science ships busy studying the stars close to the black hole. There is so much to learn here. The last probe has been sent through, Kelsey said, looking over at Andrum. If the results from it are the same as the others, we'll attempt to transit sometime tomorrow. I'm sure you and Katie are more than ready to go rescue your husband, Andrum said, understanding the strong motivation the two women had to complete this mission. Even among Alton's, love was a very powerful force. I don't expect any problems, Clarissa said, as she suddenly appeared next to Andrum. The other four probes all made the transit instantaneously, and we've adjusted the jump calculations accordingly. The last probe was off less than two meters, and that was for a jump of ten light years. I believe this one will be off only a few centimeters. Once we get the data back, we'll make the final calculations for the transit. I just hope we're ready, Kelsey said, her deep blue eyes looking at the stars. Somewhere out there was the Triangulum Galaxy, where Jeremy and the Lost Fleets were waiting. Katie and she had long awaited this, and Kelsey was finding it hard to believe that it was nearly time to go in search of the Avenger. We've adjusted the hyperspace navigation equations to account for speed and drift, Clarissa informed them. She put her hands on her shapely hips and stood for a moment as if contemplating. If the latest equations are correct, we should exit the jump into the Triangulum Galaxy within one million kilometers of our targeted exit point. That's acceptable for a hyperspace transit of nearly three million light years, Andrum said appreciatively. She Loom is quite confident we can make the jump without difficulties. Kelsey closed her eyes, knowing that sometime within the next week, she might once more be in Jeremy's arms. Four years of hard work and coercing Cirrus and the Altons into building the distant horizon were about to pay off. If all went as planned, the Special Five would once more be together. Catherine was in her quarters, trying to think of what she needed to say to her father. She wanted to send him a message before the distant horizon attempted the hyperspace transit to the Triangulum Galaxy. She knew there was a chance this might be the last message her father would ever receive from her. On the computer screen was half a page of text she had managed to come up with so far. She thought back to her growing up and the time she had spent with her father. On numerous occasions, he had taken her to fancy dinners and gatherings as he rose up the ranks in his political career. Her mother had died at a very young age, and many times she'd been left on Cirrus with her mother's parents while her father was away on some diplomatic mission. Those times when he had been at home with her were very special. Putting her fingers on the touch keyboard projected on the surface of her desk, she began typing again. Very slowly, the words came to her. She told her father how much she loved him and how she would always treasure those special times they'd spent together. After several minutes, she was satisfied with what she had written and ended it, promising she would return no matter how long it took. Clarissa? Catherine said aloud. Instantly, the AI appeared in front of her desk. Yes, Admiral? Send this message to my father on Cirrus. It's a good message, Clarissa said, as she activated the ship's hyperspace transmitter and sent the message. It would be relayed through a number of hyperspace communication satellites between the Galactic Center and the Human Federation of Worlds. Your father must be very proud of you. I hope so, Catherine answered. Admiral, the information from the last probe transit has just arrived. The probe exited the spatial vortex within eight centimeters of its designated coordinates. Shilum and I will shortly be making the final adjustments to the hyperspace equations. Then we're ready, said Catherine, taking a deep breath. Tomorrow we make the intergalactic transit to the Triangulum Galaxy. Ariel and the others will be waiting, predicted Clarissa confidently. I'm sure they've been expecting and waiting for us to come for them. Let's hope so, Catherine replied. There were so many questions waiting to be answered, and perhaps tomorrow they would learn the answers to some of them. The next afternoon, Catherine was in the command center, sitting in her command chair as Kelsey and she Loom checked over the hyperspace equations one final time. The entire crew was on the edge as they prepared to activate the vortex ring and make the intergalactic transit. I sent a message to my parents this morning, Commander Grissom said, as she watched the activity in the command center. We've sent a lot of hyperspace messages in the last 24 hours. I know, Catherine replied with a knowing look. I think most of us have sent messages saying goodbye, just in case this doesn't turn out as we hope. What do you think the odds are of us making it back? 
Anne asked, her eyes focusing on the admiral. Probably less than fifty-fifty. Catherine responded with a deep sigh. We're going off into the unknown, and there's no guarantee we'll find Admiral Strong in the missing fleets. Without their construction capability, it'll take us years to build the energy collection stations we'll need to make the jump back. I hope he's there waiting for us, Anne said. The Lost Fleets have four fleet repair vessels, as well as the Carthian's mobile shipyard. They can build almost anything, given sufficient time. It's been over four years. Catherine reminded the commander. There's no way to tell where they might have gone off to in that time. All we can hope for is that they left some type of message in the vicinity of the vortex they came out of, to tell us where they went. We're nearly ready, Admiral, Andrum said, as he stepped over closer to the command console. Shilum and Kelsey have confirmed the hyperspace equations and set up the jump coordinates in the ship's navigation computer. We can commence whenever you're ready. Catherine looked around the command center, noting the anxiety and tension on the faces of many of the crew. She knew this was probably true for nearly everyone on the ship. The longer they delayed, the worse it was going to get. Taking a deep breath, she activated her minicom, which would allow her to address the entire ship. Crew of the distant horizon, she began. She paused and then continued. In a few minutes, we will attempt the first planned intergalactic transit by a Federation ship. We have a good ship and a good crew, and I expect the transit to come off successfully and without any problems. We'll soon find ourselves in another galaxy, and with a little luck, we'll find Admiral Strong in the Lost Fleets. They've been waiting four years for us to come find them and bring them back home. We will not let them down. The ship will be going to Condition 2 momentarily, and shortly after that we'll make the transit. Catherine switched off her minicom and leaned back in her command chair. She felt some anxiety about what was soon to happen. Once they made the transit, they'd be cut off from the Federation, and everything they were familiar with. Beginning to regret taking this command? Asked Commander Grissom softly. She knew the Admiral was under a lot of pressure. No, replied Catherine, shaking her head. This is what Admiral Tellick would have wanted me to do. I believe you're right, Anne responded, fully understanding the Admiral's loyalty to her former commander. Admiral Tellick was a great man, and you were fortunate to be able to serve with him. Shilum. Are we ready? asked Catherine, looking at the Alton hyperspace scientist. Yes, Admiral, Shilum responded. The capacitor station is ready to charge the vortex ring when you give the word. Clarissa, line the ship up for transit, Catherine ordered. In order to make the transit as planned, only Clarissa could navigate the ship as precisely as was going to be necessary. Activating her minicom, she transmitted a message to Admiral Jackson aboard the station. Admiral Jackson, you may begin charging the vortex generators to full power. Good luck, Admiral Barnes, Jackson replied. Activating power feeds now. On the large view screen, ten beams of pure energy flashed out to the waiting vortex generators. The generators drank heavily of the sudden influx of energy as their power banks were quickly charged to the maximum. Activate the vortex generators, ordered Catherine, her eyes glued to the view screen. She could feel her breathing quicken and her heart beating faster. Sending the activation command, Miko replied, as she sent the computer commands to activate the generators. The generators had already been aligned so they would form a hyperspace tunnel between the galactic center and the Triangulum Galaxy when linked with the special hyperspace drive on the distant horizon. On the view screen, a swirling white spatial vortex suddenly appeared. It was very similar to the one which had swallowed the Avenger and the Lost Fleet. The only difference being, this one was much smaller and under control of the distant horizon. Drawing in a sharp breath, Catherine spoke the words everyone was waiting to hear. Clarissa, take us through the vortex. It's time to find our lost fleet. Clarissa was standing to the Admiral's left, and without hesitation, she sent the ship accelerating toward the waiting vortex. She activated the distant horizon's hyperspace drive, linking it to the already established vortex. The ship was flying on a carefully calculated course, which couldn't be deviated from by even one millimeter, or a fraction of a kilometer in speed. Just as they were about to enter the vortex, a one-chance-in-a-million incident occurred. A piece of space junk from the Great Battle came hurtling around the vortex, and before Clarissa could do anything, it rammed the engine section of the Avenger just as the ship entered the vortex. The space junk was less than a meter in diameter, but it was just enough to jar the distant horizon's course by a few millimeters. On board the ship, alarms had just begun to sound when the ship made its transition into hyperspace. On the main screen, 
the familiar deep purple colors of hyperspace appeared, but they seemed to be swirling much more violently than normal. Catherine heard the alarms and felt the gut-wrenching sensation of jumping into hyperspace. The sensation lasted much longer than normal, and for a moment, she felt as if she was going to pass out. Gripping the armrest on her command chair, she took several deep breaths and then looked over at Clarissa, who had a look of panic in her eyes. What was that? Why did those alarms go off? A small piece of wreckage came around the vortex at the last second, Clarissa said in a worried voice. We didn't detect it because of the vortex, and it hit the aft section of engineering. It was very small and didn't cause any damage, but it did have a minuscule effect on our course. How minuscule? Catherine demanded, her eyes widening in worry. She knew any variation in speed or their course could cause them to exit the vortex hundreds or even thousands of light years from their planned exit point. Only a few millimeters, Clarissa replied, as she computed the effect of the collision on the distant horizon. How will that affect our arrival in the Triangulum Galaxy? We'll have to compute it, Shilum said. She had been listening to the conversation. Was our speed affected at all, Clarissa? No, just our course. I guess we'll know in a few minutes, Commander Grissom said with narrowed eyes. Admiral, the ship is currently at Condition 2. I recommend we go to Condition 1 immediately, in case we come out of the vortex in hostile space. I agree, Catherine replied. She had hoped to come out of the vortex and find some of the ships from the Lost Fleets waiting to greet them, or at least a message buoy. Now, all that might have been lost by the collision. Moments later, Condition 1 alarms began sounding and red lights started flashing. Commander Grissom made the announcement over the ship's comm system for the crew to go to Condition 1. Because of the collision, the mission had taken on a more serious undertone. Katie stared at Clarissa, feeling her heart pounding in her chest. Already, Miko and she were trying to see what the small collision might have done to the distant horizon's course. Katie had so been hoping when they exited the vortex to see the Avenger and the lost fleets waiting for them on the view screen. She now knew that hope had flown out the window because of a small piece of space junk. How bad is it? Katie asked as Miko hurriedly ran some calculations through the ship's computer. Not good, Miko answered in a low voice. The piece of debris hit the ship in the worst possible place. It struck 40 meters from the rear of the ship, and while it only deflected the ship a few millimeters, that deflection is growing due to where we were struck. My latest computer simulations are showing that the deflection is slowly increasing, and we are now over four centimeters off course. Clarissa, Katie said, turning toward the AI, who had come over to stand beside her. Clarissa had a heartbroken look upon her face. It's my fault, Clarissa said in her youthful voice, her eyes looking as if she were about to cry. I should have detected the space junk and blasted it with one of our energy turrets. There wasn't time, Miko said. It came around the vortex just as we were about to enter. You didn't have time to power up a weapon and fire it. How long until we exit the vortex? Katie asked. Less than a minute, Clarissa replied. As soon as we do, we'll know how far off course we are. How bad can it be? A variation of a few centimeters over three million light years could translate to several thousand light years away from our planned exit point, Clarissa said in a depressed voice. She felt as if she had let Kelsey and Katie down. There should have been some way for her to prevent what had happened. After all, she was an AI and could think far faster than any human or even Alton. Thirty seconds to vortex termination, spoke Shilum as she studied some data on the computer screen. Angle of deflection is continuing to increase. All crews stand by for vortex emergence, Catherine announced over the ship's comm. A number of crew members had passed out upon entering hyperspace and were still in the process of recovering. She strongly suspected the exit from the vortex was going to be just as rough as the entry. Ten seconds to termination, Shilum spoke as she braced herself for the effects of exiting hyperspace. Jump termination, she said, as she felt that horrible wrenching sensation in her stomach as the ship dropped back into normal space. Catherine felt extremely nauseous, and then the feeling faded as she took several deep breaths, forcing herself to stay focused. She looked at the view screen. Hundreds of unwinking stars looked back. Sensors, she said, shifting her gaze to Captain Reynolds. Any contacts? Sensors are beginning their scans, Reynolds reported in a hoarse voice. We should know something shortly. He kept his eyes focused on the sensor data screens as the ship's powerful sensors reached farther and farther out. No contacts in our immediate vicinity, he reported after a moment. Sensors are clear out to 200 million kilometers. We're in a star system. 
Data should be appearing on the tactical display shortly. How far off are we? Asked Catherine, looking over at Clarissa, who was still standing by the main computer console. The star formations on the view screen don't match those of our planned entry point, stated the AI as she began running a stellar identification search. I will have to identify some locator stars to determine exactly how far we are from where we want it to be. Locator stars were massive stars or even star clusters that could be used to determine the distant horizon's location in the Triangulum Galaxy. I'll help, Andrum said, as he sat down at the computer console and began calling up external views of the stars around the distant horizon. After a few minutes, he turned back toward Admiral Barnes. We are definitely not near the galactic center or a majority star cluster. I would make an estimate that we're at least 10,000 light years off course. I concur, added Clarissa as she finished her observations. I would put us at 11,210 light years from our planned entry point into this galaxy. Clarissa is correct, Andrum said with a confirming nod. We're in a small M-class star system. Detecting three planets in distant orbits, Captain Reynolds informed them. Two are gas giants and the third is similar to Mars. But the planet is frozen over, and there are probably lakes of liquid methane on the surface. Catherine nodded as she thought over the situation. The system was obviously not one prone to possess life of any sort, at least not any type that they would be familiar with. What condition is the ship in? she asked, shifting her gaze to Commander Grissom. All departments report normal operating conditions, Anne responded. She had been listening to the different departments in the ship report in over her minicom. We do have quite a few crew members impaired at the moment from the transition into and back out of hyperspace. Dr. Keel feels everyone should be fully recovered within the hour, though she's having the worst cases brought to the med bay for treatment. Clarissa and Andrum, if the two of you will do a search of nearby star systems, I would like to see if we can find some star-traveling civilizations in our immediate vicinity. If there are, perhaps there's a chance they've heard about our missing fleets. As you wish, Admiral, Andrum answered. We're currently activating our primary sensor array, which will extend our scanning distance to ten light years. If there are any space-traveling races nearby, we'll find them. If you don't mind, Admiral, spoke up Shilum, I would like to go to engineering and check out our new hyperdrive. Engineer Jalad reports he detected some aberrations in the drive function during our transit, and he would like me to help him make the necessary adjustments. Betrin Jalad was the assistant chief engineer as well as an Alton. Very well, Catherine said. See to it, and let me know when the adjustments have been made. I don't want to enter hyperspace again until we're certain the drive is functioning properly. I don't believe the problems with the drive would pose any danger for short jumps, Shilum responded as she headed toward the hatch. Take us to condition two, Catherine ordered, as there was no imminent threat to the distant horizon. Commander Grissom. Launch ten of the defense globes and put them out at 10,000 kilometer perimeter. Let's get a CSP out also. I don't want to be taken by surprise in unknown space. The defense globes were a new development. They were similar to the particle beam satellites used for the defense of planets, but with some major modifications. The globes were 10 meters in diameter with a miniaturized sublight drive. They possessed an energy shield and two dual particle beam turrets for defense, as well as offense. The defense globes were also equipped with an experimental ion cannon capable of bringing down an enemy's energy shield. In a worst-case scenario, the globe's fusion reactor could be overloaded to generate a 10-megaton explosion. The distant horizon was equipped with 60 of these, and they could be deployed rapidly from the ship's two flight bays. Major Carl Arkels was the CAG for the distant horizon. He was standing on the control center for the ship's two large flight bays. Inside the bays were 60 Talon fighters and 40 Anlon bombers. He also had a hand-picked group of experienced pilots. Launch the CSP, he ordered, as he stood just behind the consoles that controlled the flight bays. Echo 1 launching, came Captain Lacey Sanders' voice over the comm system as her Anlon fighter exited the bay. Close behind her, three more fighters launched. They would form up into pairs and patrol the near perimeter around the ship. Lacey was now the commander of Echo Squadron. For a while, she and Carl had become romantically involved, and they still cared for each other. However, for the sake of their careers, they had decided to back off in the relationship for the immediate future. Lacey looked out her cockpit window, feeling awe at the massive starship she was flying next to. At 2,600 meters, it was by far the largest warship the Federation and Altons had ever built. 
Though the Altons would claim it was more of an exploration ship, she saw Echo 2 form up next to her and nodded in satisfaction. She had a well-trained squadron and knew they were ready to face anything this galaxy might throw at them. Little did she know that shortly they would be facing a menace far more deadly than the Hawklands or the AIs had been. This was the Triangulum Galaxy, and it was not a hospitable place to be. Chapter 12 Back in the Galactic Center, Admiral Jackson shook his head as he watched the view screen for the umpteenth time. It was a high-resolution view of the distant horizon as it entered the vortex. Just as the nose of the ship started to enter the Ring of Light, a small object swept around the vortex and impacted the ship on its stern. How did we miss that? demanded Jackson as he looked at the others in the capacitor station with him. Why didn't our sensors pick it up? It was moving at almost 1,500 kilometers per second, replied one of the Altons from a science station. Speeds of that level are necessary to stay in orbit around the black hole. When the vortex activated, it interfered with our ship's scanners. The distant horizon was fortunate it was only a glancing blow, and in a very heavily armored section of the ship. If that had been a direct collision, the hull could have been compromised, and the ship could have been deflected off its course even more. Admiral Jackson let out a deep sigh of regret. He was going to have to send a message back to the Federation, and Admiral Nagumo, as well as Governor Barnes, about what had transpired. Did they at least make it to the Triangulum Galaxy? Yes answered another of the Alton scientists. However, their exit point would have shifted, and they could have come out of the vortex, thousands of light years off course. At least the ship is designed for exploration, Jackson said, drawing in a deep breath. They'll just have to find their way back to where Admiral Strong and his fleets entered that galaxy. I wish I had better news to send. This is going to upset a number of very important people. Jackson had been assigned to the Galactic Center. For the foreseeable future, a Federation in Alton presence would be kept at the capacitor station. His fleet was going to be doubled in size, and a luxury liner was sent to allow his crew some recreation. The Federation had placed a high priority on the success of the rescue mission, particularly since the public found out about it and support had swelled. The capacitor station had become a key asset to the Federation. At the moment, it was the only thing big enough to generate the type of power. Another rescue attempt would require... However, Admiral Jackson strongly suspected there would be a lot of resistance to a second rescue attempt if no word was heard from this one, at least in the short term. Of course, that was the problem. There was no way for the distant horizon to send a message back. The only way they would ever know if the mission had succeeded was when it returned with the lost fleets. On Macon, former Fleet Admiral Heaton Streth awoke with a piercing headache. He sat up and his hands went immediately to his head. He moaned loudly and took several long, deep breaths to slow his pounding heart. He massaged his brow, wanting the throbbing pain to go away. Did you have another premonition? asked Janice, sitting up and looking at her husband with deep concern. She knew he often got severe headaches any time he had one. Yes, Heaton replied as he lay back down and tried to relax. I saw the distant horizon. There was a problem as it went through the vortex at the galactic center. They arrived in the Triangulum Galaxy, but they're way off course, and it will take them weeks to get where Jeremy is. They're in extreme danger, and I don't know if they can survive. What kind of danger? asked Janice, laying down and turning on her side to face Hayden. A great threat, far more dangerous than the AIs, he answered, as his breathing slowed back down. All I know for sure is that the fate of our galaxy and many others depends on the Special Five being reunited. Are they all still alive? Janice asked in a lower voice, almost afraid of hearing the answer. For now, they are, Heaton replied, his face pale from his headache. But they all face imminent danger, and I don't know if they'll be able to survive what's ahead. Is there anything we can do to help? Janice asked. She knew if there was any way possible to go to their aid, Heaton would move the stars to accomplish that. No, Heaton answered in a remorseful voice. They will find their own destiny, and hopefully save ours at the same time. There's nothing more we can do for them. And you still believe they won't make it back to our galaxy? No, answered Heaton. In all three of my premonitions, I didn't see them returning.
Governor Barnes was in his office meeting with Admiral Kalin. They should have made the jump by now. He spoke in a heavy voice. Three million light years into an unexplored galaxy. Admiral Strong and his fleets will be there, Admiral Kalin said, with confidence in his voice. Admiral Tellick believed in Jeremy, and so do I. If anyone could have survived, it would have been him. In time, they'll build the energy gathering stations that will be necessary for a return trip. You will see Catherine again. I hope so, the governor replied with a troubled look in his eyes. I didn't realize how badly I was going to miss her. In all of her other deployments, at least I could send her a message or knew for sure where she was. It's different this time. This is what she wanted, Kalin responded in an even voice. She's a fine officer, and I have all the confidence in the world in her abilities. She will find Admiral Strong and his fleets, and someday bring them home. Governor Barnes nodded. All he could do now was put his trust in Catherine's abilities. Admiral Tellick had believed in her, and so did he. Jeremy was in the command center of the Avenger in high orbit around Gaia. He let out a deep sigh, realizing over four long years had passed since they'd arrived in the Triangulum Galaxy. Down on the planet, the small city was continuing to grow. Nearly 10,000 humans, 200 Altans, and 90 Carthians had moved down to the surface and begun families. I just finished speaking to Rear Admiral Marks, spoke General Charles McGowan. Jeremy had promoted Charles to the rank of general and put him in charge of all the fleet's marines. How does she like our latest fighters? Jeremy asked. A new construction bay had been added to the clan protector, and it was now capable of turning out Talon fighters, as well as Anlon bombers. Jeremy wasn't sure in its new configuration whether the ship would ever be capable of entering hyperspace again. She's quite satisfied with the new squadrons, General McGowan replied. We're moving some of the older fighters and bombers down to the planet to our two military installations. They'll greatly enhance our defensive capability. Do we have enough pilots? Jeremy asked. In the last year, the request to be transferred to the surface had greatly increased. So far, he still had sufficient crews to operate all the ships, but he strongly suspected that wouldn't last much longer. Fortunately, I haven't had many Marines request to leave the service. We can train the necessary pilots, and we'll have the squadron's combat ready within two months. Jeremy nodded as his gaze shifted to the large view screens at the front of the command center. He had grown used to seeing the planet Gaia on the screens. Every day, it was starting to seem more like home. In the past year, the two fleet repair ships had built 26 of the modified Type II battle stations, these were in overlapping orbits to give sufficient defensive coverage to the entire planet. The crux of his defense were the Alton particle beam satellites. Slightly over 1,100 of them were in low orbit over the planet, each armed with a powerful particle beam cannon, which could be used to knock down incoming missiles or enemy attack ships. The final plans called for 40 of the Type II stations and 1,500 of the particle beam satellites. The Type II stations had been turned over to the Marines, and General McGowan was seeing to it that sufficient crews were trained and placed on board as rapidly as possible. It had meant removing Marines from the orbiting ships, but the battleships and battle cruisers could easily get by with half of the Marines originally assigned. General McGowan was tying all of the defenses into a control and command center, which was being built in a bunker deep beneath the surface of Gaia. At the moment, he had a four-part plan of defense and offense. The first line was, of course, the powerful battle stations, followed by the particle beam satellites. After that, he had ten squadrons of Talon fighters to intercept any inbound targets, which got past the orbital defenses. If that failed, his two military installations had railguns, laser turrets, and hunter missiles to take out any leakers. If it came to ground combat, he had five squadrons of Anlon bombers and slightly over 1,200 marines to repel any invasion. Jeremy, interrupted Ariel, excitedly, as she suddenly appeared in front of the command console. I just received a priority message from one of the AI ships deployed at Hantel 7. They report activation of the vortex in the Sigma system. What? uttered Jeremy, leaning forward in his command chair in shock. The Sigma system was the star system the Avenger and her fleets had appeared in when they made the unexpected transit to this galaxy. They'd been watching it from afar, hoping the Federation would mount some type of rescue mission. Did anything come through? No, Ariel replied. 
Her dark eyes focused intently on Jeremy. It activated for nearly a minute and then collapsed. The AIs have confirmed that no ship exited the vortex. It has to be a rescue attempt, General McCown stated, his face showing excitement. Jeremy, Kevin said, as he came running into the command center. Did Ariel give you the news? Angela came hurrying in right behind Kevin. Both looked at Jeremy expectantly. Nothing's come through yet, he replied, as he thought about what needed to be done. The simulans are certain to respond to the activation of the vortex. By now they'll have fleets on the way. Jeremy, it's bound to be Kelsey and Katie. We can't leave them to the simulans. They have no idea what they're jumping into. Kevin looked frantic as he thought about what could happen. This might have just been a test to see if they could establish the vortex. Next time, they may come through in a ship. I know, answered Jeremy, as his mind weighed their options. They needed to move quickly or this rescue attempt, if that's what it was, could fail. Ariel, how close do we need to be in order to reach a ship that exits the vortex before the simulants can fire upon it? The vortex creates a lot of interference in its vicinity, as we experienced when we came through, Ariel replied, recalling how they'd lost power. I don't think the simulants will risk coming too close until after the vortex collapses and there's no danger of a backwash of energy. We would need to be within two to three light years of the Sigma system if we want to reach them in time. The simulants can probably detect us at that range, Jeremy said, looking concerned. It was going to be next to impossible to position a large fleet close enough to the Sigma system to do any good. Jeremy, Ariel said, looking thoughtful, as she thought about what might be coming through the vortex. Clarissa and I were in the process of designing an exploration ship for us to use once the war with the A.I.s and the Hawklands was over. I'm aware of that, Jeremy replied. They'd all discussed going off exploring once the fighting was finished. I believe that Clarissa, Kelsey, and Katie would have built that ship, Ariel continued. It will have a very powerful defensive energy screen, and if the Altons have been involved, it'll be heavily armed as a precautionary measure. I believe it will have at least the firepower of an Alton battleship. What are you saying, Ariel? Angela asked, her eyes focusing on the AI. I think they'll be able to escape the simulants, Ariel answered. Their first reaction will be to jump to safety. If we're waiting close by, we can see where they jump to and go meet them. That's a risk, Jeremy said, not wanting to endanger Kelsey and Katie, but he didn't see what else they could do. Ariel was right, though. Kelsey and Katie would come through in the most powerful ship they could build. We'll assemble a task force of ships and set out immediately, Jeremy said, reaching a decision. We have hyperspace detection buoys emplaced in all of the surrounding systems, so we should be able to tell where they jump to. I hope this works, Kevin said, worrying about Katie's safety. It felt strange to know that shortly, his wife might be in the Triangulum Galaxy. It had been over four years and seemed much longer. Ariel, put me in contact with Rear Admiral Marks, Admiral Cletius, Grayseth, and the Command AI. We have plans to make, ordered Jeremy. It was strange in a way, knowing they might have to rescue the rescue mission, which supposedly was coming to rescue them. Three hours later, Jeremy had his task group organized. He was taking the Avenger, three other Federation battleships, four battle cruisers, six strike cruisers, two battle carriers, ten Alton battleships, and twenty Alton battle cruisers. In addition, the Command AI had agreed to furnish forty AI ships to go with the task group. It was a formidable force, and one Jeremy felt confident could rescue any ship that came to the vortex. I wonder what Kelsey and Katie will say when they see we have AI ships with us, asked Kevin. He was anxious to go and kept walking over to communications to see if Angela had received any new messages from the AIs at Hantel 7. So far, no further messages had been received. They'll be surprised, Jeremy predicted. I just hope they don't jump away when they see the AIs. They won't, Ariel said with a pleased smile on her face. As soon as we're within communications range, I'll explain to Clarissa what has occurred with the AIs that came through with us. Assuming Clarissa is on the ship... Jeremy said. She might not be. If Kelsey and Katie are on the ship, Clarissa will be too. Ariel was certain about that. It would be wonderful to be able to speak to Clarissa again, as well as Katie. 
This was something Ariel had been looking forward to for a very long time. She was just as anxious to get underway as Kevin and Angela. Task Group is ready to enter hyperspace, Commander Malin said, as she stepped over closer to the command console. Prepare to initiate our first jump, Jeremy ordered. In order to keep Gaia a secret from the simulants, they'd mapped out a roundabout way out of the nebula. This would be the largest fleet they'd taken out since they first arrived at Gaia. They'd also stopped sending out exploration missions after the stealth destroyer Everest had failed to return. Ready to jump, Commander Malin said. She was prepared to get back out into space. It had been boring orbiting Gaia for the last four years. Initiate jump, Jeremy ordered. Jump, commanded Malin, her eyes focusing on the view screens. In front of the Avenger, a blue-white vortex opened. Ensign Stryker carefully maneuvered the ship into its center, and in a matter of moments, the ship jumped into hyperspace. Jeremy gulped as he felt the gut-wrenching sensation of entering that mysterious realm. He had forgotten what it felt like to enter hyperspace. Glancing at the view screens, he saw the normal deep purple colors. He leaned back in his command chair, knowing it would be nearly 20 minutes before they dropped back into normal space. Was this really happening, he wondered? Were Kelsey and Katie about to come through the vortex into the Triangulum Galaxy? Looking around the command center, he saw excited and expectant looks on the faces of his crew. They were all hoping their isolation was coming to an end. However, Jeremy knew it wouldn't be that simple. He suspected whatever had been built back in their home galaxy to activate the vortex would have to be built here in this galaxy also. The problem with that was going to be the simulants. He strongly suspected they would never allow anything to be built in the Sigma system, which would allow the Avenger and her fleets to return home. Four jumps later, the Avenger and her task group dropped back into normal space in a blue giant star system. The system they'd chosen had a star 80 times the mass of the Sun at the heart of the Earth system. It had a surface temperature of over 40,000 degrees Kelvin, making its temperature far greater than that of GV2-type stars like Earth's or Nutellus's. There were several hyperspace detection buoys in orbit, and they knew no simulant ships had made an appearance in this system in several years. One of the reasons being the system had no planets, not even an asteroid field. As the Avenger exited the blue-white spatial vortex, Jeremy let out a deep breath. The main view screens began to come to life, one by one, and the ship's tactical displays started to show data. It was strange not to see any planets, moons, or asteroids. There were a few comets in far-ranging orbits, but nothing of significance. The Blue Giant system was eight light-years from the Sigma system, and hopefully out of sensor range of the simulants. Long-range sensors activated, Ariel reported. All ships have exited their vortexes and are taking up defensive positions around the Avenger. The AIs are forming up into a protective globe around the perimeter of the fleet. Jeremy nodded. The AI ships were now his most powerful asset, with multiple particle beam cannons. On one of the main view screens, he could see several of the 1,500-meter AI spheres in close proximity to the Avenger. There was a time such a sight would have frightened the crew. But over the years... They'd grown to accept the AIs as a valuable and necessary part of their survival. Ship is at condition two, spoke Commander Malin, looking over at Jeremy. Should we go to condition three? We have no idea how long we'll have to wait for the next vortex activation. It could be hours, days, or even weeks. Go to condition three, Jeremy ordered. The AIs will stay at a high alert level as they don't need any rest. All ships are reporting successful jumps and all systems functioning normally, reported Angela. She could also tell from the voices of the other communications officers that they were all excited about the possibility of rescue and finally hearing news from home. I hope Brace is on the rescue ship, she thought to herself. She had just about given up hope of ever seeing her marine captain again. Now, that hope had been renewed by the brief activation of the vortex in the Sigma system. Senses are showing no unknown contacts, Kevin reported, after examining the data from the sensors carefully. The hyperspace buoys show no simulant ships have been in this system in the past 18 months. And even then it was only one. It stayed briefly and then jumped back out. Routine survey, Commander Malin surmised. They have probably been doing that to see if they can pick up any sign of our ships. Long-range sensors have detected two large simulant fleets, Ariel said suddenly, as the sensors finally reached their 10 light-year maximum range. There is one fleet in the Sigma system and another waiting in a brown dwarf system, three light-years distant. 
Any chance they can detect us? Asked Jeremy, sharply. They still weren't certain just how far the simulant sensors could reach. I don't believe so, Ariel answered. We're close enough to this system star that its stellar radiation should help to mask our presence. Then we wait, spoke Jeremy, leaning back in his command chair. If the vortex activated again, Jeremy wondered what would come through. Would it be one ship or a fleet? Clarissa will be here shortly, commented Ariel. She felt excited about the prospect of speaking to her longtime friend and Katie. She had missed both tremendously. She didn't know what she would have done without Jeremy, Kevin, and Angela to speak to. They'd gotten her through these last four years of loneliness. The command AI floated over to where the ship's main sensors were. It gazed impassively at the two simulant fleets that were just out of reach. The Altons had installed their long-range sensors on the AI command ship. The last four years had been interesting to the AIs, but also strangely satisfying. It had been highly rewarding to be able to once again work with the Altons. It made the command AI question its programming, which implied that all organic races were dangerous. It had spoken several times with Alton AI specialists about this very subject. The Alton female AI specialist, Corrine, had even been allowed to examine the AI's basic programming to see why this animosity toward organics existed. So far, she had not been able to find an explanation, though she still had a tremendous amount of programming information to sift through. The command AI had found it highly stimulating to converse with this particular Alton. All ships are in position, reported the AI at navigation. The humans and Altons are reducing their alert status to condition three, added the AI at tactical. That is a wise decision, the command AI stated. It will allow them to be at peak combat efficiency when needed. Our own ships will maintain a high level of alert. Will we fight the simulant organics? Asked the AI in front of the ship's main computers. If necessary, answered the command AI. While we now feel it was wrong to kill organics, these simulants represent a clear and present threat to our own continued existence. We will do what we must to survive, as well as protect the humans and the Altons. It was a strange feeling, this new need to protect two organic races, three counting the Carthians. It was also very satisfying. Jeremy was in main engineering, performing an inspection. Kevin had come along with him, as he wanted to talk about the possible impending rescue. I hope Katie brought some hamburgers along, uttered Kevin, patting his stomach. I thought you liked the hamburgers we have now, Jeremy said, allowing himself to smile. They'd located several meat animals on Gaia that were suitable for human consumption. They don't taste like beef, responded Kevin, shaking his head emphatically. They're okay, but it's not the same. Then, in a quieter voice, I sure hope the girls are on that rescue ship. I don't know how much longer I can go without seeing Katie. I know, Jeremy said with a sigh. He felt the same way about Kelsey. I just hope we can get to them before the simulants do. How's engineering? asked Jeremy, seeing Roger Simpkins, the chief engineer. He had wanted to come down to engineering as this was the first time they had activated the Avengers hyperdrive in quite some time. Everything's running smoothly, Simpkins replied with a pleased smile. Even without the hyperdrive being used in nearly four years, everything worked as it should. My people have labored hard keeping everything tuned up and serviced. You've done a good job, chief, Jeremy confirmed. Looking around the large engineering space, everything appeared immaculate and polished. The engineering compartments comprised a large section of the rear of the Avenger, due to the space needed for the fusion reactors, hyperdrive, and sublight drive. It also had an extra-thick layer of battle armor to protect the vital equipment. How's morale? Kevin asked. He could see a bustle in the movement of the engineering crew, which had been missing for a while. They're excited, answered Simpkins. They all want to hear news from home. Just knowing the vortex has been activated has given them all new hope. I think everyone's excited, Kevin said, nodding his head enthusiastically. It's been over four years since we arrived here. I imagine some were giving up on the idea of ever being able to return. We still might not be able to, Simpkins said in a quieter and grimmer voice. I've done some figuring on the energy requirements to send a single ship from our home galaxy to this one, and it's nearly off the scale. We would have to do some major construction, possibly even build something like the AI capacitor stations 
to furnish the necessary energy which would be required. We have the plans for the capacitor stations, Jeremy informed him. The AIs hadn't been hesitant in turning them over to the Altons to study. So do you think it's just one ship that's going to come through and not a fleet? asked Kevin, running his right hand through his fiery red hair. Yes, answered Simpkins, nodding his head. It's what I would do. Send some type of science ship through to collect data and find us. I don't think they would come through the vortex unless they had an idea of how to get us home. We'll just have to see what they've come up with. I agree with your assessment of the situation, Jeremy said. I guess we won't know until a ship comes through and we can make contact. He sincerely hoped the rescue ship would have a method for the fleets to return. He didn't want to live out his life in the Simulan galaxy. The danger here was just too great, and he wanted to see his crews make it safely home. Everything depends on Kelsey, Katie, and Clarissa, spoke Kevin in a grave voice. I just hope they realize what they may be getting into. Jeremy nodded. The Triangulum Galaxy held a grave danger with the Simulans. There was still so much they didn't understand about this mysterious race. He was as anxious as everyone else to hear news from home. They would finally know how the war had turned out and what was happening in the Federation. However, most of all, he just wanted to see Kelsey. Chapter 13 Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes stared out the massive view screen, which covered the front wall of the distant horizon. She was standing close to the screen as she waited for Clarissa and Andrum to give her an idea of their next destination. She was still finding it hard to accept they'd actually traveled to another galaxy. We haven't found any signs of space-traveling civilization in our sensor suite, reported Andrum, turning toward the Admiral. There are two promising systems close by. A K-type star, only three light-years distant, and a G-type that's seven light-years out. I was wondering, Catherine said after a moment, these simulants who adjusted the AI's codex, do you think there's any chance they could still be around? It was something which had been at the back of her mind since leaving Astral. Possibly, Andrum responded, his forehead creasing in a thoughtful frown. Their adjustment to the AI's codex was designed to result in the termination of all organic life forms in our galaxy. They had to know what they'd programmed would take centuries to accomplish. I fear there is a reasonable chance they're present in this galaxy somewhere. Then we had better approach all worlds with caution, Catherine said. If they ran into trouble, there was no one they could call upon for help. I think it would be wise if we did a little exploring before setting off to where we think the Avenger and the other lost fleets came through. Andrum nodded. Those two stars would be ideal to begin with. It might give us an idea of what type of light forms to expect in this galaxy. We do have the stealth shield we could deploy if necessary, Commander Grissom reminded the Admiral. She knew that the stealth shield was supposed to mask all the energy radiation a ship normally put out, as well as make the ship's hull impervious to sensor scans. The only thing was... The screen had no defense against inbound weapons and couldn't be used while the ship's main energy screen was operational. It is an option, added Colonel Leon. It would allow us to search star systems without the fear of being detected. I'll keep it in standby mode, Clarissa stated. If a threat is detected, I can activate it until we decide how we want to proceed. Commander Grissom, spoke Catherine, as she turned and walked back to her command chair. Make ready to jump to the K-type star. Andrum and Clarissa have located. We'll do a full scan for planets and see if the system holds any signs of life. I think for the immediate future, we'll activate our stealth shield when we enter a system as a safety precaution. Lieutenant Stiles, prepare for a jump into hyperspace, ordered Commander Grissom. Lieutenant Strong, please plot the necessary jump coordinates. Clarissa, activate the stealth shield as soon as our system stabilize after the jump. Yes, Commander, Kelsey said as she hurried over to her station. She saw with relief that Clarissa had already set up the jump equations, and all she had to do was confirm they were correct. Thank you, Kelsey said quietly. She knew Clarissa would understand. Shilum is reporting the hyperdrive has been properly adjusted and should give us no additional problems, Colonel Leon informed the Admiral. Petra had been following the repairs that Shilum and Beltram had been doing over a view screen, which gave her a view of the hyperspace drive and engineering. For most of the time, the two Altons had been working at the drive's main computer terminal, inputting additional commands. Ready to jump, 
Commander Grissom said. As Kelsey indicated, the jump coordinates had been uploaded into the navigation system. CSP and defense globes are back in the flight bay. Take us to condition one, ordered Catherine. She had decided she wasn't going to take any chances here in the Triangulum Galaxy. Execute the jump. The Condition 1 alarms began ringing, and lights started flashing red as everyone quickly moved to their combat stations. Catherine listened as Commander Grissom made the announcement of the setting of Condition 1. Once Grissom was satisfied the ship was ready, she turned toward Lieutenant Stiles at the helm. Initiate jump! Instantly, in front of the distant horizon, a familiar blue-white vortex formed. The massive 2,600-meter ship moved rapidly into it and promptly vanished. Moments later, the vortex collapsed in on itself, and soon after, there was no sign of it ever existing. A few minutes later, the ship exited an identical vortex in the target system. It sat in space, not moving, as its sensors reached out to scan the small star system. Stealth shield activated, reported Clarissa. Six planets, Captain Reynolds announced. One planet is in the liquid water zone, and it appears to have a breathable atmosphere. No other contacts? asked Catherine. They were in unknown space, and every jump was going to have some risk. She just hoped they didn't run across any races that might be hostile. No, answered Reynolds. We're still not picking up any signs of any ships on the long-range sensors. Take us to the planet, then, Catherine ordered. Let's see what kind of life there is in this galaxy. Use a micro-jump to put us just outside the planet's gravity well. Catherine knew the distant horizon was perfectly capable of jumping right next to the planet but she didn't want to put any unnecessary stress on the ship. The distant horizon made a short hyperjump, and then, after passing into the gravity well, coasted into orbit around a world of blue oceans and sandy deserts with only a few patches of green. In orbit, a few satellites were spotted, but scans indicated they were inactive. This looks like a colony, Colonel Leone commented. As she studied the scans, the sensors were taking of the surface. There are four sites that show formal cities. There are also signs the cities were bombarded from space. Crap, muttered Commander Grissom, not liking what she was hearing and seeing. On the main view screen was one of the city sites, and massive craters were in evidence. If Anne had to make a guess, it looked as if someone had used kinetic energy weapons against the inhabitants. A heavy railgun battery would make just such an impact. Are there any signs of survivors? asked Catherine as she gazed at the view screen. The city looked as if it might have held a few hundred thousand inhabitants at one time. No, Clarissa answered. She had moved over to the left side of the Admiral. I'm not picking up any signs of movement in the city. Catherine leaned back and thought about what this implied. She wondered who had attacked this world and if it could have been the Simulans. After several moments, she reached a decision. She switched her minicom over to the frequency she knew Major Winslow would be listening in on. Major. I want to send a mission down to the surface of this planet and see if we can determine who attacked them. The information might prove invaluable in future explorations. Armed, I assume? Winslow responded. Yes, Catherine answered. I don't want you to take any risks. There will also be a few Alton and human scientists going down with you. I will make sure they stay unharmed, promised Winslow. I'll have my team assembled and in the flight bay in twenty minutes. Are you sure it's wise to be going down to the surface? Asked Commander Grissom. She didn't want to risk getting caught up in someone else's war. It should be, answered Catherine, gazing at the view screen. The screen had been adjusted to show a magnified view, and it was obvious the destruction of the city had occurred quite some time ago. Vegetation could be seen growing in most of the streets and avenues. We finished one war, and now we may have jumped into another. Anne shook her head, hoping she was wrong. This mission so far wasn't going as she had hoped. If there's a war going on in this galaxy, this might be our opportunity to discover who is fighting whom, Catherine responded. Major Winslow stepped out of the heavy combat shuttle onto the surface. On top of the shuttle, a dual laser turret turned, slowly searching for any signs of movement. An upper hatch slid open, and a missile launcher rose up and swiveled until it was pointed toward the nearby city. At least we have firepower if we need it, commented Lieutenant Barkley. He gestured for Sergeant Snyder to move his squad out. Slow and easy, Sergeant. Put a couple of Marines on point. Let's do this by the book. The Marines moved out and began heading toward a nearby road, which seemed to lead into the center of the city. Twenty-four Marines had come down in the shuttle. Six would be staying behind to operate the laser turret and missile launcher. There was also a four-person crew, which could assist the Marines if needed. 
There were six civilians as well, two Altons and four humans. All were well versed in the sciences dealing with different alien cultures as well as archaeology. Everyone was dressed in light environmental protection suits. However, these were a standard marine color and designed to blend in with the surroundings. As they moved into the city, the six civilians stayed in the center of the marine formation. Looking around, all they could see were burned out buildings and crumbling walls. These must have happened hundreds of years ago, stated Zalem Rath, as he paused to examine a building which had large cracks in its structure. You can even see where the weather has started to erode the material of the buildings. From what we saw on the planet earlier, I don't believe this area receives a lot of rainfall. This type of erosion would have taken several centuries at least. Major, called out Sergeant Snyder. I think you need to see this. Walking over to where the sergeant was, Winslow noticed that he was bending down examining the surface of the street. What is it, Sergeant? Some kind of track, sir, Schneider said in a slight German accent. I've never seen anything like this before. Major Winslow looked down at what the sergeant was pointing at and had to agree. In some areas of the street, there was a lot of sand and dirt that had blown in from the surrounding countryside. The tracks were about the size of his hand, and there were a lot of them. They didn't resemble any type of animal track he had seen before, and didn't make a lot of sense. They were round, and had what looked like small indentations scattered in the print in a circular pattern. I don't know, Winslow said, as his eyes studied the street. We didn't detect anything moving from orbit. Something midsies, Sergeant Snyder replied. Whatever it is, it's pretty good size, much larger than a man. Lieutenant Barkley, we may not be alone down here. We need to keep a sharp lookout for any signs of movement. Winslow then contacted the shuttle and told them about the track Sergeant Snyder had found. The Marines in the shuttle reported that they had not seen any indications of movement on the sensors. This isn't an organic creature, commented Bill McLean, who was familiar with numerous animal species on hundreds of alien worlds. He was an ecobiologist and had been on many worlds with different environments. What do you mean? asked Major Winslow shifting his gaze over to the scientist. The tracks are too regular. Animals don't move this way. An AI? asked Winslow, fearing the worst. I doubt it, replied McLean, shaking his head. Probably some type of robot. It might be some type of work robot the inhabitants of this planet used, suggested Panthel Bale. She was a female Alton and knew quite a bit about alien cultures. It could be a mining robot or something they used for common labor. Major, a Marine's voice came over his comm. It was one of the Marines back in the shuttle. We're picking up movement directly in front of you about 200 meters. Major Winslow peered down the long street and thought he could see some movement next to a crumbling building. There's something down the street coming our way, he warned as he clicked the safety off his assault rifle. Civilians, move back to the rear. What the hell is that? muttered Sergeant Schneider. It was still too far down the street to clearly make out what it was. There's another one, called out Private Jarman, pointing toward one of the side streets. It was at that moment the one down the street spotted the Marines. It let out a loud, warbling, high-pitched sound and started charging toward the Marines. It's a damn crab, yelled Private Spencer. A giant crab! There are more of them, added Lieutenant Barkley, as more of the crabs appeared from crumbling buildings. There are dozens of these things. Hold your position, ordered Major Winslow. His suit was capable of enhanced vision, and he quickly zoomed in on one of the advancing crabs. Seeing the large pincher-like appendages, there was no doubt these things were dangerous. Very slowly. Let's begin backing up. Perhaps if they see we mean no harm, they'll stop. I don't think it's going to work, Major, called out Sergeant Schneider. They're coming faster. Schneider had flipped his safety off and had his assault rifle pointed in the general direction of the advancing crabs. Major Winslow didn't like the situation he was being forced into. If he did nothing, the crabs would overrun them and possibly injure or even kill some of his marines and the civilians. If he fired on them, he could be committing an act of war. Major, what do you want to do? asked Lieutenant Barkley. The crabs were getting uncomfortably close. They showed no signs of slowing down. Fire, Major Winslow said, reaching a decision. Take them down. Instantly, heavy weapons fire raked the oncoming crabs as the Marines let loose with a fusillade of fire from their assault rifles. Some of the crabs faltered, and a few even collapsed onto the street, but most of them kept on coming. Grenades! 
Major Winslow yelled, when he saw that their weapons fire was not nearly as effective as he had hoped. The creatures were nearly upon them. Quickly, a couple of the Marines tossed grenades at the advancing crabs, blowing several of them apart. More Marines joined in, and the street rattled from the explosions. Dust and smoke filled the air, and several sagging walls collapsed, spreading even more dust. Then the crabs reached the Marines, and the screaming began. Major Winslow turned pale as he saw a crab grab one of his Marines and literally pull him in two, sending blood and body parts everywhere. Another used its pinchers and neatly clipped a Marine's head off. Keep firing, he yelled, as he emptied his clip into a nearby crab. The creature collapsed on the street and lay still. He quickly ejected the clip and slapped in another. Major, there are moves him coming, called out Sergeant Snyder, who had stopped one of the creatures just short of the civilians. There are too many! warned Lieutenant Barkley as he lobbed another grenade down the street. They're going to overrun us! At that moment, Major Winslow became aware of the growing noise above them. Looking up, he saw the combat shuttle. From its bottom hull, a twin laser turret extended, and ruby-red beams of light flashed down to sweep across the oncoming crabs. The beams easily cut them in two, and in short time, the charge was broken and the crabs eliminated. Land the shuttle in the street behind us, ordered Major Winslow over his suit comm. There was just enough room for the shuttle to touch down. He wanted to get off this planet as quickly as possible. He seriously doubted if they'd killed all the creatures. More could be arriving at any moment. Major, these are machines, Bill McLean spoke as he looked closely at a crab near him. He could see that they were made out of some type of metal and several had been blown apart, making their internal workings visible. Bill bent over and peered inside, inspecting its mechanism. Robots of some type. Panthel informed them, as she looked closely at one near her. Some type of scavengers. But for what purpose? asked Lieutenant Barkley, as the shuttle landed and its hatch lit open. We should take one back to examine, suggested Panthel. We could learn a lot from it. Major Winslow frowned at the idea, but he had been ordered to find out who had destroyed this planet. Just one, he said after a moment. Take it on board, but make sure it's secured. I don't want it coming back to life. A few minutes later, everyone was aboard the shuttle, and their specimen was stored in a metal cargo container. The thing was so large it had been difficult to get it inside, but after some hard work, they managed to wrangle it inside the container. Let's get back up to the distant horizon, ordered Major Winslow, as he entered the cockpit. I don't know how many more of those things are around, and I don't want to find out. Yes, sir, the pilot answered. A short time later, the shuttle lifted off and quickly began gaining altitude. It was returning to the ship, bringing a new mystery with it. In the cargo hold, the Marines gazed at the large metal container uneasily. There were also four body bags containing their dead companions strapped to the floor next to it. They'd defeated the crabs, but the robots had taken a heavy toll. Everyone just hoped what they were bringing back was worth it. Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes listened to Major Winslow's after-action report with a grim look upon her face. Four Marines had been killed and another two seriously injured. She knew they'd been fortunate not to have lost more. If the shuttle had arrived a minute later, all of the Marines and civilians could have lost their lives. They attacked us for no reason? asked Catherine, shaking her head. Yes, sir, Major Winslow replied. When the first two spotted us, it let out a loud warbling call, which seemed to summon the others. Panthel believes they're scavengers of some sort. A very brutal type of scavenger stated Catherine. Do you feel these robots were built by the city's inhabitants? I don't know, Winslow replied, his brow furrowing in thought. They seem more like something placed on the surface to ensure there were no survivors. A cleanup detail, muttered Catherine, unhappily. It sounded so heartless and cruel. These things killed by tearing their prey apart. It makes sense in a way, Major Winslow replied. Once the city was destroyed, rather than send troops down to spend valuable time searching for survivors, they could land a few hundred of these scavengers, and over time, as the survivors ventured out, the robots could make short work of them. They would also serve as an occupying force without tying down valuable troops which might be needed elsewhere. Miko and several others are going to attempt to access the robot CPU to see if they can discover who placed these things upon the planet. Catherine informed the Major. From what we know of the simulants tinkering with the AI Codex, my bet's on it being them. That would make them a horrid race, replied Winslow. 
shaking his head at how heartless it would seem to indicate the simulans were. I just can't see how a race could be that way. We have examples in our own galaxy, Catherine answered, her eyes narrowing at the memories of the recent war with the Hawklands and the AIs. Look at what the Hawklands did to so many of their slave worlds. They nuked the original human federation of worlds, committing genocide on all the planets except New Providence. The only reason it didn't succeed on New Providence was because the survivors fled deep underground and were never found. What do we do now, Admiral? We're going to the next star system, Catherine answered. We're going to look around before we set course to where we hope Admiral Strong and his fleets are. I want to know what's going on in this galaxy and the type of threats we may be up against. Major Winslow nodded. He had 600 Marines on the distant horizon, and he was confident they could handle any threat they were asked to stop. However, fighting robots like what they'd found on the planet below was something he had no desire for. Kelsey was in her quarters talking to Katie. The ship was going to be jumping into hyperspace in another few hours, making the short jump to the G-type star that Clarissa and Andrum had located. Killer robots, spoke Katie, her light green eyes showing deep concern. What if they're everywhere? We don't know that, Kelsey answered, though she had been having the same thoughts. We're going to explore a few more planets before Admiral Barnes takes the distant horizon to where Jeremy and Kevin are. Have you spoken to Brace about what's going on? asked Katie. She knew Brace had to be feeling as apprehensive as they were. Earlier, Kelsey answered. I spoke to him briefly while the mission was down on the planet. He's just hoping Angela is still waiting for him. Katie allowed herself to laugh. She's waiting. Angela was head over heels in love with the guy. I'll just be glad when we finally find the Avenger. Even if we're trapped here in this galaxy, at least we'll be together again, Kelsey said with a deep sigh. The years had been difficult with the Special Five being separated and not knowing what might have happened to their friends and loved ones. Shiloom and Clarissa are both certain they can get us back home, Katie responded. All we need to do is find the Avenger and the other ships, and we can use the fleet repair vessels or the Clan Protector to build the energy collection station we'll need. We have all the designs on board. It's just going to take time. I don't know, Kelsey said with a concerned look on her face. When we were on Macon, I got the strangest vibe from Fleet Admiral Strath. I got the impression he didn't expect to ever see us again. Katie was silent for a moment, her light green eyes growing wide. You don't think he was telling us everything he saw in his premonition? No, I think there was something he was keeping secret. But why help us and send us to Astral if he knew we were going to die here? I don't think the secret was us dying here, Kelsey answered with a deep sigh. I just don't think he saw us returning home. Those robots Major Winslow encountered. Katie said, trying to figure out what might prevent them from making the transit back to their galaxy. You think whoever created those things will try to prevent us from building the energy collection stations? They might, answered Kelsey. Someone made those and put them on the planet. We may find them everywhere in this galaxy. We need to find Jeremy and Kevin, spoke Katie emphatically. They'll know what's going on and what we need to do. I wonder if they've encountered the creators of those robots, said Kelsey. Miko and Clarissa are going to try to find out who created them, Katie informed her. They're moving the one they brought up in the shuttle to one of the labs, to be taken apart and studied. Once they're sure it's safe, they're going to search its programming for some answers. Kelsey nodded. She was anxious for the distant horizon to begin heading toward where they believed the Avenger and the Lost Bleats were. She understood Rear Admiral Barnes' desire to understand what was going on in this galaxy. But Kelsey just wanted to get to Jeremy. After all, it had been over four years since they'd last spoken to one another. Miko was in the computer lab as the scavenger robot was brought in by a group of marines. The thing was nearly ten feet across and had numerous appendages. Is it dead? she asked as it was placed on the floor. A large area had been cleared so they could work on the strange automaton. It's dead, confirmed Lieutenant Barkley. He tapped it with the barrel of his assault rifle a couple of times, as if to make sure. I hope its CPU wasn't damaged, Miko said, as she walked around the robot, noting all the damage that had been done to it. Several of its legs were missing, as well as one of its large claw-like appendages. This was the least damaged one, Barkley replied. The rest were pretty well blown up or cut apart by the shuttle's lasers. It'll have to do, said Miko, feeling excited at the prospect of studying this robot and learning how it was programmed. It's not showing, 
any signs of internal power andrum said as he pointed a small handheld device in the direction of the robot he had followed the marines into the room i would guess its internal power source was destroyed in the fighting miko stepped closer to inspect the scavenger she pointed to a seam which seemed to indicate a possible entry point to the internal workings of the machine let's begin by removing this panel once we can see inside we'll have a better idea of how to proceed several human and alton technicians who were in the room stepped forward to see what tools they would need to carry out miko's suggestion we're going to have to cut or drill this open stated one of the human technicians after tracing the seam with his fingers i would suggest a laser cutting drill spoke one of the tall white-haired altons it will do less damage and doesn't generate a great amount of heat all the technicians nodded in agreement and after procuring the drill they were soon busy cutting the panel off miko watched in growing excitement this would be her first opportunity to examine an alien robot she was curious about what she would find lieutenant barclay turned to sergeant snyder who had helped to move the robot into the computer lab sergeant i want you and two other marines to stay here and ensure that thing stays dead it will promised schneider he was still holding his assault rifle if it so much as twitches we'll blast it clarissa was watching the proceedings over several monitors that were in the lab and gave her a clear view of what was occurring the lab was equipped with holographic projectors so she could appear there in person if she wanted for now she was content to merely observe the discovery of this scavenger robot greatly concerned her if the simulans were behind it and the simulation she had run indicated they probably were then they could all be in grave danger it also made her deeply concerned for the fate of the avenger and the missing fleets she just hoped they'd survived and were waiting for rescue she didn't know what she would do if ariel and the others were gone chapter fourteen the distant horizon exited the blue-white vortex into their target system. Admiral Barnes gazed with interest at the main view screen as the stars reappeared. While she felt safe in hyperspace knowing they couldn't be attacked, it was always comforting to see the stars shining around them. Sensors are online, reported Captain Reynolds. Beginning sensor sweeps. Stealth shield activated, added Clarissa. All departments reporting normal operations, added Colonel Leon. The jump had been perfectly routine, and all systems were functioning optimally. No contacts in our immediate vicinity, reported Reynolds, as the first sensor results began coming in. We should have data on the entire system shortly. Secure from Condition 1 and go to Condition 2, ordered Catherine. She leaned back in her command chair, waiting for the tactical displays to begin displaying their information. She felt a little uneasy after the unexpected encounter with the scavenger robots in the last system. Should we deploy a CSP or some of the defense globes? asked Commander Grissom. Not yet, replied Catherine. Let's wait and see what the scans turn up. Miko is working on the robot again, added Colonel Leon. She says she located the CPU and is trying to access it. I'll help her, spoke Clarissa, wanting to learn more about the strange crab-like robot. Perhaps we can learn if the simulants are behind the attack on that planet. Let me know as soon as you find out anything. Catherine said, as Clarissa's holographic image vanished. She let out a deep sigh. She still wasn't used to the way the AI could just appear and then disappear in an instant. Initial scans are complete, Captain Reynolds informed the Admiral. Detecting eight planets in the system and one in the liquid water zone. It's almost in the center and just slightly larger than Earth. Reynolds became quiet as he rechecked some data. I'm picking up a lot of radiation in the planet's atmosphere the type left by the explosions of multiple nuclear devices. This planet may have been attacked just like the last one, suggested Commander Grissom. The use of nuclear weapons suggests this planet may have had a much larger population base. Plot a micro jump to just outside the gravity well of the planet, ordered Catherine. Finding another potentially devastated planet sent icy chills down her back. Take us back to Condition 1 and prepare a squadron of fighters and bombers for deployment. What about the defense globes? asked commander grissom she felt more comfortable with the defense globes out as it provided an additional layer of protection for the ship deploy ten of them once we've completed the jump Catherine ordered this time she planned to stay outside the gravity well of the planet lieutenant strong 
Plot an emergency jump to one of the nearest star systems in case we have to run. Yes, Admiral, Kelsey replied as she got busy on her navigation computer. Ready to jump, reported Colonel Leon. Initiate jump, ordered Commander Grissom, as her eyes focused on the large view screen. The ship entered the vortex and then shortly after dropped back into normal space. The view screen instantly cleared, showing a planet which once might have looked like Earth or Tellus. Now it was dark and foreboding. The vegetation on the surface was dead, the oceans had an unhealthy brownish tinge, and the few clouds that were visible didn't seem capable of delivering any beneficial rain. Radiation is 40 times above the norm, reported Clarissa, as she suddenly reappeared next to the Admiral. Scans indicate this was a heavily populated planet, and the building architecture is very similar to what we saw on the last planet. This was their homeworld then, suggested Commander Grissom as she stepped closer to the view screen. The screen had been adjusted to show a closer view of the planet. Craters and large burned areas were indications of large nuclear strikes. Launching defense clubs, reported Colonel Leon, as she listened to Major Arkles, who was in the flight control center for the flight base. Who would do something like this? asked Anne, shaking her head in disgust. The same race that destroyed the other planet, Clarissa answered as she adjusted several of the ship's sensors to take detailed scans of the devastated cities. I'm detecting movement in some of the ruined cities. It matches that of the robot crabs we encountered previously. How long ago did this happen? asked Catherine. There was no way she was going to risk sending down a mission to this planet's surface. With the high radiation and the presence of scavenger robots, it was too risky. Two to three hundred years ago. Based on the decay rate of the radioactive isotopes in the atmosphere, Clarissa responded, If we had a sample of the air, we could determine to within just a few years as to the time of the actual attack. I wouldn't recommend it, Andrum said, as he walked into the command center. He had been working with Miko on the robot down in the computer lab. There might also have been a biological attack as well. And there is the possibility that any surviving microbes could have been dangerously mutated by their long-term exposure to radiation. Catherine nodded. She was confident the quarantine procedures they had in place for dealing with dangerous organisms would allow them to conduct the air sample, but she really didn't see the point. Picking up a lot of satellites in orbit, Captain Reynolds called out as the tactical screen continued to put up more icons. There's also some debris that indicates a large space station was once present. What about ships? asked Petra. If they had a colony, they're bound to have had a few starships as well. None detected, Reynolds replied. Of course, their ships could be a part of the wreckage the sensors are detecting. Seems to be quite a bit of it. I don't think we're going to find anything useful here, Commander Grissom said as she turned to face the Admiral. What happened here was a long time ago. I agree, Catherine said. Lieutenant Strong, do you have those emergency jump coordinates plotted? I don't think we want to stay around here too long. Yes, Admiral. Kelsey replied. There's a small white dwarf system eight light years away that should be safe to jump to. We'll take an hour to finish scanning the planet, and then we'll leave. Catherine gazed with a sick feeling at the view screen, knowing hundreds of millions of intelligent beings had been ruthlessly annihilated on the planet below. Detailed scans have been completed, Clarissa reported fifty minutes later. Commander Grissom, I think it's time to leave this star system, Catherine said. Land the defense globes and stand by to initiate our jump. A few minutes later, Colonel Leon turned toward the Admiral. Defense globes are in the flight bay and have been secured. Stand by to jump, Grissom ordered as she turned to face the helm. Set the coordinates and let's get out of here. Coordinates set, replied Lieutenant Stiles. Initiate jump on my command, ordered Commander Grissom as she stood with her hands clasped behind her back. Jump! Jumping! spoke the helm officer as a blue-white vortex formed in front of the distant horizon. Moments later, they were safely back in hyperspace. Catherine was beginning to wonder just what type of galaxy they jumped into. Both of the first two systems with planets in the liquid water zone had held dead civilizations. What else awaited them in this galaxy? Eight minutes later, the distant horizon exited the vortex and found itself in the outer reaches of the white dwarf system. The star was slightly smaller than Earth, but was nearly the mass of Earth's sun. It was also much dimmer. Stealth field activated, reported Clarissa. No contacts, called out Captain Reynolds, as his sensors began to reach out across the star system. 
After a couple of minutes passed, he spoke again. I'm detecting two planets, both on the far side of the star. Secure from condition one, ordered Commander Grissom, and then turned toward the Admiral. How long are we going to stay here? Until we know more about what's going on in this galaxy, answered Catherine, leaning back in her chair. Once Miko has determined who programmed those scavenger robots, at least we may know who's going around destroying planets. We should know shortly, Clarissa said, her deep blue eyes focusing on the Admiral. Miko has accessed the robot CPU and is in the process of transferring its programming files to one of the computers in the lab. I helped her to set up a decryption program that should allow us to translate the files into something that's understandable. Commander Grissom, put out a CSP and 20 of the defense globes. We may be here a while. Catherine didn't want to take any chances. It was a hard-learned lesson from the war with the Hawklands and the AIs. Yes, Admiral. Anne replied, as she activated her minicom to pass on the orders. Major Arkles was in Raven 1 as it exited the flight bay of the distant horizon. Four other Talon fighters had already taken off and assumed their normal patrol routes. Carl wanted to do a quick inspection just to remind his pilots that he could still check on them, even out in space. He also missed not getting to fly as much as he once did. Being CAG had its benefits, but it also had its drawbacks. The last four years had been interesting, and there was a time he and Lacey had actually considered leaving the fleet and getting married. However, when word of the construction of the distant horizon had leaked out, Carl had pulled some strings to get Lacey and he assigned to the massive starship. They'd agreed to put their relationship on hold until after the mission returned home. He flew along the side of the ship, marveling at its structure and the firepower he knew it held. It was a shame they didn't have something like this during the war. Turning to his left, he quickly flew out to one of the patrols, and after doing a close flyby, he continued to check on the other. On his small sensor screen, he could see the 20 defense globes deployed around the ship. Currently, the globes were 2,000 kilometers out and slowly orbiting the distant horizon. No one was sure how effective these would be in combat, but in trials, they'd been devastating. If the ion cannon worked as it had in the tests, the globes could take down an enemy's energy screen, or at least knock a sizable hole in it, and then fire their particle beam turrets through the opening, causing horrendous damage. The entire purpose of the ion cannon was to compromise defensive energy screens. As Carl finished his inspection, he flew by the bow of the ship. He could plainly see its four large power beam cannons, which were powered by one of the ship's Fusion 5 reactors. The reactor was a new development of the Altons and generated four times the energy of previous fusion reactors. The new power beams were now just as deadly as the particle beam. However, there were also two huge particle beam cannons jutting out slightly from the bow. Carl knew the two beam weapons had an effective range of 20,000 to 25,000 kilometers. He adjusted his course and flew over the upper hull of the massive ship. The ship had 24 power beam turrets around the hull, set in concentric rings. There were also 48 energy gun turrets, 96 defensive laser batteries, and 48 60mm twin railgun turrets. In addition, the ship had 36 missile tubes that could launch anything from a Hunter Interceptor to a 100 megaton sublight antimatter missile. Turning, he took the fighter beneath the ship to come into alignment with one of the two flight bays. Inside the bays were 60 Talon fighters and 40 Anlon bombers. While the distant horizon was supposed to be primarily an exploration ship, it could become a deadly killing machine if the need arose. We have the information from the scavenger robot, Miko announced as she burst into the command center. For an Alton, she was showing an unusual amount of exciting. It was the Simulans. At this announcement, Catherine felt her shoulders droop. She had hoped the aliens who had adjusted the AI's codex were long gone. What did you find out? The robots keep files on any organic life form they kill while on planet, Miko reported. From what we've been able to deduce, the simulans move in and destroy the indigenous population, or as much of it as they can. Once a major portion of the population has been eliminated, the scavenger robots are dumped on the planet to finish off any inhabitants who might have escaped the initial bombardment. Evidently, the simulans don't return to pick up the scavengers. 
They are left on the planet until they wear out and cease functioning. The robots have enough rudimentary technical skills to remove appendages and legs from non-functioning scavengers and use them to replace damaged or missing ones on the robots that are still functioning. How long can these things survive on a planet? asked Catherine. She was beginning to wonder if any planet in this galaxy would be safe to set foot on. Hundreds of years, Miko answered. They get their power from sunlight, and most of the time they are inactive unless they detect an organic life form. So no more landings on planets that have been attacked, spoke Commander Grissom. How widespread do you think these simulants are, Admiral? There's no way to know, answered Catherine, as she thought over their next move. There's a good chance we'll encounter them on our way to the Avenger and the missing fleets. The bigger question is, what has Admiral Strong done to stay away from the simulants? What about the AIs that came through? asked Colonel Leon. Petra knew hundreds of AI ships had made the transit, along with the Avenger and the other fleets. We won't know until we get there, Catherine said. The AIs were another question she'd been worrying about. In the back of her mind... She was beginning to fear that between the AIs and the simulants, the Avenger and her fleets might not have made it. She felt an icy chill run down her back at the thought of being alone in the simulant galaxy. She recalled even Fleet Admiral Streth had been uncertain if Admiral Strong and his fleets had survived once they reached this galaxy. Take us to Condition 3, Catherine ordered. We'll stay here for 24 hours and then start jumping toward where we think Admiral Strong is. Clarissa and Lieutenant Strong... I want two sets of coordinates always ready, one for our destination, and an emergency set in case we jump into a dangerous situation and need to withdraw immediately. How long a jump can we make safely? It depends on the star density, Kelsey answered as she thought over what the Admiral had asked. As we enter areas of this galaxy where there are more stars, our jumps may become shorter, as we're not familiar where gas clouds or even small nebulas may be. Our sensors are good for ten light years. I'm not sure I would recommend a jump any longer than that. I concur, Andrum said. This galaxy is not well mapped, and coming too close to a dust cloud, nebula, or even a heavy area of gas could cause us to fall out of hyperspace. I would recommend we map the space in front of us after each jump, Clarissa suggested. She was standing next to the Admiral with her hands on her shapely hips. We have mapping equipment on board and humans in Altons who are well qualified to use it. If we allow sufficient time between jumps, we could map the space out for 20 or 25 light years ahead of us and make longer jumps. I'll take that into consideration, Catherine said. For now, I think everyone needs to get some rest. We have a long trip ahead of us. Catherine knew she wanted to get some sleep. If they ran into trouble, she wanted to be completely alert. Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes gazed pensively at the swirling deep purple colors on the main view screen. She was tempted to have it turned off because it was a constant reminder of what was ahead of them. They were a little over 11,000 light years from Admiral Strong's supposed location. At 10 light years per jump, that was 1,100 transits into hyperspace. No one needed to tell her that would be a lot of wear and tear on the hyperspace drive. Fortunately, the new drive the Distant Horizon was equipped with needed very little cool-down time, unlike the older drives. They could make a jump after just 30 minutes, but she had lengthened the time between jumps to two hours, so astrometrics could spend more time mapping out future jump points. It's been three days, and there have been no signs of other space-going races, commented Commander Grissom. I think we need to increase the length of our hyperspace jumps. At our current pace, it will take us over 100 days to reach our destination. Catherine let out a deep breath. The distant horizon was capable of making jumps of 120 light years. You might be right, she replied, standing up and walking over to stand behind Kelsey as she eyed the massive view screen. Andrum, would longer jumps be safe? Andrum was sitting at navigation next to Kelsey. I spoke to the scientists who are busy mapping the galaxy between us and our eventual destination, he said after a moment. They feel confident that we can increase our jumps to 50 light years with relative safety. Our long-range sensors can also detect vessels in hyperspace, Clarissa reminded them. She knew the Avenger had those same advanced sensors. We should know ahead of time if the system we're jumping into has operational spacecraft. 
Catherine folded her arms across her chest as she thought over her options. From what Fleet Admiral Streth had told her, there was no doubt that speed was of the utmost importance. She needed to find Admiral Strong and his fleets as soon as possible. Without their construction capability, the distant horizon might not ever be able to return home. Let's do it, she ordered. All jumps henceforth will be fifty light years. Kelsey, I want two emergency sets of jump coordinates. Each should be at least ten light years from our target set of coordinates. If we run into trouble, I want options. I think it's the right decision, commented Commander Grissom. She was also getting tired of staring at the swirling dark purple colors of hyperspace. For another day, the distant horizon jumped. Each time they dropped out of hyperspace, they scanned the space around them, and the scientists in astrometrics worked frantically mapping the triangulum galaxy in front of the ship. Three and a half weeks and we'll be there, Clarissa said over the private comm channel she maintained with Kelsey and Katie. Three and a half weeks still sounds like a long time, Katie moaned. It's been over four years. And I just want to know Kevin is all right. I'm sure they're all fine, Clarissa assured her. Ariel would never let anything happen to any of them. We've waited four years. We can wait three and a half weeks, Kelsey said, as she entered another set of emergency jump coordinates into the main navigation computer. Kelsey expected Clarissa to reply, but she was strangely silent. Clarissa, is there a problem? Possibly. Clarissa said, with a touch of worry in her youthful voice. The long-range sensors are showing the system we're getting ready to enter has a large number of spacecraft operating in it. I've also detected a number of hyperspace events. You better inform the Admiral, Kelsey said, growing worried. Admiral Barnes, Clarissa spoke, as she strode quickly over to the command console. The long-range sensors are detecting spacecraft in our target system. How many? Catherine asked, her eyes widening with concern. She knew it was bound to happen eventually. She just wished it had been later. Hundreds, Clarissa answered. I've also detected a number of hyperspace jumps. It could be the simulans, warned Commander Grissom. We have nine minutes before we drop out of hyperspace. Go to Condition 1, ordered Catherine, reaching a quick decision. We won't deploy any fighters or defense cloaks. If we determine this is a hostile system, we'll jump out to one of our emergency coordinates as soon as the drive's charged. Instantly, the alarms and red lights began flashing. Condition 1 is set, reported Colonel Leon, as she listened to the readiness confirmations coming in over her minicom. All stations report secured. That meant the Marines had been deployed to cover all the ship's important sections. Fighters and defense globes are ready for deployment if needed. Two squadrons of Talons have pilots in the cockpits and are ready to exit the Alpha Flight Bay. Hopefully we won't need them, commented Commander Grissom. We'll need ten minutes for our systems to stabilize, and the drive core to recharge sufficiently for the emergency jump, Grissom reminded the Admiral. Any sooner, and we risk damage to the drive. Anne knew they really needed thirty minutes for the drive core to fully cool, but they could make a shorter jump in an emergency if necessary. As soon as we drop out, put all available power to the defense screen, Catherine said. I don't believe there is any point in activating the stealth shield. We'll probably be detected as soon as we exit the vortex. It'll take time for whoever is in the system to reach us. I can't imagine them attacking without first attempting to identify who we are. We should have sufficient time to recharge the drive. As the minutes passed, Catherine felt her anxiety growing. This was obviously a very high-tech civilization they were about to jump in on. Fortunately, the ship was set up to exit hyperspace in the outer region of the system. Her eyes were focused on the big view screen as she waited tensely for the ship to exit the spatial vortex. Drop out in one minute, reported Colonel Leon. Petra had moved behind the Admiral and was standing by the large tactical station. The command center was silent as everyone waited for the ship to exit hyperspace. Each wondered what they were about to find. Was this race going to be friendly? Or had they stumbled across a simulan-held star system? Drop out, called out Petra, as she felt the normal gut-wrenching sensation of exiting hyperspace. For a brief moment, the view screen was covered in static and the tactical displays were dark. Sensor coming online, reported Captain Reynolds. The main view screen cleared, showing a canopy of unblinking stars. Contacts, called out Reynolds, as his sensors began going wild. I'm detecting hundreds of spacecraft. Some are very near, updating the tactical displays. I have identification, reported Clarissa, her voice displaying worry. The ships are definitely simulant, and I'm picking up some very large ones. We're being hit by sensor scans, reported Commander Grissom. 
as several red lights lit up on the console next to her. Energy screen is up, added Colonel Leon. Weapons coming online. We have several simulant ships within two million kilometers, reported Captain Reynolds. They're turning and beginning to accelerate toward us. Send out the standard first contact package, Catherine ordered, her hands gripping the armrest of her command chair. From the database taken from Astral, they had a rudimentary simulant language base, but Catherine wanted to act as if they hadn't heard of the simulants before. Perhaps the first contact package would buy them some time, at least until the ship was ready to jump. Package sent, replied Captain Travers. Lieutenant Parker, let me know when the hyperdrive is charged and we can safely jump. I want a minute-to-minute countdown. Lieutenant Parker was sitting at the hyperdrive console, which monitored the hyperdrive and its systems, detecting several spatial vortexes forming in the inner system, Clarissa reported. They may be about to jump to our location. Seven minutes to hyperdrive charge, reported Lieutenant Parker. Admiral, we have sufficient power to make several micro jumps if we need to. Only as a last resort, Catherine responded. Spatial vortex is forming off our starward bow at 600 kilometers, reported Captain Reynolds. Emergence, stated Clarissa, as two massive bulbous warships appeared on the main view screen. The ships were 1,100 meters long, with six spires extruding from the forward hull. Resend the first contact package, ordered Catherine, leaning forward. Tactical. Don't activate targeting scans unless ordered. We don't want them to get the wrong idea. They're firing, warned Clarissa, as brilliant energy beams suddenly flashed out from the spires to impact the distant horizon's energy screen. Screen is holding, Colonel Leon reported. Energy screen is at 95%. Five minutes to hyperdrive charge, reported Lieutenant Parker, his voice sounding anxious. Should we fire back, Admiral? asked Commander Grissom. Weapons are ready and powered up. We have more ships entering hyperspace, added Clarissa, as she kept track of all the simulant ships in the system. Six more spatial vortexes forming off the starboard side of the ship. Contacts, called out Captain Reynolds. Same type of ships. No response to our first contact message, Captain Travers informed the Admiral. There have been no attempts by the simulants at communication. The distant horizon vibrated slightly as more energy beams began to impact the defense shield. Energy screen is at 70% and dropping, reported Colonel Leon. Increase the power to the shield, ordered Catherine. Take it from life support if necessary. She didn't want the simulants to know just how heavily armed the distant horizon was if she could help it. Three minutes to hyperdrive charge, reported Lieutenant Parker, as he tried to keep his voice under control. The distant horizon suddenly shook violently, and an amber light appeared on the damage control console. Beam penetration, Commander Grissom reported. Minor damage to the hull at Section 16, Bulkhead 12. Beam did not penetrate our armor. One minute to hyperdrive charge, reported Lieutenant Parker with a slight quiver in his voice. Emergency jump coordinates ready to engage, called out Lieutenant Stiles from the helm. The ship vibrated again, and two more amber lights flared up on the damage control console. Energy screen is at 40%, reported Colonel Leon. Dropping rapidly. Petra knew they now had eight simulant ships attacking the distant horizon with energy beams. Hyperdrive is charged! Jump, ordered Catherine. Her eyes focused intently on the view screen, which was showing a close-up of a simulant ship. In front of the distant horizon, a swirling blue-white vortex formed, and Lieutenant Stiles quickly accelerated the ship into its heart as he fed power to the ship's powerful sublight drive. Catherine felt relief as she felt the transition into hyperspace and saw the view screen fill with the deep purple color she had grown so used to. For once, she was glad to see them. Ship status, she asked, as she allowed herself to lean back in her command chair and breathe out a long sigh of relief. Only minor damage to the hull, reported Commander Grissom. In another minute, their energy beams would have started to penetrate our shield and our armor. We were lucky. Lieutenant Strong, as soon as we exit the vortex, I want another jump plotted. Make this one a jump of 20 light years. We need to put some distance between us and the simulants. We need to allow the drive core 30 minutes to cool down, or we could damage it, warned Commander Grissom. I know, Catherine replied. Lieutenant Strong, make sure you pick a system that's not likely to harbor any inhabited planet. A red blue giant would be acceptable. We'll jump as soon as the core is cooled back down. I can't believe the simulants didn't even try to communicate with us stated Commander Grissom, her eyes showing disbelief. They attacked us with no reason. Not that surprising, Andrum said. He had remained quiet during the battle, trusting Admiral Barnes to bring them through safely. 
After knowing what they did to the AI Codex and the two destroyed worlds we found, we shouldn't have been surprised. All indications are that the Simulans are a very aggressive and dangerous race. The emotions we call normal, which abound in our own galaxy, such as love, empathy, and compassion, may be a foreign concept to them. I just can't imagine such a race, responded Anne, her eyes focused on the Alton. How can intelligent beings act like that? It could have been caused by the environment of their original homeworld, Andrum answered. We may never know the real reasons behind their actions. Catherine let out a deep breath. They'd escaped their first contact with the simulants. Unfortunately, that contact had revealed the simulants were a hostile race, and they might even be the dominant race in the Triangulum Galaxy. She greatly feared Admiral Strong had also encountered the simulants, and she had pondered how that battle had gone. She just prayed that when they reached their eventual destination, there was something or someone there for them to find. Chapter 15 Admiral Race Tolson folded his arms across his chest and gazed thoughtfully at the main view screens. This was the 20th former Hawkland slave world they'd visited, with no trace of the Shari. It seemed as if the battle fought against High Lord Commander Marquest had resulted in the slave race pulling their ships out of the inhabited systems that bordered their empire. I would say this is a good sign, commented Commander Arnett as she watched the tactical displays. Please, they were showing no red thread icons. The Shari evidently thought it was wise to withdraw their ships rather than risk further conflict. For now, added Colonel Cowell, he wasn't convinced that they had seen the last of the Shari. They may still be confused as to what happened to the AIs at the Galactic Center. Our appearance with superior ships and weapons only lends credence to the fact that we've smashed the Hawklands and may be responsible for what has happened to the AIs. It won't take them long to confirm we were involved in both. The AIs have long controlled the technology level of all their proxy races, spoke Commander Arnett. Once they've confirmed the AIs are no longer present, they're bound to begin robust weapons programs. Thanks to the Altons, we'll have a decisive advantage for quite some time, replied Cowell. Perhaps by then the Alliance will have grown and be strong enough to deal with the remaining three slaver races. We can only hope responded Madeline. She knew there was a mountain of work to be done to uplift a number of former Hockland slave worlds and prepare them for admittance in the Alliance. Most of the former slave worlds are unsure of their future, Race said. They'd been sending small delegations from the exploration ships down to each planet they encountered to speak with their leaders. As a precaution, the delegations were protected by a heavily armed escort, but there had been no incidents. There are just so many inhabited worlds scattered across the former Hocklin Empire, uttered Madeline, shaking her head. It's going to take years to get delegations to all of them. What's going to happen in the meantime? It's a tough question, responded Race, recalling some of the discussions back at Fleet Command. We're going to have to watch the Borzon as well as the Shari to ensure they don't move in on some of those worlds. We know for a fact the Borzon have solidly entrenched themselves in some of the former border regions of the Hockland Empire, and they're not going to budge without a major military confrontation. We have several fleets assigned to those areas to see that there are no further encroachments. That's why we're going to be proactive with the Shari and keep them out of the border areas. I have an inquiry from the world below asking about our intentions, reported Lieutenant Travers from Communications. They want to know if we represent the Hocklands or the Sharis. Get a first contact team ready, ordered Race with a sigh. He had already sent a message back to Fleet Admiral Nagumo, asking for more trained first contact people to be sent to this area. The message would take a while for Nagumo to receive, and even longer for a response. We have two groups we've been using, answered Madeline. Both are a mixture of Altons and humans. It's fortunate the Altons have a knack for speaking to the governments of worlds the Hocklands used to control. Race shifted his eyes away from Commander Arnett and back to the large view screens on the front wall of the command center. A blue-white world seemed to float majestically on one of the screens. The world resembled Earth. Nearly 60% of its surface was covered with water. Six large land masses provided living space for over 600 million intelligent beings. Madeline was correct. The Altons had an empathy for these races, 
perhaps due to the fact they created the AIs and felt responsible for what the machines and their four proxy races had done to a large part of the galaxy. There are thousands of former slave worlds the Federation and the Alliance need to visit, Colonel Cowell said. How are we possibly going to do all of that? He knew at the present time the fleet was stretched extremely thin, trying to keep a watch on the Vorzon and now the Shari. They also had to patrol the tens of thousands of light years of space that was the former Hawkland slave empire. One at a time, Race answered. This was the same question he had once asked Fleet Admiral Nagumo. There are about a dozen former slave worlds, which can easily qualify for membership in the Alliance. It will just take time for them to rebuild some of the infrastructure they once possessed that the Hawklands banned, or in some cases destroyed. There are many others that, with some additional help from the Federation and the Alliance, could qualify later on down the road. Admiral, interrupted Lieutenant Travers, with a strange look upon her face, I just received a message from former Fleet Admiral Streff. He's requesting that you come and visit him once Third Fleet returns to the Federation or Kareth. They had left a line of hyperspace communication buoys behind them to allow for communication with Fleet Command. Fleet Admiral Streff, gasped Colonel Cowell. The Colonel had never met the venerated Fleet Admiral, but everyone knew who he was. A strange request, commented Commander Arnett. She knew the former fleet admiral had retired to Macon in the old human federation of worlds. He had stayed out of fleet business and politics for the last four years. I wonder what he wants. I won't know until I get there, Ray said, feeling intrigued. He had a lot of respect for the fleet admiral. He also knew he owed his life to Heaton. Most of the people in the fleet did. If the fleet admiral had a request to make, then Race would do everything in his power to honor it. On Macon, Heaton was standing on the shore of the lake, watching the sunset behind the distant horizon. A few birds still skimmed the surface of the water, seeking out small fish for an evening meal. In the distance, he heard a splash where a fish had hit the surface to consume a hapless insect. Still thinking about Admiral Strong and the others? asked Janice, as she came up and put her arms around Heaton. For several months now, they'd been discussing starting a family, particularly after making the visit to Aquaria and seeing Amanda and Richard and how happy they were with their newborn. The two were already talking about having another. Now she knew Hayden's thoughts were filled with worry for Admiral Strong and those trapped with him. Yes, Hayden answered with a sigh. His headache had finally faded away, and he had spent a lot of time the last few days walking and thinking about his premonitions and what they might mean. Did you spend time out here walking and talking to your brother? asked Janice. She knew Heaton used to come to Macon quite often to spend time with Taylor and Lindell. It was a good way to solve problems, Heaton replied. It was hard to believe that had been hundreds of years ago. The time he and the others had spent in cryosleep had passed so quickly, even considering the half a dozen times he had been awakened to deal with an important decision or crisis. You know I met Jeremy's father right after he discovered the Avenger on Earth's moon. He was a great man and knew how to get things done. The Fleet Academy was a direct result of his efforts, and of course, establishing the new Human Federation of Worlds. I know you met him, responded Janice, gently rubbing her hands over Heaton's shoulders. She could feel the tense muscles beneath her fingers. I believe you met Katie's father also. Yes, replied Heaton, allowing himself to smile. Greg Johnson was quite a character. He was also a very devoted family man. You're going to do something, aren't you? asked Janice, knowing how dedicated her husband was to those who had served with him in the war. Maybe, Heaton answered as he turned around to face his wife. If my premonitions are correct, the Special Five hold the key to saving trillions of lives in a number of galaxies. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I do know they're going to need some help. I have to find a way to get them that help. You make it sound as if this threat they're facing is far worse than the A.I.'s. Much worse, Heaton answered with a haunted look in his eyes. I've seen the destruction of entire galaxies in my dreams, and the deaths of countless worlds at the hands of a relentless and cruel invader. If they are not stopped in the Triangulum Galaxy, I'm afraid all of my dreams will come true. There's also a very good possibility we could someday face the same invader, here, in our galaxy and that's something we must prevent. 
Are you going to speak to the Federation? asked Janice. She wasn't sure the Federation would agree to help. They were swamped trying to allocate resources to prevent the former Hawkland Empire from falling into chaos. No, not the Federation, Heaton answered with a slight shake of his head. At least not directly. I have a few old friends who owe me some favors. I'm going to call them in. In the next few weeks, you and I are going to take a trip. I've already summoned a destroyer from New Providence. Janice's eyes widened in surprise. There was a small building set back from the lake, which housed a hyperspace transmitter. Heaton could use it to contact anyone in the Federation if he so wanted. There were a few other perks inside that building as well. Where are we going? Kareth, answered Heaton, as he thought about the bears and what they could do to help. We're going to Kareth to talk to Malrez, the current leader of Grace's clan, and then we're going to New Providence. I need to meet with Senator Arden, as well as a few others in their government. He also needed to send a message to Admiral Jackson at the Galactic Center. He had a special request to make of the Admiral, one Jackson was going to find very difficult to obey. Governor Barnes was in his office inside Cirrus, thinking about his daughter. He had received the message from Admiral Jackson, saying the transit hadn't gone smoothly, but they were reasonably certain the distant horizon had made it to the Triangulum Galaxy. Sitting across from him was Senator Amy Carnes from Nutellus. I'm sorry the mission has gotten off to a rocky start, Amy said. I know you're greatly concerned for Catherine. She has the most powerful ship ever built by the Altons or the Federation, Barnes replied, as he leaned forward and placed his hands on his desk. I'm sure she's fine. I was in Alton space a week ago and spoke to Ambassador Turin, Amy said, her eyes taking a thoughtful look. He wanted me to express his best wishes to you, that the mission goes as planned, and the ship makes a safe return with the Lost Fleets. Thank you, Governor Barnes replied. However, he had been a politician long enough to know Senator Carnes had another reason for requesting this meeting. Is there something else you wanted to talk to me about? Yes, answered Amy, knowing the governor was too wise not to know she had come for another reason. As you know, Serenity held their planetary elections last week, and Senator Fulbright is now the governor of the planet. He's pushing for a major reduction in the Federation military budget effective immediately. He feels that since the Hucklands and the A.I.s are no longer a threat, we don't need to maintain such a large military force in the galaxy. The fool, uttered Governor Barnes, shaking his head. We have thousands of former Hawkland slave worlds out there just waiting to fall into anarchy. The Borzon and the Shari are encroaching on our borders, and he thinks now is the time to reduce the budget. We have the votes to stop his resolution, Amy assured the governor. But he also has just enough support to make sure we can't increase the budget. It's a large budget, conceded Barnes. If we can maintain it, we should be able to get by. The problem is, there will be no way we can get another rescue mission through the Senate Council, Amy added. That was to be expected, as they didn't approve the first one. Barnes leaned back and gazed speculatively at Senator Carnes. Tureen mentioned the Altons would like to reduce their military involvement even further. And concentrate on exploration and first contact missions, she continued. They want to help bring as many of the old Hawkland worlds as possible into the Alliance. But their people don't want to become involved in another war. They lost a lot of ships at the Great Battle in the Galactic Center, plus those that vanished with Admiral Strong. The majority of Altons are pacifists, commented Governor Barnes in understanding. With the A.I.s no longer a threat, I can well understand them wanting to further reduce their military involvement. They've already pulled back the majority of their remaining battlecruisers and battleships. I believe they intend to keep a reasonable force at Astral, their old homeworld, because of everything the A.I.s have built there, as well as at the Galactic Center. I gather from what you're telling me that if the distant horizon doesn't make it back on its own, there's no one willing to send a second rescue mission. That's correct, responded Amy, pursing her lips. The current rescue mission has a lot of public support, but that will fade rapidly if nothing is heard from the ship. Why are you telling me all of this? asked Governor Barnes. He knew there had to be a reason. Amy leaned forward, and her eyes focused intently on Governor Barnes. Nutellus and Cirrus have always held the Special Five as an important part of history. They link the past and the present together. Billions of people watched when Jeremy and Kelsey were married at the Fleet Academy. We just want you to know that if there is anything we can do, 
the people of Nutellus will be behind you 100%. Governor Barnes nodded. I have put my faith in my daughter. We need to give her time to accomplish her mission. How much time? That's the difficult part to answer, Barnes replied with a sigh. Even if they find Admiral Strong in the Lost Fleets, it may take them a number of years to build the energy collection stations they'll need to open up a vortex powerful enough to allow the fleets to return. Amy nodded in understanding. Just remember, if you need us, you have our vote in the Senate. Later, Barnes was once more alone in his office. He opened up his desk drawer and took out a picture of his daughter. She was only 12 years old in the photo and blowing out the candles on a birthday cake. He hoped she was safe and had found Admiral Strong. Leaning back and holding the photo in his right hand, he placed it above his heart and closed his eyes. If he tried hard enough, he could hear Catherine's laugh and the joy she had felt during special occasions like her birthday. He just hoped he would get to hear that laugh again. In the Triangulum Galaxy, Jeremy was in his quarters, pacing back and forth. Angela, Kevin, and Ariel were also there watching him. Angela and Kevin were sitting down on a comfortable couch, and Ariel was standing by Jeremy's desk with a confused look on her face. I fail to see how this pacing will solve anything, she said, with her dark eyes focused on Jeremy. To the casual observer, she looked like any other young beautiful woman in her early twenties, except she was a hologram. I'm thinking, Jeremy said, as he stopped and stared at Ariel. You're certain if the rescue ship shows up, you can communicate with Clarissa before it jumps away again? Absolutely, Ariel answered. I have a message on standby, and it will be sent at the first indication of a ship from our galaxy. I'm still worried about the simulants, Kevin said, glancing over at Angela, who nodded her head in agreement. If Ariel is right, and they only send one ship through, what if the simulants attack before we can get there? We're assuming they'll stay far enough away from the spatial vortex so as not to risk damage to their systems, but they could still jump into the immediate vicinity of the rescue ship once the vortex collapses. I know, answered Jeremy, shifting his gaze to Kevin, but I'm more worried about something else. We've assumed the brief activation of the vortex in the Sigma system was due to a test. From what Tanith informed me earlier, she thinks the rescue ship may already have come through. Tanith was a female Alton, well-versed in hyperspace study, and several other scientists. What? stammered Angela, her face taking on a stunned look. How is that possible? The AIs didn't detect a ship. Because it didn't exit the spatial vortex in the Sigma system, Ariel informed them. She had listened in on Jeremy's conversation with the Alton scientist. When we came through, there was so much energy powering the vortex that it formed a stable hyperspace tunnel between our galaxy and this one, anchoring the vortex in the Sigma system. Tanith believes that due to the limited amount of power the rescue ship probably had available, the vortex would not have been stable or anchored. If the ship varied its course or speed even slightly, as it entered the vortex back at the galactic center, the exit point of the vortex could have shifted. That's why the Vortex only appeared for a minute in the Sigma system before vanishing. Tanith doesn't believe it actually vanished. It just shifted its exit point to another star system. How far? asked Kevin, worriedly. Even if it shifted by a few light years, we should still have been able to detect it. Not a few light years, replied Jeremy, letting out a deep breath. The ship could be thousands of light years away from the Sigma system. Angela and Kevin both were sitting absolutely still, as if they couldn't believe what they just heard. Then they're lost, Angela said, fearing she would never see Brace again. This was a disaster. Not exactly, Ariel said, folding her arms across her chest. They should be able to figure out relatively quickly what happened and start jumping back toward the Sigma system. It could be weeks before they get there, Kevin said, exasperated. How many simulan systems and ships will they have to avoid? He could well imagine the dangers the rescue ship would face as it attempted to jump back. They also wouldn't know the simulans posed a danger. We don't know, but there are bound to be some, Jeremy admitted. He wished they knew how widespread the simulans were. He had lost a lot of sleep the previous night worrying about the safety of Kelsey, Katie, and the crew of the rescue ship. 
there was no way they could have known what they were jumping into. Admiral Strong to the command center. Commander Malin's voice suddenly spoke over the comm system. At the same time, the Condition 1 alarms began sounding, and red lights started to flash. All crew go to Condition 1. I repeat, go to Condition 1. This is not a drill. We have detected a simulant task force that has entered this system. Combat is imminent. I repeat, combat is imminent. Crap, uttered Kevin, leaping off the couch followed by Angela. Now what? I don't know, but let's get to the command center, Jeremy said, as he turned to leave his quarters. Ariel, what are we up against? Long-range sensors are detecting six simulant battle cruisers and ten support cruisers, she answered. I don't believe they've detected us yet. If they haven't, odds are they will shortly, Jeremy replied as the door slid open. As they hurried down the corridor toward the turbo lift, they passed numerous crew members and marines rushing to their Condition 1 stations. Reaching the lift, they quickly entered and were whisked upward toward the command level. It only took a few moments for the turbo lift to reach its destination, and just a quick minute after that for the three of them to rush through the heavy metal hatch into the command center. As soon as they were inside, it was shut, and two marines took up their guard posts standing inside with their heavy assault rifles held at the ready. Outside the door, four other marines were similarly stationed. Status, barked Jeremy, as he sat down in his command chair. The simulans jumped into the system a short time ago, Commander Malin responded, as she turned toward the Admiral. The entire fleet has gone to Condition 1, and the command AI has requested permission to jump his portion of the fleet into an englobement formation around the simulan ships and blast them into oblivion. Jeremy, spoke up Kevin. He had relieved the ensign who had been operating the sensor console. Both of the main simulant fleet have broken up into smaller task groups and are taking up positions in a number of the surrounding systems. They're waiting for someone, spoke Ariel, knowingly. Somewhere, the rescue ship has made contact with a simulant vessel or world. They must have gotten away, or the simulants wouldn't be acting this way, Jeremy replied, as his eyes focused on one of the four tactical displays and the red thread icons it was displaying. How soon before the simulans detect us? Five to ten minutes, Ariel answered. The radiation from the blue giant will interfere with their sensors to a point, due to our current location. Our own are just barely picking them up. Move us closer to the blue giant, Jeremy ordered. Let's delay this for as long as possible. Angela, have you detected any outgoing communications from the simulans? I'm checking the system now, she responded. She studied some data on the screen for a moment, and then replied. A few minutes after they jumped into the system, they sent out a single hyperspace message. A confirmation of their arrival, suggested Commander Malin. They are trying to set a trap for the rescue ship. It looks that way, answered Jeremy. He was wondering how he could use the information he now had to his advantage. The simulants had broken up their fleet into smaller units, which could be taken out one by one. The question was, did Jeremy dare risk attacking these smaller, more vulnerable task groups? Chapter 16 Jump, ordered Catherine, as ten simulan warships suddenly appeared in one of the tactical displays. For the last five days, the simulans had been following the distant horizon, appearing in the same systems as the Federation ship did shortly after its arrival. The average delay was anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. So far, Catherine had avoided open combat, though she knew her options were rapidly dwindling. In front of the distant horizon, a blue-white vortex opened, and Lieutenant Stiles expertly flew the ship into its center. Only when the deep purple colors of hyperspace made an appearance did Catherine allow herself to breathe a sigh of relief. We can't keep up this pace, Commander Grissom spoke in a tired voice. The commander's eyes were heavy from a lack of sleep. In the past five days, they had made 110 jumps. The crew's becoming exhausted, even with the use of stims, added Colonel Leon. Stims were designed to allow one to function with a minimal amount of sleep, as well as provide a quick burst of energy. I know, Catherine responded. We seem to have the same group of ships following us now. We've lost the others. Originally, there'd been three different simulant fleets chasing after them. Catherine had radically altered the distant horizon's course and distance of the jumps in an attempt to throw them off. 
It's obvious they have a method of following us in hyperspace, Andrum said, his face creased in a thoughtful frown. Probably sensors similar to ours. By scanning our initial entrance into hyperspace, or even our course the first few minutes we're in hyperspace, they can quickly calculate our probable destination. I would guess they would need no more than two or three minutes worth of sensor data to be able to pin down our exact point. Catherine leaned back and closed her eyes. It was all she could do to force them back open. She was so tired and hated the idea of taking another stem, though she knew she must. They'd been careful to jump into systems, which held a very low probability of containing an inhabited planet. It would be a disaster if they jumped into another simulant system. Over the last five days, long-range scans had detected at least ten star systems that contained simulant worlds and massive space fleets. They were fortunate. Hyperspace communication wasn't possible while a ship was in it. At some point in time, their luck was going to run out. Any suggestions? she asked, looking at Anne and Petra. We make a stand and fight, suggested Colonel Leon. The only way we're going to escape is to destroy the fleet that's following us. I agree, Commander Grissom said with a nod. If we keep on like this, the ship is going to suffer a major breakdown of a key component, and then we might find ourselves at the simulant's mercy. At least this way, we get to pick the time and place. Clarissa? inquired Catherine, shifting her gaze to her left side where the AI stood. At least Clarissa wasn't affected by the lack of sleep. Do we stand a chance against that fleet? Four battle cruisers and six cruiser-sized support ships, the AI replied. Her eyes seemed to shrink to narrow points as she ran a series of simulations in the ship's main computer. Unknown, she answered after the simulations were finished. We don't know the full extent of the simulant's weapons, other than they possess very powerful energy beams. From the numerous closed hatches on their ships, I would say they also have missiles. Based on the level of technology we've observed, they probably have sublight missile capability. Whether those missiles have antimatter warheads or nuclear ones is another question. They don't know our capabilities either, Colonel Leon reminded the Admiral. Our particle beams and power beams may be able to penetrate the shields. We also have defense globes, added Commander Grissom. Her brow furrowed in thought at how best to use them. We could use the new ion cannons they're equipped with to take down the shields on the simulant ships, and then send the globes in to detonate against their hulls. I seriously doubt if even a simulant ship can survive a 10-megaton nuclear explosion at point-blank range. Hyperspace emergence in 10 minutes, Colonel Leon called out, glancing at a timer on the screen near her. If we are going to do this, we need to decide in the next few minutes. We don't have the time to get ready for an all-out attack, Catherine said, drawing in a deep breath knowing they were going to have to fight. She didn't see any other choice. Lieutenant Strong, find us a red or blue giant 15 to 20 light years distant. As soon as we drop out, we'll wait for the simulants and make sure they know exactly where we're going, and then jump. Then turning toward Commander Grissom and Colonel Leon, she continued, I want 50 of the defense globes deployed, as well as all of our Anlon bombers. Have the Anlons equipped with full loadouts of Shrike missiles. Load the missile tubes with Devastator 3 missiles. I don't want to reveal all of our weapons. We'll hold the antimatter missiles back for now. We're going to attack the simulants, Katie said over the private comm channel to Kelsey. Do you think that's wise? We don't have any other choice, Kelsey answered as she finished updating the coordinates for a red giant she had located. Sixteen light years from their next hyperspace dropout point. We could continue to run, Clarissa said in a soft voice. The continuous jumps don't bother me. If we can make it to Jeremy and Ariel, they should put a quick end to the simulants following us. I don't think Admiral Barnes will agree to that, Katie pointed out. I could take control of the ship, Clarissa said, if the two of you want me to. Kelsey and Katie were both quiet. What Clarissa was suggesting was mutiny. It was punishable by death, even in the Federation. No, Kelsey said definitively. Jeremy wouldn't want us to take such a drastic step, at least not when we have other options. I agree, added Katie, looking around to make sure no one could overhear her conversation. We have to put our trust in Admiral Barnes. She was trained by Admiral Tellick. 
Jeremy had a lot of respect for the Cirrus Admiral, and I know he would want us to support Catherine. Very well, Clarissa responded, with just a hint of disappointment in her voice. However, if you change your mind, I can take over all the key systems of the distant horizon at a moment's notice. Kelsey started to tell Clarissa she didn't even want that option, but she hesitated. What if a situation occurred where that was their only chance for survival? Only if Katie and I both agree, she finally said. For now, we'll trust Admiral Barnes to get us out of this situation. Kelsey leaned back in her chair, gazing around the command center. Clarissa, Katie, and she had helped to design most of the ship's systems with the help of the Altons and a few dedicated human scientists and technicians. In many ways, it was their ship. Her eyes shifted back to the big view screen and the swirling deep purple colors of hyperspace. She hoped she would never have to order Clarissa to take over the ship. She didn't know how Jeremy would react when he found out what she had done. One minute to hyperspace emergence, spoke Colonel Leon as she watched the counter start to count down the seconds. Catherine nodded. The ship was at condition one, as it had been for the last five days. Dr. Keel reports she has 16 crew members in sickbay due to exhaustion, Commander Grissom added. They've reached their limit on the amount of stems they can safely take. Dr. Keel expects we'll have hundreds in the same condition in the next few days, if we don't allow the crew some downtime. Emergence, said Colonel Leon as she felt the all-familiar wrenching feeling in her stomach as the distant horizon exited the vortex into their target system. Catherine watched the main view screen as the deep purple colors of hyperspace vanished to be replaced by static and then recover as stars began to appear. Other systems in the command center began to function, and she could see the exhausted looks upon her crew. Several of them appeared as if they were about to collapse at their stations. Sensors are clear of contacts! reported Captain Reynolds. We're in a white dwarf system, spectral type D, Commander Grissom stated. The star was so small that it shed very little light and was barely visible on the view screen. No planets or asteroids detected, added Captain Reynolds, as his sensors completed their initial sweeps. Drive core is cooling down and we're recharging the hyperdrive, reported Colonel Leon. We'll be ready to jump in 30 minutes. They could jump in 10, but every time they did, they risked damage to the drive. Coordinates are set for the next jump, reported Kelsey. Andrum gazed at the small star in the center of the view screen. The white dwarf was barely visible, even under extreme magnification. A white dwarf is the result of an imploding star, he said, wishing they had more time to study some of the systems they were jumping into. He had spoken to Astrometrics, and they were making a catalog of all the star systems they'd visited, as well as the star systems around the distant horizon. Only about 5% of the stars in our galaxy are of this time. Its lifetime can be measured in millions of years, which is quite short for a star. The minutes passed slowly, and suddenly, alarms began to sound on the main sensor console. Contacts! called out Captain Reynolds. Four simulant battle cruisers and six support cruisers. Same fleet, breathed out Commander Grissom. Distance? asked Catherine. Twenty million kilometers, Reynolds responded. They're turning toward us and accelerating. They'll reach us in twenty minutes. They're trying to wear us down, Colonel Leone said. Petra knew she was right, and from the condition of the crew, it was obvious the simulants were succeeding. It's the only explanation I can come up with. They could use a micro-jump to put them within weapon range before we're ready to jump. They may be just as tired as we are, pointed out Commander Grissom. They have more ships, Catherine responded. They may not be keeping all of their ships at a high level of alert. They waited a few more minutes until the distant horizon's hyperdrive was fully charged. Time to leave, Catherine said, glancing over at Commander Grissom. Anne, get us out of here. Stand by to jump, Commander Grissom ordered. All stations report ready, reported Colonel Leon. Jump, ordered Commander Grissom. She allowed herself a wolfish grin as the ship entered the blue-white vortex. Next time they saw the simulants, they would have a surprise waiting for them. The distant horizon was finished running. Catherine waited tensely for the distant horizon to exit hyperspace. Stims had been passed out to all the crew, and for the moment, she felt a renewed flush of energy. Exiting hyperspace, reported Colonel Leon, 
as the ship dropped back into the normal universe. All stations at condition one, added Commander Grissom. Weapons are coming online. Energy shield is activating, stated Colonel Leone, as she saw the powerful shield go up to full strength. Launching defense globes and bombers, reported Commander Grissom, as numerous small green icons began appearing on one of the two tactical screens. Major Arkles is also launching one squadron of fighters for support, just in case the simulants launch their own. There have been no signs of fighters, commented Catherine. They may not have to use their fighter or bomber type craft. The AIs had never used any, though the Hawklands had. We're setting a screen of 20 defensive globes at 2,000 kilometers, Commander Grissom said, as she watched the small green icons move into their designated positions. The remaining 30 have been divided up into six groups of five each. The minutes passed, and suddenly, red thread icons began showing up on one of the tactical displays. Alarms sounded on the main sensor console as Captain Reynolds reached forward and shut them off. They're here, Commander Grissom said, feeling her pulse start to race. They're accelerating toward our position, Captain Reynolds reported. They'll be in weapons range in 12 minutes. Hyperdrive is nearly charged, Colonel Leone added. We won't be jumping until we have either destroyed them or they have destroyed us, Catherine responded grim-faced. We can't allow them to continue to chase us. Catherine knew they had to take this opportunity to attack the simulants while she still had sufficient functioning crew members to operate the ship. Clarissa was standing on Catherine's left side as she normally did, using the ship's sensors to scan the inbound simulant ships. Already she had determined they had a very powerful defensive shield. Our Devastator missiles will be ineffective against the simulant ships, she suddenly said to the Admiral as she computed the potential strength of the enemy shields. They're using a super heterodyne shield to modulate energy frequencies, which will greatly increase the dispersion of energy. Crap, muttered Commander Grissom, her eyes showing great concern. What about our power beams and particle beams? They will be more effective as they are more tightly focused, and we have the Fusion 5 reactors powering them, Clarissa replied. I believe both will penetrate the simulant shields. Have the Anlons hold back, Catherine ordered as she considered the information Clarissa had just furnished them. The simulants continued to close, and their six escort cruisers formed up into a wider formation. With the four battle cruisers staying close together, shields were fully powered, and their deadly energy weapons ready to fire. Extreme weapons range, Commander Grissom reported. From their formation, I would guess they plan on partially englobing us with their escort cruisers, and then finish us off with their battle cruisers. Lock on to one of their battle cruisers with our power beams, ordered Catherine, leaning forward in her command chair. Stand by to fire upon my order. 20,000 kilometers in closing, reported Captain Reynolds. Simulants are decelerating. Fire, ordered Catherine, her eyes shifting to the main view screen, showing the simulant ship tactical was targeting. Four violet power beams leaped out from the bow of the distant horizon, striking the energy shield of the simulant ship. For a moment... The screen seemed to resist, and then the beams penetrated, striking the forward hull of the large battle cruiser. Massive explosions racked the enemy ship, and three of its large spires were torn away. Fire particle beam cannons, ordered Catherine, wanting to show the simulants she could hurt them. It was an enormous relief to see that the power beams had managed to penetrate their shield. From the bow of the ship, two powerful bright blue beams flashed out to impact the damaged simulant vessel. The beams cut deep inside the hull, inflicting serious damage to the ship's internal structure and systems. The ship's main power junction was destroyed, and its energy shield collapsed. Their shield is down, called out Captain Reynolds. Fire at Devastator 3, ordered Commander Grissom. Missile launched, confirmed Major Weir at Tactical. From the distant horizon, there was a brief blur in one of its missile tubes, as a sublight Devastator 3 seemed to vanish to detonate microseconds later against the hull of the reeling simulant battlecruiser. Instantly, a brilliant ball of light formed where the simulant ship had been. Target destroyed, confirmed Captain Reynolds, as the red thread icon swelled up and then vanished from his sensor screen. Hit all six escorts with Devastator 3s, ordered Catherine. Then send the defense globes in. The Anlons are to follow behind the globes and finish off whatever's left. She hoped this strategy worked. By hitting the smaller escort cruisers with 50 megaton Devastator 3s, she hoped their defense globes would be able to get close enough to use their ion beams and particle weapons. 
Firing, replied Major Weir, as 12 Devastator III missiles left the distant horizon's missile tubes. At the same time, the six groups of defense globes began moving closer to their designated target. Detonation, reported Captain Reynolds. The simulants didn't manage to shoot any of them down. On the main view screen, space was lit up by the brilliant glow of the large nuclear explosions. In six locations, raging nuclear energy flared against simulant shields. Defense globes engaging, reported Colonel Leon. The bombers are accelerating and will be in strike missile range shortly. In space, the six flights of 10-meter defense globes fired their ion cannons at their targets. The ion beam struck the energy shields, and the places the beams hit lit up with a brilliant flash of cascading light. The ion beams continued to fire as the defense globes activated their dual particle beam turrets. From each of the globes, twin bright blue beams of light flashed towards the spot on the simulant cruiser screens. The ion beams were impacting. The blue beams flashed through, striking the simulant hulls and tearing huge rifts in their armor. Several explosions rattled the cruisers as vital systems were hit. Jagged pieces of hull material were blasted away from the stricken vessels, leaving gaping holes in their hulls. Enlons are launching, Colonel Leone reported, as she watched the tactical display near her intently. They are trying to shoot their missiles through the holes in the defense screens the ion beams are causing. The battle cruisers are targeting the defense globes, warned Commander Grissom, as she saw four of the small green icons suddenly flare up and vanish from the tactical display. The 40 Anlon bombers launched two Shrike missiles each. The Shrikes didn't possess sublight drives and were a lot slower than a Devastator or antimatter missile. This made them more vulnerable to defensive fire. Eighty missiles hurtled toward the six battered escort cruisers. The cruisers, recognizing the threat, began firing their energy beams trying to blunt the attack. However, the defense globes were still firing their particle beams at the cruisers, raking them across the hulls and occasionally destroying defensive energy beam emplacements. Ten missiles, then fifteen were obliterated by defensive fire. Then the first streaked through a hole in a defensive screen, caused by an ion beam. The twenty-megaton warhead detonated against the hull of the cruiser, releasing its energy. Nuclear fire washed across the ship and into its interior. Moments later, the ship vanished in a flash of light as it was annihilated. Simulan cruiser is down, reported Captain Reynolds. More Shrike missiles are penetrating their energy screens. The ion beams seem to be working. On the large view screen, numerous nuclear explosions could be seen in six distinct areas, each marked an enemy cruiser. It was evident the simulants had not been prepared for such an attack and must have considered the defense globes and the bombers to be more of a nuisance than a threat. Now they were paying the price for that poor judgment. Two more simulant cruisers are down, added Reynolds, as two red threat icons swelled up and vanished off his sensor screen. The distant horizon suddenly shuddered violently, and half a dozen amber lights and one glaring red one appeared on the damage control console. Alarms began sounding, and the damage control officer leaned forward and quickly turned them off. Two simulant energy beams penetrated our shield, reported Clarissa in alarm. We have damage to Section 4 at bulkheads 7 and 8. We're streaming atmosphere, and I'm shutting emergency doors to contain the damage. We have a fire in compartment B-14, and I'm initiating the fire suppression system. Make sure everyone is out of that section before you seal it shut, ordered Catherine, not wanting to strand anyone in a possible vacuum area. I'm monitoring the situation and directing survivors to safe areas, answered Clarissa. There are some casualties. On the tactical display, another simulant cruiser vanished as four Shrike missiles obliterated it. The other two were heavily damaged and attempting to withdraw to a position behind the three surviving simulant battle cruisers. Simulant battle cruisers are beginning to target our bombers, Commander Grissom was quick to point out as three of them vanished from the tactical display. I'm ordering them to pull back away from the fighting until this is over. The bombers couldn't be landed with the energy screen up. While they could fly out of it, it wasn't possible for them to fly back through it. Get them back, ordered Catherine, her face grim. They were losing people, and there were still five simulant ships out there. Helm, close the range with the simulant battle cruisers. Tactical, keep hitting them with our power beams and particle beam cannons. Lob an occasional Devastator 3 at them, just in case their shields weaken. Admiral spoke up Commander Grissom, 
we could direct the surviving defense globes to fire their ion cannons at the three battlecruisers. They were successful at opening up holes in the shields of the escorts. Perhaps they can do the same to the larger ships. Catherine glanced at one of the tactical displays showing the remaining defense globes. Twelve of them had been destroyed. Send a command to the globes, ordering them to close with the three simulant battlecruisers. When they're close enough, they're to fire their ion cannons and then fly through any disruption they may cause in a shield and overload their fusion reactors. Catherine knew by overloading their reactors, the defense globes would detonate in a 10 megaton explosion. On the screen, the simulant battlecruisers were continuing to fire their main energy cannons at the distant horizon. It was frightening watching the white beams of energy coming toward them. I'm having trouble communicating the commands to the defense globes, Colonel Leon said. She looked back at the Admiral. I think the simulants are jamming our communications. Damn, muttered Catherine, shaking her head. She had hoped to use the globes to finish off the simulant battlecruisers. She was sure the distant horizon could do the job, but the ship was going to take some heavy damage, and there wasn't a repair bay around that she was aware of. Clarissa, spoke Kelsey in a soft voice, making sure no one could overhear her. Can you take command of the defense globes and carry out Admiral Barnes' order? Yes, Clarissa responded. I can modulate a transmission that the globes can receive and send a data burst instructing them what needs to be done. Do it, Kelsey ordered. She hoped Admiral Barnes would think that Colonel Leone's message had gotten through. She had worked with Ariel and Clarissa long enough to know what the two AIs were capable of whereas Admiral Barnes still had a lot to learn. Kelsey felt the distant horizon shake violently and knew they'd taken another hit. It pained her knowing that crew members were dying. Command sent, Clarissa informed Kelsey over their private channel. Defense globes are going in. The simulants are focusing their fire on them. I think they're starting to realize the globes are a potential threat. I have five globes targeting each battlecruiser. They're coming under heavy fire. Four globes destroyed. Seven globes destroyed. Globes are firing their ion cannons. Globes are accelerating to their top speed. Ten globes destroyed. On the main view screen, Kelsey blinked as two areas suddenly flared up in brilliant nuclear explosions. Did we get them? Two confirmed kills, Clarissa responded, with a trace of satisfaction in her voice. If Admiral Barnes would allow me to fight the ship... I could take out the remaining three simulan ships in a matter of only a few minutes. Ask her, suggested Kelsey. She had seen Ariel and Clarissa fight a ship in the past, and the AIs were quite deadly. There was no doubt in her mind that Clarissa could indeed annihilate the remaining simulans very quickly. It won't be necessary, Katie said over the comm channel. She had been listening to Clarissa and Kelsey. The simulans are leaving. Kelsey glanced up at the view screen and saw that Katie was correct. Three white spatial vortexes formed, and after a few moments, vanished. Simulants have withdrawn, announced Captain Reynolds, jubilantly. Sensors are clear of hostile contacts. Land the bombers in the remaining defense globes, ordered Commander Grissom. Checking the screen, Anne could see that they'd lost eight of the bombers and 22 of the defense globes. The fire is out, and we've stopped streaming atmosphere. Clarissa reported. Everyone has been evacuated from the damaged areas. How many crew members did we lose? Asked Catherine, shifting her gaze to Commander Grissom. Eighteen confirmed, with three missing, she replied. Dr. Keel reports. Thirty-eight more in the med bay, suffering from various injuries. None are considered serious. A couple minutes passed, and Colonel Leone reported the bombers and defense globes had landed and were secure. She also reported the loss of all the pilots who had been in the eight destroyed bombers. The simulant energy beams had left very little to recover. Jump us to the emergency coordinates, Catherine ordered. This was their chance to lose their pursuers. They also needed to find a safe haven where they could hide and repair the ship. Coordinates set, Lieutenant Stiles replied. Jump, ordered Commander Grissom. A blue-white vortex formed in front of the distant horizon and the battered exploration dreadnought accelerated into its center. Moments later, the vortex collapsed, leaving behind no traces of the ship. In the White Dwarf system, the shattered remains of seven simulan warships drifted in space. The distant horizon had survived her first real battle and demonstrated why she was the most powerful ship ever built by the humans and the Altans. 
Chapter 17 Kelsey looked at the large view screen, seeing nothing but a swirling mass of what looked like dark rain clouds. Of course she knew they weren't rain clouds. They were mostly comprised of hydrogen with a small amount of helium and other gases. The distant horizon was orbiting very low inside the atmosphere of a gas giant, nearly twice the size of Jupiter. It made the ship invisible to sensor scans and even direct observation. For a full week, the ship had been hiding inside the planet's dense atmosphere as repairs were made and the crew rested. I've always found gas giants intriguing, Andrum said from where he was standing slightly behind her. Did you know there are more gas giants than any other type of planet? No, Kelsey answered, though she should have. Nearly every system had them. She knew if she let him. Andrum could talk about the makeup of stars and planets all day. We'll be leaving this one shortly, Clarissa announced as she appeared next to Andrum. She was ready to continue their journey to find Ariel and the others. The Alton didn't even jump as he had become used to Clarissa's sudden appearing and disappearing act. He had become quite friendly with the AI and often asked her to help him with some of his research. He was currently trying to make a thorough map of the Triangulum Galaxy based on the astrometric studies they'd done prior to all their jumps. I'm glad, Kelsey said. While she knew this delay had been necessary to repair the ship and rest the crew, it had added a week to their trip to where she hoped the Avenger was waiting. The simulants will be searching for us, spoke Colonel Leon from where she had been talking to Lieutenant Stiles. Petra was deeply concerned about what might be waiting for them once they left the safety of the gas giant. The Triangulum Galaxy had turned out to be a much more dangerous place than she had imagined it could be. I may have a solution, Andrum informed her. We've done enough mapping that I believe we may be able to increase the length of our jumps. How much, Philo? Petra asked, her eyes widening. The longer they could stay in hyperspace, the safer they were from the simulants. In addition, longer jumps would make the distant horizon more difficult to follow. One hundred light years, if the Admiral wishes, answered Andrum. I've been working with the scientists in the astrometrics lab, and we believe we've plotted a safe course to where Admiral Strong entered this galaxy. As long as we stay on that course, we can safely jump one hundred light years at a time. We won't know if there are simulants waiting in those systems, warned Kelsey. Our long-range sensors only reach out ten light years. We could potentially jump right into a waiting fleet. We would know before we exited the far end of the vortex, Clarissa said. We would have eight to ten minutes' knowledge as to what's ahead of us. Her deep blue eyes gazed speculatively at Colonel Leon as she waited for a response. She was anxious to get to Ariel. She had so much to tell her AI friend. There's bound to be more simulant worlds between Admiral Strong and us, responded Petra. It's going to be next to impossible to make it all the way to where we think the fleets are waiting without encountering more of them. We still have nearly 8,000 light years to go, Kelsey said, as she thought over Andrum's suggestion. That's only 80 jumps at 100 light years per jump. If we do 10 or 20 light years at a time, that's closer to 500. I would think the chances of the simulans waiting for us would be greatly lessened by the fewer jumps we do. We've only jumped ten or twenty light years at a time so far, pointed out Andrum as he folded his arms across his chest. By jumping one hundred light years at a time, the simulans may find it harder to track us. We don't know the extent of their scanning capability, Petra said, but I agree. The fewer exits we make from hyperspace, the better off we're going to be. I will talk to the commander and the admiral about your suggestions. Kelsey watched as Petra walked off to converse with the two commanding officers. At 80 jumps, it would take nine days to reach the system where they hoped Jeremy was waiting. They'll agree to it, predicted Clarissa. It's the most logical course of action. Sometimes humans don't do the most logical things, Andrum pointed out with a gentle smile. Humans have a tendency for doing the unexpected at times. Helm! Take us out of the atmosphere, ordered Catherine. She had listened to Colonel Leon explain Andrum's reasoning for extending the length of their jumps. She liked the idea, because it also allowed the crew time to rest, 
as they would be in the safety of hyperspace for 100 minutes. The distant horizon slowly adjusted its orbit and began to move up higher through the thick cloud layer. Gradually, the clouds began to thin, and the ship, for the first time in a week, crawled up out of its protective sheath. Sensors are clear of contacts, Captain Reynolds reported, as no dangerous icons appeared on his sensor screens. Course plotted, Lieutenant Stiles added. He had three jumps entered into his navigation computer. Kelsey, Clarissa, and Andrum had furnished the necessary jump coordinates. Each was 100 to 108 light years in distance. Bring the ship to condition three, ordered Catherine. For the last week, they'd been at condition four as the ship was repaired and the crew rested. At the last report, Dr. Keel only had six crew members still in the med bay, suffering from injuries incurred in the battle with the simulans. All were expected to fully recover. Ready to jump, confirmed Colonel Leon. Initiate jump, ordered Catherine as she leaned back in her command chair. Jump, ordered Commander Grissom. Instantly, in front of the distant horizon, a blue-white vortex formed. Lieutenant Stiles activated the ship's sublight drive and flew the ship directly into the vortex's center. Catherine allowed herself to relax as the now comforting colors of deep purple spread across the main view screen. Over the past week, the ship had been completely repaired though there was nothing she could do about the loss of 22 of the defense globes and the eight Anlon bombers. Long-range scans are picking up a simulant fleet, spoke Lieutenant Reynolds, after a few moments. Range is five light years. Keep monitoring them, Catherine ordered. She knew it would be difficult for the simulants to be able to determine their exit coordinates without knowing their exact starting point. Even then, they were probably not expecting the distant horizon to make as long a jump as they were now going to do. Should we go to condition two? asked Commander Grissom, as she gazed at the red thread icons on Captain Reynolds' sensor screen. She could count seven glaring red dots. She was certain the simulans would soon detect the distant horizon on their long-range sensors, if they hadn't already. No, Catherine replied. Let's wait until we get closer to our dropout coordinates and we can see if anything's waiting for us or close by. The simulan threat had Catherine deeply concerned. From the number of spacecraft the distant horizon had detected in the simulan systems, she didn't see how Admiral Strong could have possibly survived against such odds. She hadn't mentioned anything to Kelsey or Katie about her concern, but she knew both of them had to be aware of what the large simulan presence probably meant. Miko has finished her analysis of the scavenger drone. Commander Grissom commented as she shifted her gaze to the Admiral. They'd gone to calling them drones because of their simple programming and all being identical. I read it, Catherine responded. They're nothing but basic killing machines encased in heavy armor. We're lucky our Marines were using armor-piercing rounds or they would have perished on that planet. We know the history of the simulans in our galaxy and what they encouraged the AIs to do after modifying the Master Codex, replied Anne. I would guess they've been following the same policy in this galaxy, annihilating all sentient races. Picking up another fleet, Captain Reynolds informed them, as five more red thread icons appeared off to one side of their course at a distance of nearly nine light years. They've spread out searching for us, commented Commander Grissom, taking a deep breath. At some point, they're going to catch up with us again. I know, answered Catherine. Hopefully. We can reach the system where Admiral Strong entered this galaxy before that happens. Catherine knew if Admiral Strong and the Lost Fleet had been destroyed, the distant horizon was doomed. There was no way they could evade the simulans long term. For six days, their luck continued to hold. The distant horizon would exit the spatial vortex in a white dwarf system, wait an hour as they recharge the hyperdrive, take astrometric scans to verify their course, and then jumped back into the safety of hyperspace. On numerous occasions, they detected simulant task groups, and in some cases, large fleets and systems ahead of them and around them. So far, the simulants hadn't been able to match the distant horizon's exact course and appear in the same system as the exploration dreadnought. However, their luck couldn't hold forever, and it finally ran out. Contacts! called out Captain Reynolds as the ship came out of its 50-second hyperspace jump. They had covered over 5,000 light years and were only three and a half days from their destination. Where and how many? demanded Catherine, her eyes shifting to the two tactical displays. Eighteen ships, Reynolds quickly replied, 
as his eyes scanned the data on his sensor screens. Six battle cruisers and twelve escorts. They were waiting for us, Commander Grissom said in a grim voice. They must have noticed we were jumping into white dwarf systems. Hyperdrive is recharging, Clarissa announced as she appeared at the Admiral's side. I could shunt power from the other sections of the ship, and we could make a short jump of a couple of light years without risk to the drive. No, replied Catherine, shaking her head. The problem, as always, was allowing the drive core to cool down after a long jump. Thirty minutes was the minimum time before the drive could be safely activated. Though short micro jumps could be made within the system, longer jumps risked damage to the drive core, though they had already risked that a couple of times. They are not moving, Colonel Leone said after a moment. She peered sharply at the tactical displays and then shook her head. Why aren't they responding to our presence? Captain Reynolds, are you detecting any other simulant task groups or fleets? Yes, Admiral, Reynolds replied. I have three on my sensors. Two are in other white dwarf systems, and the third is in hyperspace moving away from us. They're tracking us, Andrum spoke, from where he was sitting at navigation next to Kelsey. I don't believe this task group is going to attack. They've ascertained where our likely final destination is, and that's where they'll be waiting in force. They know what we did to the last task group, and they probably don't want to risk losing another. It makes sense, Catherine said after a moment. It would also seem to indicate they've encountered Federation ships before, if they know where we're going. The question is, did those ships survive, or did the simulans destroy them? Spoke Commander Grissom, with a solemn look upon her face. Ariel and Admiral Strong would have found a way to survive, declared Clarissa in a firm voice. Her deep blue eyes showed deep conviction in that belief. Once we get to the system they may transit into, I'm certain we'll find them. I hope you're right, Catherine said in a softer voice. She knew their own survival now depended on Admiral Strong and the Lost Fleets. Jeremy stared worriedly at the tactical screen, which was set to show everything within ten light years of the Avenger and her fleet. The Avenger had moved far enough away from the blue giant star they'd been using to mask the presence of the fleet, so the ship's sensors could take decent scans of the surrounding systems. I don't like this, Commander Malin said, gesturing toward the display. The number of task groups has tripled in the past week, and there are three large fleets at that white dwarf system just five light years away from the Sigma system. That's over 500 simulan warships we've detected, Ariel said with concern in her eyes. Her black hair was straighter than normal, nearly reaching down to her shoulders. They have to be waiting for someone. The rescue ship, stated Kevin, looking worriedly at Jeremy. They've obviously encountered it somewhere, and it's on its way here. It must be getting close. If they've encountered it, then that suggests the ship survived a battle with the simulants, Jeremy said. He hoped the ship wasn't severely damaged. One ship alone in a hostile galaxy full of simulants would find it difficult, if not impossible, to survive for long. If it's the ship Clarissa and I were designing, it will be a very powerful vessel, Ariel said, hoping the other AI hadn't been harmed. I'm certain if the Altons help build the ship, it will not be easy for the simulants to destroy. What are we going to do? Commander Malin asked. Kyla was deeply concerned that they didn't have sufficient forces with them to rescue the ship when it did finally arrive in the Sigma system. Even if they had the ships, how were they going to get back to Gaia without the simulants following them back and discovering the hidden system? We have a pretty powerful force, Jeremy said. The AI ships have multiple particle beam cannons they can fire simultaneously. We've also doubled the number of cannons on our Federation ships, as well as the Altons. We have more effective firepower than we did last time, conceded Malin. But I'm not sure it's enough. We're going to be badly outnumbered. We just need to be able to hold the simulans off long enough to contact the rescue ship, recharge our hyperdrives, and then jump. Our hyperdrives are capable of making an emergency jump if necessary. We can forego the cooldown period if an immediate jump is required. There are several small nebulas between us and Gaia, added Kevin, as he thought about how to lose the simulan fleets, which were sure to follow them. Our stealth destroyers map them in our original explorations. We can use them to lose the simulants. Ariel, asked Jeremy, looking inquiringly at the AI. Possibly, Ariel answered, as she called up the data on the gaseous nebulas Kevin had mentioned. 
If we jump into the smaller clear patches on the outer boundaries of the nebulas, we just might make it extremely difficult for the simulants to track us. It'll take some precise navigation, but I believe it could be done. Let's make it a part of our plan, ordered Jeremy, reaching a decision. Ensign Stryker, move us back closer to the fleet. I don't want to risk the simulants detecting us. Jeremy folded his arms across his chest and looked over at Kevin. Soon, they would know if their wives were in the Triangulum Galaxy. Jeremy was certain that they were. There was no way either Kelsey or Katie would allow a rescue mission to be launched. If they were not included, he just hoped he could get to them in time. Three and a half more days passed, and the tension on the distant horizon was running high. In another 20 minutes, they would drop out of hyperspace into the system the Avenger and the Lost Fleets had made transit to. We're detecting more simulant task groups the closer we get, Commander Grissom said, arching her eyebrow in concern. They definitely know where we're going. We just have to hope our arrival triggers some type of message that Admiral Strong left behind, Catherine said. If there was no message or the system was full of debris from the lost fleets having been destroyed, then she didn't know if there was any point in continuing to run. There would be nowhere for them to go. As soon as we exit the vortex, we'll send out a standard hail demanding Federation ship IDs. If there's a message buoy there, that should trigger it. Anne didn't reply. She knew as well as the Admiral that there was a good chance they would never leave this system ahead. The distant horizon would take a lot of simulant ships down with her. But in the end, the exploration dreadnought would be overwhelmed. Take us to Condition 1, Catherine ordered. I want all of the remaining defense globes deployed as soon as we exit the vortex. Inform Major Arkles, I want all the fighters and bombers launched also. Bombers are to be prepped with Shrike missiles as before. Commander Grissom quickly moved to carry out the Admiral's orders. Condition 1 was set, as alarms and flashing red lights signaled the crew to go to their battle stations. The hatch to the command center was sealed, and two Carthians took their place as guards. Outside the hatch, four other heavily armed bears had taken up positions. The bears had requested to be allowed to furnish guards for the command center, and the Admiral had agreed, and doubted that anything or anyone could get by the large Carthians. Ten minutes to Vortex Emergence, called out Colonel Leon. All stations are secure and ready for combat maneuvers. Kelsey looked over at Clarissa. In another few minutes, they would know if Jeremy had survived or not. She could not imagine life without him. Remember, Clarissa said, over their private comm channel, I can take control of the distant horizon at a moment's notice. I know, answered Kelsey, hoping that step would never be necessary. Let's just wait and see what happens. They'll be waiting for us. Katie said. They just have to be. Unknown contact, yelled Kevin, excitedly, as an alarm went off on his sensor panel. The Avenger was positioned just close enough to the Blue Giant to prevent detection, but her sensitive long-range sensors could still scan the space around the Sigma system. It's them, announced Ariel, excitedly. The ship is of Alton design and remotely resembles the exploration ship Clarissa and I were working on. It's coming damn fast. Kevin said, his eyes opening wide in amazement. They're coming in at close to one light year per minute. Jeremy hit the fleet-wide address on his minicom. All ships go to condition one. We've detected what we believe is the rescue ship coming in hot. Move away from the blue giant at max sublight. We'll be jumping in five minutes. They're going to get there way before we do, Ariel said. I'll send a message just before we enter hyperspace. It'll get there shortly after they exit the vortex. Simulant fleets are on the move also, Commander Malin reported, as she gazed worriedly at one of the tactical displays. How many? asked Jeremy. All of them, Malin replied in a somber voice. They're all moving. Some of them have already entered hyperspace. Then it's a race to see who gets there first, Jeremy replied with determination on his face. The distant horizon exited the swirling blue-white vortex into the system where they'd hoped Admiral Strong and the Lost Fleets would be waiting. Long-range scans had already shown the fleets were not present. They're not here, uttered Colonel Leone, with disappointment in her voice. I'm picking up some debris, spoke Captain Reynolds. Not enough to account for all the ships that should be with Admiral Strong. They've left and gone on, Commander Grissom surmised. It wasn't safe here, so they jumped out. They either fought a battle with the AIs that came through with them, or the simulants. I'm picking up wreckage from Simulant, Alton, Federation, and AI ships, confirmed Reynolds. Who was fighting whom? asked Colonel Leon, looking over at the Admiral. Contact message going out, 
Angela said, her voice filled with hope. Numerous simulant ships inbound, Clarissa reported, as she studied the long-range sensor readings, detecting close to 500 simulant warships. No reply to our message, Angela said, her voice filled with disappointment. They didn't leave a message buoy behind. She felt disheartened. How were they ever going to find the Avenger and the missing fleets without a clue as to where they went? The Triangulum Galaxy was a huge place to search. Incoming hyperspace message, Clarissa said excitedly. It's from Ariel. They're on their way. Katie's eyes opened wide in sudden relief. Kevin was coming. Vortex is opening all around us, Colonel Leon called out. We have simulant ships jumping into the system. Combat imminent. Defense globes are deploying, Commander Grissom reported. Bombers and fighters are preparing to exit the flight base. Major Arkel says the base will be clear in 40 seconds. Inbound weapons fire, warned Colonel Leon, as the ship shook violently. Energy beams are impacting the shield. It's holding at 95%. Petra could see numerous simulant ships closing on the distant horizon. Return fire, ordered Catherine, seeing the two tactical displays beginning to fill up with red thread icons. How soon before Admiral Strong gets here? She was vastly relieved to know that he had survived after all. If they could just hold out long enough, they might just survive. Also, if the Avenger and the Lost Fleets had survived this long, surely Admiral Strong had a strategy for defeating the simulants. I'm picking up Admiral Strong's ships, leaving a blue giant star. Seven light years away, Clarissa replied. It'll take them at least 20 minutes to get here. We won't last for 20 minutes, spoke Commander Grissom, shifting her gaze to the Admiral. Not against these numbers. We're going to try, answered Catherine, determinedly, as the ship shook again, and several amber lights appeared on the damage control console. Helm, adjust course and speed. Set course to starboard, 12 degrees downward axis. 30% power to sublight engines. All weapons to fire on nearest targets. This won't work, Clarissa said to Kelsey over their secure comm line. I estimate we won't survive more than ten more minutes maximum. There are just too many simulant ships arriving. Unless we do something drastic, the distant horizon will be nothing more than glowing debris when Jeremy and Ariel arrive. Kelsey closed her eyes. She knew what drastic measure Clarissa was suggesting. The ship shook violently, hurling Kelsey painfully against the restraining straps on her chair. More alarms began sounding on the damage control console. She could hear Admiral Barnes shouting out frantic orders as more simulant ships fired their deadly energy beams at the distant horizon. Do it, pleaded Katie over her comm. Kelsey, put Clarissa in charge of the ship. It's our only hope. I want to see Kevin again. Kelsey drew in a sharp breath and then looked over at Clarissa standing next to Admiral Barnes. Their eyes met. Do it, she said aloud, knowing she was going to anger the Admiral. Clarissa, you are now in command of the distant horizon. Let's go kill some simulants. What? uttered Catherine, looking with alarm at Kelsey, and then shifting her eyes over to Clarissa. You are not in command of this ship. I am now, Clarissa replied, as she closed her eyes and the distant horizon suddenly shot ahead at full speed. Guards, place Lieutenant Strong in custody and escort her out of the command center ordered Catherine, not wanting to believe this was happening. What was Kelsey thinking, turning the ship over to the AI in the midst of a battle? The two bears strolled over purposely to Kelsey and then turned around to face the Admiral, their assault rifles held in their arms, taking up a defensive stance. Kelsey is the mate to Admiral Strong, who is an honorary member of our clan. The Special Five saved our planet and freed us from the evil ones. We are hers to command. Catherine sat back in her command chair in shock. The bears were heavily armed, and she doubted if the others in her command crew could overpower them. One of the defense globes is firing, called out Major Weir. We've just launched a Devastator Three. Damn, uttered Captain Reynolds in disbelief. Clarissa fired it right through the small hole in the defense shield created by the ion cannon. The simulant battle cruiser is down. Clarissa changed course radically, causing most of the inbound energy beams from the simulants to miss the ship. The inertial compensators were being strained to the max, as she had two other defense globes fire their ion cannons, opening up two more holes in the simulant shields. Moments later, two additional simulant battle cruisers were nothing more than glowing balls of glowing nuclear energy. Two more simulant battle cruisers are down, called out Captain Reynolds excitedly. He couldn't believe what he was seeing on his sensors. The simulants are having a hard time hitting us because of our erratic course changes, Colonel Leon said as she glanced over at the damage control console. 
No more amber lights, it appeared, since Clarissa took control of the ship. Simulans are attempting to take out the defense globes, Captain Reynolds reported, as the globes began to vanish from the screen. They had recognized what Clarissa was doing with them, and the danger they posed. There are 38 of them, spoke Commander Grissom, knowing that once they were gone, it would be much more difficult to take out the simulant ships. Anne was amazed at how well Clarissa was doing against the enemy. However, she should have known. She recalled the reports Admiral Strong had sent to Fleet Admiral Streth, describing in detail what Clarissa and Ariel had done to the Hawklands and the AIs when they'd taken command of their respective warships in the war. Clarissa knew she had to take out as many simulant ships as possible before the defense globes were annihilated. In the next three minutes, she managed to use the globe's ion beams to blow holes in 12 more Simulan Battlecruiser's energy shields. In each case, she fired a Devastator III through the hole, blowing the enemy ship apart. The space around the distant horizon was full of filaments of fire where Simulan ships had died. Catherine leaned back in amazement. Now, she understood why Kelsey had done what she did. Clarissa was fighting and navigating the ship far more effectively than the human or Alton crew ever could have. Clarissa might just be the edge they need to survive until Admiral Strong arrived. Clarissa has taken control of the rescue ship, Ariel reported to Jeremy with excitement and pride in her voice. She's destroyed 15 Simulan battlecruisers in the last four minutes. How? asked Commander Malin, sounding confused. What type of weapon is she using? Unknown, Ariel answered but it's causing confusion with the simulants, and their ships are hesitating to come into range of the ship's weapons. Then we're going to make it, Kevin said, his eyes lighting up with hope. It was all Catherine could do to stay in her command chair. The violent turns and gyrations Clarissa was taking the ship through was straining the ship's inertial compensators to the point that several times she had felt the pull of G-forces pushing her back into her chair. She heard several of the command crew swear loudly as the restraining straps pressed painfully against them. Admiral Strong will be here in two more minutes, Clarissa announced, as she fired another Devastator III through a hole in a simulant escort cruiser shield caused by one of the few remaining defense globes. On the main view screen, a violent 50-megaton explosion annihilated the cruiser, leaving behind a scattering of glowing debris and burning gases. The simulant battle cruisers are holding back, Commander Grissom spoke. They seem to be hesitant to engage us. Clarissa... Pull us back so we can recover our fighters and bombers, ordered Catherine, hoping the AI would obey her. She knew when Admiral Strong arrived, they would be leaving as soon as possible. Unlike the new drive the distant horizon was equipped with, Admiral Strong's ships could make a jump almost immediately without fear of damaging their drive cores. Pulling back, Clarissa replied. She quickly took the distant horizon through a sharp turn and decelerated to come almost to a dead stop in close proximity to the waiting fighters and bombers. I'll drop the shield for 20 seconds, Clarissa informed Catherine. All of the fighters and bombers have to be inside the screen or on board within that time. Make it happen, ordered Catherine, nodding at Commander Grissom. Moments later, Commander Grissom told Clarissa to drop the shield, rapidly. All the fighters and bombers hurtled toward the flight base, making emergency combat landings, and in some cases, skidding across the decks of the two bays. In 18 seconds, they were all aboard or inside the shield. Re-energizing energy shield, Clarissa announced. I'm going to hold this position as the simulants seem to be waiting for Admiral Strong to arrive. I believe when he does, they'll launch a mass attack against him as well as us. How many defense globes are left? Catherine asked. It seemed at the moment the AI was cooperating. Six, answered Captain Reynolds. The rest have been destroyed. I'll need them when Admiral Strong arrives, Clarissa stated. Catherine nodded and elected not to reply. If they survived this, she was going to have a very long talk with the AI, as well as a certain female lieutenant. She was also wise enough to know the only reason they had survived this long was because the AI had taken command of the ship. That was something she would have to take into consideration. Jeremy felt the Avenger exit hyperspace. He gripped the arms of his command chair, waiting tensely for the view screens to clear. Screens coming online, reported Ariel. Energy shield is up, detecting 312 simulant vessels with more inbound. Where is the rescue ship? asked Jeremy, his eyes glued to the view screens. Suddenly, on one of the screens, a massive ship appeared. It was obviously of Alton design. That ship's 2,600 meters long, reported Kevin in amazement. No wonder Clarissa could destroy so many simulant ships, Commander Malin said, highly impressed by what she was seeing on the view screen. 
The ship she was seeing was larger than an AI ship. All ships, Jeremy spoke over his minicom. Take up defensive positions around the rescue ship. It's called the Distant Horizon, Ariel said with a pleased smile. I just finished talking to Clarissa, and she has confirmed that Kelsey, Katie, and Brace are all on the ship and are uninjured. Jeremy felt the room swirl as he realized his wife was close by. He knew that Kevin and Angela must be feeling the same way. AIs! exploded Commander Grissom as she saw one of the hated 1,500-meter AI spheres appear on the view screen. What the hell is going on? I was going to mention that, Clarissa said apologetically. It seems the AIs have joined forces with our missing fleet in order to survive in this galaxy. They have placed their ships under Admiral Strong's command. We can't trust the AIs, spoke Colonel Leon. Her eyes focused worriedly on the view screen. No, Catherine said in agreement. But I do trust Admiral Strong, and we have to hope he knows what he's doing. She knew Admiral Tellick would have agreed with her reasoning. There are Alton ships out there as well, pointed out Andrum. I don't think the AIs will be a problem. I'm certain the Altons on the four science ships that came through with Admiral Strong would have taken steps to ensure that. I hope so, responded Commander Grissom, still feeling doubtful. She could not imagine fighting on the same side as the AIs. The Avenger has transmitted a set of jump coordinates, Captain Travers reported. I'm sending them to navigation. Simulans are closing again, Colonel Leon announced. On the tactical displays, the Simulan ships were now rapidly closing with the distant horizon and the ships Admiral Strong had brought. I'm sending out the last six defense globes, Clarissa said. I'm going to see if I can cause the Simulans some additional confusion. In space... The six remaining defense globes suddenly powered up their sublight drives and accelerated at full speed toward the six nearest Simulan battlecruisers. The Simulans opened fire with their energy beams and easily destroyed two of them, but the other four managed to fire off their ion beams just fractions of a second before they too were annihilated. However, that fraction of a second was long enough to blow a brief hole in three Simulan energy shields. Microseconds later, all three battlecruisers died as nuclear fire tore through their structure from the Devastator 3's Clarissa had carefully fired through the brief holes in their defense screens. Ion beams, uttered Commander Malin, as she saw the three Simulan battlecruisers swell up and then vanish from one of the tactical displays. That's how they destroyed so many Simulan ships. I recall studies were being done at Nutellus about using ion beams to bring energy shields down. It seems to work, responded Kevin, his eyes glued to his sensor screens and the tantalizing green icon that was the distant horizon. It was hard to imagine that Katie was so close. That's the last of their defense globes, Ariel announced. The distant horizon isn't equipped with any ion beam. They were only designed to be used by the globes as an experimental weapon. Simulans are still closing, Kevin reported. They've slowed. I think they're unsure if there are any more of those defense globes. They're in weapons range, Commander Malin stated. All ships fire, Jeremy ordered. It was time to see how all the extra particle beam cannons were going to do against the simulants. Bright blue particle beams suddenly lanced out from the 82 warships Jeremy had brought. From the 40 AI spheres, over a dozen particle beams were fired from each one. The effect on the inbound simulants was devastating. In less than a minute... A third of their fleet was reduced to burning debris as the enhanced beam slashed through their energy screens, causing havoc. The remaining simulant ships retaliated as they opened up a heavy energy beam fire upon the human, Alton, and AI ships. Two AI spheres exploded in brilliant blasts as their screens were quickly overloaded and simulant energy beams played across their hulls. Two AI ships are down, called out Kevin, as green icons began to vanish from his sensor screens. Strike cruiser Dover is down. We're ready to jump, Ariel announced. She was monitoring all the ships, as well as communicating with the command AI. The fleet is taking a lot of damage. Battlecruiser Dominator is down, spoke Kevin, as the battlecruiser's green icon swelled up and vanished from his sensor screen. It had been over four years since he had last spoken those dreadful words. He had forgotten just how horrible they truly were. Jump, ordered Jeremy. Blue-white vortexes began opening up in front of the ships of the fleet, and they made a wild dash to escape the inbound simulants. Even as they exited the system, another AI ship and an Alton battlecruiser exploded, as their shields were overloaded. All ships are safely in hyperspace, Ariel reported, including the distant horizon. 
We lost another AI ship and an Alton battlecruiser as we were entering the Vortexes, Kevin reported. We have a number of damaged ships as well, Malin added. Though the battle was brave, it had been very intense. Jeremy nodded. We just need to lose the simulants and then return to Gaia. Once there, we can repair our battle damage. He was anxious to see Kelsey, but he knew it would be many hours yet before that was possible. They had to play hide-and-seek around several nebulas before it would be safe to head for home. Chapter 18 It had taken two days, but the Avenger and her fleet had finally shaken their simulant pursuers. Jumping around several gaseous nebulas had finally done the trick. After fleeing down a narrow gas-free corridor, the fleet had emerged and immediately made a long jump to an area of red giant stars Ariel had felt would be free of simulant activity. She had been correct, and now the fleet was returning to Gaia. Exiting Vortex, called out Captain Reynolds, as the distant horizon returned to normal space. The main view screen quickly cleared, and a planet appeared. It seemed to be a mostly arid world with a wide green swath around its equator where numerous rivers and lakes could be seen. There were also two small oceans which covered about 15% of the planet. It's a habitable world, slightly smaller than Earth, Clarissa reported. The area around the planet's equator is slightly over 1,400 kilometers across and has a wide variety of plant and animal life. I'm also detecting what appears to be a small city on the surface added Reynolds. The two tactical displays continued to light up with numerous icons. One was truly large. Admiral Strong's been busy, commented Commander Grissom, as she gazed at what was appearing on the displays. There are particle beam satellites in orbit, as well as a number of what appears to be modified Type II battle stations. The screen changed to show a massive structure above the planet. What's that? asked Catherine, as her eyes focused on the strange structure. It didn't resemble any type of ship she was familiar with, and it was much larger than the distant horizon. The clan protector, Kelsey answered, barely recognizing the Carthian mobile shipyard. It's been expanded considerably. Seeing the vessel brought back memories of her Carthian friends. She knew both Maleth and Corell had been aboard the shipyard. It would be wonderful to see them once again. It is good to see the clan protector, spoke Bilal the pack leader of the bears that were on board the distant horizon. I look forward to speaking to Graceth, the leader of our clan. As we all do, replied Kelsey with a friendly smile. Ever since she had ordered Clarissa to take control of the distant horizon, at least two bears had been in her presence next to the navigation console. They also accompanied her wherever she went on the ship. It was obvious they were concerned for her safety, though Kelsey was no longer worried. Detecting a large CSP, as well as a lot of warships, Colonel Leon said, as she studied the data coming in. It looks as if most of 4th Fleet, Admiral Cletius's fleet, Rear Admiral Mark's fleet, as well as Grace's fleet are in orbit. I didn't expect so many to have survived, Catherine said, as her eyes shifted to the tactical displays and all the friendly green icons that were being displayed. She felt relieved at seeing so many Federation and Alliance warships in orbit around the planet. There are also a lot of AI ships, Captain Reynolds added in a brusque voice. I'm detecting 460 in various orbits around Gaia. None of them are targeting us with their weapons, though. Clarissa had informed them of the name of the planet just before they made their final hyperspace jump. Damn, there's a lot of AIs, commented Colonel Leon, with concern as the screen changed to show several of the stupendous AI spheres. Even though Admiral Strong had promised they had nothing to fear from the AIs, Petra couldn't help feeling cold chills run down her back at being in such close proximity to so many of them. Admiral Strong has found a good place to hide, spoke Commander Grissom. Anne was very impressed by what she was seeing on the view screen, as well as on the tactical displays. The nebula will block long-range sensor scans from the simulants, but it blocks our scans as well, replied Catherine. It also puts a strain on the hyperdrive traveling through the nebula. Several times we were close to dropping out of hyperspace. We'll need to adjust our drive, commented Shiloom, who had come to the command center to witness their arrival. She was pleased to see so many Alton warships, as well as the four science ships that had come through with Graceth on the tactical displays. Put us into orbit, ordered Catherine, allowing herself to relax. For the first time since they'd arrived in the Triangulum Galaxy, 
she felt relatively safe. They had succeeded in the first part of their mission, finding the Avenger in the Lost Fleet. Unfortunately, she didn't think there was any way they would ever be able to go back home. They're here, Kevin said, with a big grin on his face, as he stared at the massive exploration dreadnought on one of the view screens. He had spoken to Katie a number of times over the ship's comm system. He felt excited every time he heard her voice, and couldn't wait to see her in person. Admiral Barnes is in charge of the distant horizon, Jeremy said. He had held several long conversations with the Admiral over what had happened to the ship after they jumped into the Triangulum Galaxy. It amazed him they'd survived, particularly after jumping into a simulant system. He was also anxious to talk to Miko Law about the scavenger drone she had disassembled. The more they could learn about the simulants and how they operated in this galaxy, the better prepared they'd be if the simulants ever discovered Gaia. They encountered a lot of simulant worlds and ships, commented Commander Malin, cocking her eyebrow. The simulants are apparently much more widespread than we originally thought, Jeremy said with a deep and worried frown. They may control a major portion of this galaxy. It made Jeremy even more aware of the danger they were in and how important it was not to lead the simulants back to Gaia. He still needed a good six months to finish the planned orbital defenses. The distant horizon found more destroyed worlds, added Commander Malin, shifting her gaze from the view screens to Admiral Strong. They sent a team down to one, and that's where they encountered the scavenger drones. They lost several marines in the altercation. We'll be holding a meeting on the clan protector shortly, Jeremy informed her. I've asked Graceth, Rear Admiral Marks, and Admiral Cletius to attend. We're going to have to make an announcement to our people shortly as to what's been going on back home and the possibility of returning to our galaxy. It doesn't look good, Ariel spoke from where she was standing next to Jeremy. The distant horizon has the necessary designs to build a vortex ring to take us back, but there's no way the simulants will ever allow us to build it. The energy collector stations that will be necessary are quite large and will take time to construct. So they may be stranded here with us, spoke Angela, who had gotten up to come closer to Jeremy and Kevin. She had spoken to Brace earlier, and still found it hard to believe that he was actually here. Her heart had been racing while they talked. It had been so good to finally hear his voice. It looks that way, answered Jeremy. We'll know more when we have our meeting. It's going to be hard on our people once they find out we may not be able to go back, Commander Malin said. It won't help morale, and we may find people stampeding to go down to the surface and live. They have to be told, answered Jeremy with a sigh. We're all in this together. Kevin, you and Angela will be going with me to the meeting. Finally, spoke Ariel, feeling quite pleased with herself and Clarissa. The special five are going to be reunited. Several hours later, Jeremy, Kevin, and Angela stepped out of their shuttle aboard the clan protector. A group of marines, as well as an honor guard of Carthians, were waiting for them. Jeremy, roared Grayseth, stepping forward and hugging his human friend. It is great that your mates have found their way to us. I am anxious to hear of their adventures. We all are, Jeremy said with a smile. It's been a long time coming. Even as they talked, another shuttle entered the cavernous bay to set down close to theirs. The hatch opened, and Admiral Barnes stepped out followed closely by Kelsey, Katie, a marine captain, and a tall, white-haired Alton. Brace! squealed Angela as she ran over to the marine, wrapping her arms around him and smothering him with an affectionate kiss. Kelsey and Katie were more reserved as they hurried over to their husbands, their eyes moist from tears of joy. Hi, spoke Kelsey as she stepped forward, giving Jeremy a big hug and a kiss on the lips. It's been a while. I missed you responded Jeremy, enjoying the feel of Kelsey's body in his arms. It was something he had dreamed of for a long time. Katie was in Kevin's arms and gave no signs of stepping back. God, how I missed you, she uttered, almost afraid to let him go, lest he vanish. I'm here, Kevin said in a trembling voice. I promise we'll never be apart again. Jeremy released Kelsey and turned to face Admiral Barnes. Admiral, it's good to see you and your ship. It contained some very precious cargo. Yes, it did, replied Catherine. She had already talked briefly to Kelsey and Clarissa about what had occurred on the distant horizon. Because of how things had turned out, she had decided disciplinary action would not be forthcoming, particularly 
since she strongly suspected that Kelsey and Katie would shortly be transferring off the ship. As for Clarissa, she would just have to learn to deal with the talented and unpredictable AI. Catherine turned and gestured toward the tall Alton, who had accompanied them. This is Andrum, who serves as our science advisor. He's anxious to talk to you about the current situation with the AIs. We were very surprised to find they're now a part of your fleet. We'll explain that shortly, answered Jeremy. He knew seeing all the AI ships in orbit around Gaia had to have been a huge shock to the crew of the distant horizon. Now, if everyone will follow Grayseth and I, we'll go to a conference room to discuss where we need to go from here. A few minutes later, they found themselves in a spacious room that Grayseth had set up for the meeting. There were refreshments as well as a sampling of fruits discovered on Gaia. You didn't happen to bring any hamburgers along, did you? Kevin asked Katie in a quiet voice as they sat down next to each other. Hamburgers, said Katie, trying to act confused. Why would I bring hamburgers? Kevin looked crestfallen as he realized he was still going to be denied his favorite meal. He had so hoped that the distant horizon would have his favorite food on board. Katie burst out laughing at the disappointed look on Kevin's face, and taking his hand, she spoke. Of course I brought hamburgers. There are cases of them stored in one of the freezers on the ship. Kevin's eyes lit up and he squeezed Katie's hand even tighter. I knew I could count on you. As they all sat down, Jeremy looked around the group. He had invited Corrine, the Alton AI specialist, to attend the meeting to help explain their current agreement with the AIs. To begin with, let me explain what has occurred since we arrived here in the Triangulum Galaxy and how we became associated with the AIs. For the next hour, Jeremy carefully went over their arrival, their battle with the simulants, the agreement with the AIs, the construction of the stealth destroyers, and their establishment of their colony on Gaia. We've built a sizable defense grid around the planet, he added. We've constructed a number of modified Type II battle stations, as well as over 1,000 particle beam satellites for protection. Impressive, Catherine replied, after listening to Jeremy speak. I think one thing you should be made aware of is that the simulans were responsible for reprogramming the AIs in our galaxy. What? stammered Jeremy his eyes opening wide in disbelief. What do you mean the simulans reprogrammed the AIs? Catherine had Andrum explain to the group what they discovered on Astral. When he finished speaking, his words were met with stunned silence. Finally, Corrine spoke. It's a frightening discovery to learn that the simulans added a change to the AI's master codex on Astral. Since beginning to work with the AIs, we've built up a mutual level of trust. The AIs here seemed to show a special interest and even enjoyment from working with Altons. There won't be any more AIs created, Andrum informed Corrine. They've been annihilated from our galaxy, except for a few ships, which fled to one of their proxy races on the far side of the galaxy, and we controlled the Master Codex on Astral. The other we believe was destroyed in the Great Battle at the Galactic Center. Without access to either one of the codexes, there's no way to program new AIs. It wasn't destroyed, Corrine responded, her eyes focusing on Andrum. It's here, on one of the AI ships. Here, spoke Catherine, her eyes narrowing sharply. Then we need to destroy it immediately. No, Corrine responded, shaking her head. I don't believe that's necessary, or even wise. I'll speak to the command AI and explain to it what you discovered on Astral. I'm certain it will allow me to access the codex and remove the simulant programming. Corrine now knew this had to be the code that the command AI had been allowing her to search for. It explained the sudden change in the AI's perspective on organic life. The command AI has been very supportive of us in our efforts to build a home here on Gaia, Rear Admiral Mark said. I've been very much surprised at the cooperation from the AIs. They've also turned full command of their fleet over to Admiral Strong. If we're trapped here permanently, we're going to need them, Jeremy added as he thought about their future. As much as I hate to say it, we may have to begin building more AI ships and possibly even more AIs if we want to remain safe. We would have to examine their programming very carefully, Corrine cautioned as she thought over what would be required. At the moment, I don't want to speak to the AIs about creating more until after I examine the changes the simulants made to the Codex. The AIs served the Altons faithfully 
on Astral for many years. Andrum spoke as he gazed at the others at the large conference table. They were the downfall of the Alton race upon the planet, because our people became too dependent on the machines in their daily life. If we create more of the AIs here, we dare not make that same mistake again. It's simple enough, spoke up Rear Admiral Marks. We don't allow them down on the planet. That might work, responded Andrum, looking thoughtful. If we're going to be staying here long term, at least Gaia is a decent planet, Kevin said with a long sigh. He had hoped they'd be able to return home. We've already established a small city on the surface, as well as several military bases to defend it. Andrum looked carefully around the group. There was something he had been discussing with Shi Loom that might make a huge difference. There is the possibility of sending a message back to our galaxy. He informed them in a cautious voice. How? asked Catherine, looking confused. This had never been mentioned before by any of the Altons on the distant horizon that she was aware of. The Vortex generators should be easy enough to build. With the resources of the Clan Protector and the four fleet repair ships, Andrum informed them. We can also use Fusion 5 reactors as their power source. We just need to establish a small vortex capable of sending a message drone back to the galactic core of our galaxy. Our people there will be waiting. That's still a big project, Corrine spoke. She understood some of the science behind hyperspace travel. Most Alton scientists did. We would still have to construct a small vessel with a hyperspace drive, as well as a sublight drive which could access and use the vortex. We have two such vessels already on the distant horizon, confessed Andrum. We always knew there was a chance we wouldn't be able to return, but we wanted the option of sending back any information on new discoveries back to our people. I didn't know about this, Catherine said, looking accusingly over at Kelsey and Katie. She wondered how much they'd known. We didn't either, Kelsey said quickly, feeling her face flush. Jeremy still didn't know about what she had done on the distant horizon. That was a conversation for later. The two vessels are quite small and in a storage compartment in the Beta Flight Bay, Andrum informed them. She, Loom, and I feel we could be ready to send one of them back to our galaxy within six months. At least the people back home would know what happened to us, Jeremy said approvingly. It would help morale immensely if our people knew they were going to be able to send a personal message back to their families. We'll discuss this later, as I suspect we're going to need a few technical people, both human and Altons, to work on this. It would be good to be able to send a message back to my clan, spoke Grayseth, his large eyes focusing on Jeremy. They should know that I will not be returning. We can't build enough Vortex generators powered by Fusion 5 reactors to send a full-size ship back? asked Kevin. No, Andrum replied. The larger the vortex, the amount of power needed increases exponentially. To power a vortex 600 meters in diameter would take an energy collecting station the size of one of the AI's capacitor stations. It would also have to be built close enough to a star, emitting a high level of radiation so sufficient power could be collected. Jeremy was silent for a long moment, and then he spoke. So we're agreed the likelihood of us ever being able to return to our galaxy is quite small. Around the table, everyone slowly nodded their heads. As long as the simulants were around, they were effectively stranded in the Triangulum Galaxy. They'd all hoped that someday they could return, but the stark reality of their situation was now apparent. For the next several hours, the group continued to talk. Ariel and Clarissa were called in to offer their insights on what the best course of action was. They also had several other Alton and human scientists come in to discuss the finer details of some of the plans. Even Dale Thon came in to report on the current construction capabilities of the greatly expanded Carthian Mobile Shipyard. The meeting finally ended with the Special Five walking away together, along with Captain Calder. Angela and Brace walked arm in arm, talking excitedly about being back together. All six of them returned to the Avenger, and after reaching the level that contained their quarters, all went their separate ways. Angela led Brace to hers, and after shutting the door, gave him a big sexy smile. Four years, she said suggestively. You have no idea how much I've missed you. I've missed you too, replied Brace, stepping forward and taking Angela in his powerful arms. 
I'm about to show you just how much. In Kevin's quarters, Katie led Kevin to the couch and sat down next to him. I didn't think I would ever see you again, she said, drawing in a deep breath. She felt excited and nervous at the same time. I knew you would come eventually, Kevin said, leaning back and putting his arm around her. I never gave up hope. I knew you and Kelsey would find your way to us. By the way, did you make arrangements to have several cases of those hamburgers brought over? I'm starving. Food can wait until later, Katie said, her green eyes shining with a playful glint. Right now, I have other plans. Jeremy and Kelsey were in his quarters. Kelsey was busy giving Jeremy a brief rundown on what had been going on in the Federation, as well as what she and Katie had been doing. Governor Barnes and Ambassador Tureen literally moved mountains to help us get the distant horizon built, Kelsey explained. There's not another ship like her, and I can't wait to give you a tour. I just wish we could return to Kareth someday, Jeremy said, with a longing look in his eyes. I always dreamed of making our home there when we were not exploring. We have a planet here, Kelsey said, from what I've seen on the distant horizon's view screen. It looks like a nice one. It'll have to be our home now. Jeremy nodded. In the coming months, they would continue to strengthen the defenses around the planet, as well as decide what to do about the AIs. As more and more people elected to go down to the planet to live, they were going to become even more dependent on the AIs for protection. It was hard to imagine the change in the circumstances over the last five years. Who would ever have thought it would be up to the AIs to protect the crews of the Avenger and the Lost Fleet? Let's go to the bedroom, suggested Kelsey, snuggling closer to Jeremy. We have a lot of lost time to make up for. Ariel had been watching, and with a feeling of deep satisfaction, she turned off the monitors in all of the quarters of her friends. The special five were reunited, and Ariel felt whole again. On Macon, former Fleet Admiral Heaton Streth allowed himself to relax. He had experienced another premonition the night before, and knew the special five had once more been reunited. Admiral Barnes had succeeded in her mission of finding the Avenger and the Lost Fleet. A noise caused him to raise his eyes upward toward the sky. A shuttle was coming down. He knew the battleship Warhawk was in orbit, and the shuttle was carrying Admiral Tolson. With a deep sigh, he felt sadness and regret over what he was about to do. Admiral Strong had no idea that his service to the Federation was in no way over. This is a big weight you're about to put on Jeremy's shoulders. Janice said in a soft voice. There's not any other way? No, Heaton said with a deep sigh. If the simulans aren't stopped in the Triangulum Galaxy, they'll eventually come through to ours, and they'll be an unstoppable force. The Federation and the Alliance will fall within days of their arrival. Within a few months, they'll have full control of our galaxy and will begin exterminating all intelligent life. He had been sent a private message from General Wesley about what Katie and Miko had discovered about the Simulans' reprogramming of the AI's Master Codex. It confirmed the worst parts of his premonitions. What about Admiral Tolson? asked Janice. What if he doesn't agree to what you want him to do? I've known Race for quite some time, answered Heaton, as he watched the shuttle land a short distance away. He's a dedicated military officer, and when I explain to him what's needed... There's no doubt in my mind that he will agree. You're going to upset a lot of people, Janice said worriedly. Some very powerful people. Perhaps, Heaton answered. They say that I arose from cryosleep to defeat the Hawklands and lead the Federation to victory. Now it's time for Admiral Strong and Admiral Tolson to take their places in history. But their job is not to save the galaxy, but the entire universe instead. Heaton looked back up toward the sky. Somewhere out there was the Triangulum Galaxy. The Special Five would have some time to become reacquainted. And then, their real mission would begin. Upon their shoulders would rest the fate of this galaxy, as well as countless others. They might not see home again, but Heaton would see to it that they were always remembered. This has been The Lost Fleet, Galactic Search, a Slaver Wars novel, Volume 1, written by Raymond L. Weil, narrated by Liam Owen, produced by Sci-Fi Publishing, copyright 2015 by Raymond L. Weil, production copyright 2015 by Raymond L. Weil.
Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.